Cambridge, we don't really want to start later than 10 35. For, yeah, for 10 30. And uh, we were stupid enough not to say that somebody ought to say hello on the program. Hello. So, hello, everyone. I hope that people on Zoom can hear us. Um, at the moment, we have a problem in that. Oliver likes that, oh, yeah, and his speakers on, and he can't turn his speakers off. Um, but never mind, so there might be some echo. I apologize. Yeah, um, I, at the moment, nobody's in the Zoom, but I will in a minute. Um, so welcome to the people here in person, and welcome to the people on Zoom. Um, when we look at the when uh, the Zoom is on, if you want to send some chat, um, there will be somebody trying to monitor it, i.e. me. And we hope that we've set this up so that if people want to ask questions, the people who are in the room, yeah, can ask questions and the people on Zoom can hear it and vice versa. Um, but we're all very grateful. Right, so Stuart DL, who set this up. Um, I haven't practiced this, but I think we all know that we're here. Yes, I don't know how many months ago, um, John reached 75, and a very young 75, and we're all here to really celebrate, yeah, his achievements. I can still remember when I attended his perturbation methods class, yeah, and I learned an awful lot, yeah, and he got an awful lot of typos back from me, yeah, which then made it into his textbook, yeah, or the wrong power or something like that, yeah, but anyway. Um, we, we, we've got, uh, we hope that all, all the speakers have some connection to John and they're going to talk to us about, yeah, their relationships and everything. And our first speaker is Oliver Harlan, who's going to talk to us about inkjet drop formation with complex fluids, polymers and surfactants. And I'm 30 seconds ahead. So thank you, Stephen, and, and thank you particularly for the invitation. Come to this glorious event celebrating John uh, life and achievements. Um, I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about uh, John and me. Well, I realized it's, it's 39 years since I first met John Hitch, um, and that was because. because he was my undergraduate director of studies at, at Trinity College, um, as I think he was to John Lister as well. So, you know, so John's actually known slightly longer than me, probably by four years. Three. Three. Um, <laughs> but only because he's older. So, so it's this. Um, and I, although we're celebrating today John's contribution to research, um, I think it, it's also worth saying that actually John is a fantastic educator. Uh, and definitely the person that inspired me to get into fluid mechanics um, was John, but uh, particularly his part two, fluid dynamics two course. That was the one that really kind of got me interested in <laughs> fluid mechanics. So, um, so in some sense, although my brief was essentially to talk about uh, research inspired by John Hinch, I can tell you about anything because essentially that, that's kind of everything has, has led on from there. So, John was also my, I mean, internal examiner is kind of putting it a bit lightly because actually um, <laughs> it was very much part of the same, same research group with John Rallison. Um, I think actually today in, in Leeds, you wouldn't have allowed, been allowed to be my um, internal examiner to be continued to be too close. And certainly John was very important in that phase of my life. Building up my research interests and the work I'm going to tell you about today, again, started from an interaction with John. Um, that he introduced me to the, this um, inject technology problem, and that led to a, a really fantastic 10 years of collaboration through two large um, interdisciplinary research grants that involved um, Leeds and were, were led in Cambridge that involved Leeds and Durham and satellite the universities. So, one thing I was surprised I about, I, I've only actually come off the two papers to John, which I thought was very surprising. Um, the first in 1992, which was uh, the third paper of my PhD thesis, uh, and the second last year uh, for the Altroid Celebration issue of the Journal of Non-Newtonian Fluid Mechanics. And I thought, this, I, was, I was quite shocked about this. Um, and I think the reason is because the, 
John is very generous with his, his ideas and, and helping to critique you, but he very often doesn't end up as being one of the authors. He always ends up in the acknowledgements. I think that's, I think if there was a, uh, a sort of citation for the number of people that acknowledge for their contribution, I think John would, would be the top of the tree. So let me go on and talk about inkjet printing. Um, so I'm sure you've all, is there a way of getting into that pop little bar, please? It is not showing on the Zoom. Thing. Okay, that's fine. It's just there. It's just there. I'll try again. I plug it. I plug it. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Wow. Showing my age, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, this is a inkjet printer. Um, this is a so-called drop-on-demand device. Essentially, the way you what you have is um, a device. These are usually multi-multi-head ones, I should say. These are um, sort of industrial inkjet printers rather than the sort of desk jet ones that you've got, but they'll work in essentially the same way, which is you have a, you have an ink supply into a print head, you then apply some kind of um, pressure impulse, and that pressure impulse spits out what is ideally a single drop. Uh, but as you can see from this video, I think it's working again. Um, Um, then what you get is that actually at high speed you get this very long tail behind the main drop and that breaks up into, into little satellites um, and essentially that's one of the things that the industry would like to um, avoid if possible so um, so there's this sort of un, I guess law from um, about the printability of Newtonian fluids, which says that what matters um, is essentially the fluid properties. So this is the diagram that's supposed to show you the, the principal region of fluid here. And the ones associated with jetting are these two bars here. Um, and it turns, well, the law says that it's all to do with the onus organum. It's all to do with the onus organum, which is the balance between um, surface tension and viscosity. And so you get this diagram down everywhere, and it says that there's this sweet spot for printable Newtonian fluids between around 0.1 and 1 of this um, solvent. And the reason for that is that essentially what you what's breaking off the um, this uh, fluid as it's being jetted out is capillary action. So you need a capillary breakup, and if the only solvent number is too large, in other words, it's it's too, the fluid's too viscous, then that takes too long. So you get a very, very long, long tail. On the other hand, that same process, of course, is what then subsequently breaks the thing up into satellites. And so if your onus order number is too small, then you will get lots and lots of satellites. So you get some of this um, nice steam potent paper. So what you want is, is a kind of compromise somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Now, what we did more recently with my research student, um, Eva Hulu, was I got her to do loads and loads of, of numerical simulations to test whether this was actually true and where this um, sweet spot is. It turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that picture um, that um, was painted. And it's not just the you know, organ number that's the factor that you need. You can see it is in this kind of range between sort of point one. Uh, and one, but the sort of good spot here where you don't get the, the satellite formation is sort of there's, a, there's definitely a Reynolds number dependence. It's not really a Reynolds number dependence, it's a, a Weber number dependence. And that comes because the aspect ratio of the filament as you, as you jet it out is proportional to the square root of the, of the Weber number. So if the Weber number is too large, you've just got an enormous thing, and there's basically no way you're going to keep that thing. 
So I think that's that's the, the real question. So the bulk of my talk then is to ask a question about what happens with complex fluids. I'm going to show you some sort of old stuff uh, from Neil Morrison and uh, a little bit from Claire McElroy work, which is part of this, uh, the outputs of this uh, large project that we had with Cambridge. And then the, the second part, I'm going to move on to look at the effect of surfactants, which is more recent stuff that um, Bangalore did in her PhD thesis. And I should say that in both these cases, we've been lucky to work with some really good experimentalists. Um, first of all, in, in Cambridge, in the group that was um, in the manufacturing engineering department, and then more recently um, with the physics of fluids group in 20. Um, we started off doing our own experiments for this one, and then we found out they were doing much better ones. So we just thought it was easier to collaborate with people who have a much better camera than we do. And I don't know the setup. Okay, so a lot of people I realize have probably seen this before. Um, so what happens if you add polymer to an, an inkjet printer? Well, you get you don't need to add very much to, to see quite a dramatic change. Um, it says here with a small amount of polymer, because that's because I can't actually remember what, what, what it was, but you don't need to add very much. And what you get is you change from this um, lots of lots of satellites behind the main drop here. To these sort of long strings, um, which you kind of hope will stay intact long enough to pull themselves back together, and whether they do or they don't, um, something we'll discuss later. It's very reminiscent of the sort of beads on the string <laughs> you get in other parts. So, how are we going to look at this? Um, so, again, um, I want to put a reference to John Hinch on this. So, there's a lovely paper by John Hinch called "Do We Understand the Physics of the Constituent Equation?" Which I think everyone should should read um, and part of the discussion there is that what you need in a lot of these things particularly in flows that have a lot of extension is you need to take into account finite extensibility um, and that's critical here because otherwise if you don't have finite extensibility the, the the threads will never break they'll never break off so you need to put that that feature in but otherwise this very simple um BECR model does everything that you that you really need in terms of getting the key bits of physics right. Um, it's got um, three parameters. There's a concentration of polymer, a relaxation time, which is essentially uh, proportional to the molecular weight, and also this extensibility, how much you can stretch these molecules out until you get to their uh, full extension. And we're thinking about dilute polymers. Um, so we're thinking here about the case where uh, C is rather small, uh, but the extensibility is large. Uh, and so what you find is that in particularly in extension, um, you can you start to see polymer effects as long as C is um, large compared to one over L squared. So that's a very that can be a very small number. So you can you can see effects way below the concentration at which you could detect this. In a, in a shear flow viscosity experiment. And that's important because one of the challenges that they had in industry was the fact that they would have, they essentially measured the viscosity uh, in a viscometer. And if that feels about right, then they assume that that's, that's, um, that, that's essentially then replicating the, the conditions that they want. But if you've got polymers in there, essentially they can be, they can be hidden. Um, and so you can still get effects of very, very many um, concentrations. Okay, so this is the side I thought was coming for the next one. Um, so it's very similar to this capillary thinning uh, one. Um, so, uh, and I think I've got a picture of Garrett here somewhere. Um, is that one from yours? Yeah, I think it is. Um, so this classic experiment, which um, you can you can do it with your fingers, or you can you can get a device to do it in a much more controlled <laughs> manner. But essentially, what you do is you form a liquid bridge, and then you want to thin the surface tension. Uh, there's a very nice result um, from Entoff and Hinch, which shows that quite generally, this um, this decay goes as the Q uh, root of the relaxation function, um, and so it, essentially. A long time it picks out the longest relaxation time of the polymer as this uh, one that it factor in here. And then down here, it um, 
you get you get the effects of finite extensibility that, that actually cuts the thing off. Um, and yeah, so it's all in that um, nice picture there. So these are some of the simulations. So there's a Newtonian one um, at the top, uh, and then these are various combinations of concentration and extensibility. And you see you can get all kinds of different uh, behaviors happening. This is um, some simulations that were done by uh, Neil Morrison. Um, so probably the, the ones in the middle are probably the, the particular tail attracting the drop is the one you particularly want. Uh, the one you desperately want to avoid is the uh, bungee jump down the bottom, um, because that means that your device is going to fail. And that's essentially what happens if you've got too much elasticity in there, but you just can't overcome um, the elasticity of the pond. So for these very dilute solutions, you can um, go back to the thin model and, and, and actually work out what these things are for very dilute solutions um, in terms of the uh, molecular molecular weight parameters. Um, and that's essentially what we did here. And just the, the point that I want to make here about the relaxation time is you need to compare these times which are in microseconds, so they're very, very short. Um, you need to compare them to the capillary break-off time that's driving the, the, the break-off, and that capillary break-off time is about 30 microseconds. So these ones are around about um, 210, are, are just about, about on that point. And so you can translate all those pretty um, videos and, and make yourself a sort of phase diagram of liquid behaviors, um, depending on the molecular weight, uh, and the concentration of the polymer. And again, see, you notice that this is in part per million. So it's a really very small amount of polymer that you need to change the behavior. So the Newtonian behavior is actually right down here by this solid line here. And that's the thing that corresponds to the CL squared being of order one. Whereas the point where you're going to see um, uh, a change to the, vis to the shear viscosity, that's up at this line here, which is around C equals one, and you can see that's actually decades, decades further up. And in particular, um, way before you get to that point, the, the thing is not going to print at all. You're well into the kind of bunchy jump uh, regime, but it's going to get there. And this was just the comparison. Um, so this is uh, an image uh, from a Zar print head with a, a, as you can see, one one thousand. Um, part per million of polystyrene, uh, this 210K, which I said was found the one that kind of gives you the, the depth number of order one. And so if you translate that into the parameters in the Feeney model, uh, then that's a C of about 0 0.23. So you can see it's well below one and L equals um, 20 for the extensibility. And like, quite like Bits quite well. So then if you if you double the concentration, you can see that you now start to get into trouble with the printer. The printer stop uh, stops working. Um, I should have said that the way this um, printer is fired is that every third drop is fired at the same time. So what you're seeing effectively is three different snapshots in time. Um, so if you go back to the previous one, um, that's why you get this nice regular pattern. And you can see what's what's regular in the sense that the the drop position and the length of the uh, ligament is, is pretty similar between the different points. But you can see that where these satellites appear is, is basically random. Um, so if I go to the, the higher concentration, um, then what you see is that actually things are, things are, not, things are not doing well. Um, it does give the advantage now that almost anything I put up in the simulation is going to fit something on that slide. Um, but it actually fits. It fits the ones that essentially are still functioning, uh, whereas you can see some of the others. Are coming, so, how am I doing for time? I'm going slowly. I think I'm going to rush over this next bit to talk about. Um, so, now to shift to um, dynamics of extension. This is uh, work of my uh, recent research student, um, Evangelia, on the Hulu. Um, so what we wanted to ask here is what happens if you add surfactants? Um, how does that change uh, the jet performance? So uh, 
With the surfactants, what you have is you have the surface tension, which is now a function of the surface concentration of the surfactant, which I call capital gamma. And that in turn is being uh, adapted around the, the fluid surface. And for these inkjet printing applications, um, you can essentially ignore surface diffusion and absorption because they happen far slower than any of the dynamics. That's so it's essentially just an advection problem. Um, and the key parameter that's going to come in here um, is essentially the, the, the ratio of these two terms here. It's, it's which you can think of as a dimensionless surfactant strength. Um, so I like call that beta. And of course, the key effects here are, first of all, you're going to get the change in the surface, uh, surface tension, which will affect the normal force. But more importantly, you've got the sparingoma force that comes from the gradients in the surface tension. So we did some experiments. Um, and actually, then we, in, in particular, this, these were the ones that were done in um, 20, um, has some really nice images. Um, and what you can see is that there's basically no difference between adding surfactant uh, and uh, adjusting with, without surfactant. There are some small differences. Um, you can see in particular, although they pinch off at essentially the same time, you've got slightly different dynamics happening here and here in terms of the simulations. It's difficult to get, um, if you don't know what the um, flow is in upstream, which was difficult in this one, it's, it's quite a slightly different match experiments. This was, this was as good as we could do. Um, so that was a bit disappointing. Um, in some way. It should be said that um, the, surf, the equilibrium surface tension between two, these two cases is very different. Uh, so the, the, um, the trident one there is, is about half the surface tension of, of the water at equilibrium. But of course, you're not at equilibrium. You're, you're going far faster than that. And in fact, essentially what's happening is there's no surfactants here. Um, and that's why it's breaking up in exactly the same way as the, as the Newtonian case. Um, and that's just uh, a little time later. And again, you can see this, there's not a lot of difference. Um, you can just about probably detect that um, this is longer than this side here. And again, that, that is captured by the, the simulations, although other bits are not, not, quite, not quite right. Um, so what's happening to the spectrum? Um, so there's two cases here. So one is B3 equals 0.1, which is a, a, there's some fairly weak surfactants. It does sort of correspond to the appropriate variant for the, the triton. And then this is B3 equals 1, which is probably bigger than you can get, but it, it illustrates <laughs> the point. Um, and the concentration goes from red to blue. So blue is essentially no surfactant, uh, and red is um, high concentration. And you can see that it's all concentrated around the head of, of the drop. So if I move that forward a bit, you can see that what then happens is it then gets swept around the sides as you as you start to, to pinch off and form that, that head drop. Um, and then if I run it again, you can see that at the back, there's basically no surfactant, which is why it pinches up. Say, but you've got slightly different dynamics happening at the, at the front. You've got a delay in the pinch off uh, happening at, at the neck due to the fact that there are, there are, there are some, there is a surfactant gradient there. And in fact, in that case, all it did was delay it. But if you play around, you can see the advantage of uh, numerical simulations, you can play around with the parameters and, and try and get some fun things to happen. And if you slow the thing down enough, you can get to a situation where the one with surfactant, which is the one green here, um, doesn't break off, whereas the one in blue, uh, which was just the plain water, that one does break off. So you can get a, 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 a qualitative difference in the breakup behavior with surfactant, but you have to push it pretty much to, to the limit. So the other thing we looked at um, is that once the, the main drop breaks off, it, it, it oscillates, particularly these, these, are, these are water drops, so they're, um, they're a lot less viscous than the, than the uh, typical ones you get in inkjet printing. And therefore, you can, you can use that oscillation principle um, to determine both the surface tension and um, viscosity, so I'll show you. Can see. I mean, the, 
the satellite and wobbles like mad, but this one, this one also you can see is is oscillating. And so you can relate that then to Lamb's theory and ask, um, can we then measure, can we use this as a way to measure it essentially instantaneously um, the viscosity and the surface tension? And that would be great because you could do it on a time scale that actually is otherwise not measurable. Otherwise, you can't measure um, dynamic surface tension on, on those timelines. And uh, this is something um, that, that uh, Song Yang uh, looked at and showed that indeed you can, and, and indeed she, she was able to um, to measure the surface tension um, and viscosity of, of fluids using this technique. So what happens now if we do this again in our sort of numerical experiment um, with the presence of the surfactants? Can can we what, what can we find? Um, and the well. Initially, surprising thing is that actually the effect of the surfactant is, is not to change the frequency, which is the thing that's determining surface tension. And that's because actually there isn't that much of a change in the surface tension. Um, and so what you, you, you get is this um, about 5% reduction in, in the frequency. However, it makes an enormous difference to the dissipation. So it makes it appear that the, blue, that the drop is much more viscous. And this is the effect of the Marangoni stress because you're not starting from a uniform distribution, <laughs> non uniform distribution. And so that Marangoni stress increases the dissipation. So, this is a kind of warning that if you use this, this technique to measure a fluid that's, um, that's got a surfactant present, then actually you may be um, misconstruing what you think the viscosity is because of this um, Marangoni. I think that's my time. Um, so, um, happy related 75th birthday, John. Um, and just, just kind of, I'll just take the long this um, And I should just thank all the various people, the collaborators who have helped with the mission. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Do we have questions, comments? I'm supposed to ask them questions. <laughs> <laughs> it would be in character. <laughs> so, so it was very interesting the surface tension somehow the surfactants were being pulled around the back to the break off point. Yeah. So they might have a serious okay. strain. Well, why do they want to be um, it's just I think it's just it's just the infection. You've got the if you just look at the flow inside the drop. There's a, big there's, a jet, there's a jet down the middle and it sort of sweeps around the back, so it just gets pulled around. It's very nice about jet breakup. What happens in the cockpit? I okay. haven't looked at that yet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's of course a much slower process. Well, not the hitting isn't, but the spreading. Splashing. Splashing. Good question, but I don't know the answer. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Um, from the chat? Mahesh would like to ask Mahesh, a question. Please go ahead, Mahesh. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, very nice talk. I had a question regarding uh, the, the criteria that you use for breakup uh, in your numerical simulations. Uh, does it depend on the grid size? Because uh, you distinguish different regimes, especially with the polymers there. So choosing a smaller grid, does it lead to a different breakup? Uh, compared to a, a larger grid, let's say. Uh, you're right, you do, because it's a, it does, the smaller, you have, you have to choose a cutoff length at, at, at which, which to, to, to judge it. Um, it's certainly true, you have to be careful that you, you refine them finer, particularly in these, um, in the case of the polymers, because the polymers can essentially um, keep a very, very thin, um, surface for a long time. So we, we did look at that, but but ultimately as it pinches off, it pinches into um, one of these uh, self-similar regimes. And so you you can at that point you do know it's going to go to finite cutoff. Does that does that answer your question? Yes, it does, because uh, you know we have had some experience where um, it was with liquid sheets where the liquid sheet could just keep stretching without breakup. Yeah. And the question always was, how do you decide when it should actually break up? So my, I was wondering whether you could go from your breakup regime to that bungee jumping regime where 
you know, it never breaks up, but then elasticity takes over and then it completely retracts back. That's what I was, yeah. Yeah, I think you, you have to go quite carefully there, I think. Okay. I'm sure there okay. is a, there, there is a, I mean, it, what happens is you, you, it, it is all to do with finite extensibility. If you don't have finite extensibility, then it will, in a sense, keep, keep stay in this sort of exponential decay, and just keep going on, on, on forever. So it, it, you do need that, um, you do need finite extensibility so that you get then into a regime where you're, you're going to go to a finite time similarity. John's going to ask the question. So you know, if you put your finger into one of the more concentrated columns, you can run across the whole width of the yeah. room, leaving a thread which hangs around yeah. for a minute or so yeah. and won't break up. Yeah. But it's numerically, you have to make a decision yeah, at some point yeah. to do surgery and cut. Yeah. Michael? Um, do you mean the surfactants with those igneous solutions? Yeah, yeah. Do, are the surface viscous stresses ever important, or is the surfactant too small? These these were pretty small surfactants. So this is quite, it's, it's, it's but you want them to, we tried to make them as small as possible so that, um, Essentially, so that so that if they had a chance of doing something that they, you know, in terms of equilibrating, um, I think if you, if you had some, we didn't. Yes, we've not looked at cut because you could you could put like bigger molecules on the surface, and then then you would get some surface elasticity. That's, I, I think it may also slow down the pinching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, the trines it's about small. They're they're pretty small ones. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Thank you. The final one thing I have to just point out that the green jet printing in Cambridge started somewhat earlier with uh, Richard Day. Uh, we went out to Domino and they give you a scholarship, maybe. And it's because they were so impressed by that work, they were happy to go in and uh, generate this large grant two times for five years. Are you? Are we seeing that on Zoom, Steve? No. <laughs> Can you share? Yeah. I'm still, I'm still fascinating about the way to do it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Right. So the next speaker is Paul Garcia from the University of Strathclyde, and he's going to talk about non-Newtonian meets porous media. Thank you, Paul, for coming. Good. Thank you. Uh, as you said, the title is non-Newtonian meets porous media, but there's a subtitle. Uh, it's about three double phones. Uh, so I'd ask to start to uh, say something about my uh, interaction with John. Uh, when I worked with John, I was working on polymer Brownian motion, and he was very, very interested um, at that time on looking at uh, how polymer could be coiled and how they could be stretched out. Uh, and what my PhD was basically about was uh, working on how they went from stretch state into a coiled state. So this is a paper of John's from I think 1994. 
Uh, a few years after working with John, I met various people that got me interested not in polymers but in foams. Uh, and one of those people was Dennis Weir, who I put a photo up because he also had a big birthday uh, this year. Uh, and I guess what Dennis convinced me is that foams geometrically were very, very interesting. Um, these, these polymer browning in motion, uh, uh, the, the ones where they're all coiled up and they're, they're browning coils are, I guess, geometrically interesting. Once you stretch them out straight, uh, they're just straight, they're just straight lines, whereas foams are uh, rather different. They're, they're subtly curved. And so I was working on uh, models for foams uh, moving along channels. And a person called Gil Rosson convinced me that uh, uh, those models were actually useful for studying foam in porous media for oil recovery applications and for other types of applications. That's interesting on a couple of levels. Uh, first of all, around the time I was working with John, he was also working with other people on porous media. So that was a nice thing. Uh, and the other thing is that we uh, 3D printed some spoke porous media and uh, then pushed uh, oil in them and then use foam to push out the oil. Uh, so another thing that I worked on was John, uh, I guess like Oliver, I also worked on uh, uh, 3D, uh, oh, sorry, on inkjet printing. Uh, it was all 2D printing in those days. I never would have imagined that we could do 3D printing. Uh, and so we were able to 3D print these bespoke porous media and, uh, and push out the foam. John, I guess, made his career talking about uh, non or talking about non Newtonian things, but he wasn't, it wasn't beneath him to look at problems that were of interest to Newton. Uh, so he, he looked at this, he published in 1999, this paper on Newton's cradle. Uh, and that inspired me to look at this problem. Um, Newton, when he started looking at uh, gravity, he tried to do, or well, he started off with the two body problem, he managed to solve that. Uh, and then he uh, he moved on from the two body problem to the three body problem, and I think it very soon ended up in his two hard basket, and he, he couldn't really make very much progress with it. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a this problem that's inspired by that. It's a it's a foam with three bubbles, a foam moving through a porous medium with three bubbles, and it was in my two hard basket for a very very long time, 17 years until a bright graduate student came along and we talked about. It. So given that I was John's graduate student. I thought it would be nice today to talk about what one of my graduate students has been doing. Okay. Uh, there's the slick with non Newtonian because the foam structure affects the mobility, but the pressure that we drive this thing affects the structure. So ultimately, pressure affects the mobility, so it's, it's non Newtonian. So, this is Carlos's talk I'm going to go into. Uh, various sorts of applications. Uh, one is, is foam in porous media, uh, not just for getting oil out of the ground. You can also use it to, to clean up the contaminated soils. There's also all sorts of medical applications for uh, sclerotherapy. Uh, so there's all sorts of applications like that. The system I'm going to look at, if you think about it, is a helical cell. So we've got a monolayer of bubbles moving between glass plates, and we're always going to look down at that from the bottom. Okay. So as we look down at it from above, we're going to see what appears to be an upper channel wall and a lower channel wall, but they're really side walls of this here. Okay. And if it's a nice regular bone, they'll all be in this, this nice hexagonal structure. These are some experiments that really inspired this work. These were done by Wink Kudrankin uh, 17 years ago. That's why I said this problem would be, be puzzling me for 17 years. What we did, she took a glass plate, rubber sheet on top of that glass plate and she cut a track between the glass plate and another glass plate on top. So you're looking down at from above and then she put foam into this system. And it's this nice staircase or staircase structure of foam that's probably just zigzagging from one side of the chair into the other. And then she started driving it. You can imagine what's going to happen uh, if the bubbles on the outside of the track want to keep up with the bubbles on the inside of the track they need to move faster than the ones on the inside. And because there's these glass plates here, there's going to be more drag on them. There's more drag on them, they're being held back. And eventually, and after a certain speed or after a certain driving pressure, this system undergoes what's called a topological transformation. Uh, and the ones on the inside overtake the ones on the outside. It doesn't happen when you push slowly, it only happens when you push quickly. So you can't use the Young Laplace law, 
because these systems are not in equilibrium, you have to put in some viscous drag. And so we've used something called the viscous drop model and the simulation replicate the experiment. There's two things that you need. You need viscous drag and you need asymmetry. The asymmetry here comes from the shape of the channel. We started to think, what sort of effects can we see in straight channels? In a straight channel, there are certain structures that you can push them along as hard as you like, uh, as fast as you like, and they'll never break up. One is called a bamboo. Then there's the single staircase, which is the case they drink and looked at, but in the curved channel, not in the straight channel. And there's the double staircase. So those structures will never break up. We looked at a drastically truncated staircase that we call the lens. It looks like half a lens. So you've got your channel. On one side of the channel, you've got a bubble. On the other side of the channel, you've just got a single thing. So the asymmetry here is coming from the structure. It's not coming from the shape of the channel. It's coming from the foam structure itself. If you push it slowly, it looks like this. It's essentially an equilibrium. And if you push it quickly, the bubble that has two films, has no drag on it, it falls behind. And then this film, the, the film we call the standing film, it runs again. Okay? So this is like the hydrogen atom of foams. It's got all the elements that you need to study a foam. Uh, if this were a microfluidic reactor, and you leave, say, emulsion drops, and you were trying to deliver some chemical payload, this is essentially telling you don't be too greedy, don't push too fast, because there's a natural, there's a natural maximum speed. When this spanning film detaches, the bubble just stays there stuck. You can increase the pressure and it won't want to move because it will just increase its own pressure and just says, I'm happy where I am. Thank you very much. And we've, we've seen that happen in Australia. Uh, so just to convince you it's non-Newtonian, we've plotted the uh, driving pressure against the velocity. And it's it's almost a straight line, but it's not quite a straight line. And there's this certain maximum pressure at which the system breaks up. You can't go there, you can't go beyond that because it will then fall pressure. So we've got this infinite staircase that we know is very, very stable. It just wants to, it won't change its topology. We've got this lens that is unstable and will break after a certain point. Can we find something that bridges between those two behaviors? So we want, what we went for was three bubbles. Two bubbles is no good, it's just too symmetric. So you need to have some sort of a So we went for this three bubble problem. Uh, this is what it looks like at equilibrium. We've got two bubbles at the top, they're the same size. The reason they're the same size is that they're one side of the channel can be fed from one population of bubbles, the other side of the channel can be fed by another population of bubbles. So they might the two populations might be different size, but chances are the ones at the top will be similar size, and the one at the bottom could be a different size because it could be coming from a different source. The other thing I want to draw your attention to are L1 and L2. They are distances uh, of the vertex V1, V2, V3. So L1 is the distance of vertex V1 from the upper channel wall. L2 is the distance of vertex V2 from the upper channel wall. You can just think of them as surrogates for the bubble area. These are the equilibrium distances. So they, all they do is just define the bubble areas or the bubble volumes. Um, they're just convenient surrogates because they go from north to one from one side of each other. The model, uh, the physics of it is just, you have a driving pressure, you have a surface tension curvature. The difference between those two things has to be balanced by viscous drag. You can make everything dimensionless and in dimensionless form, you've just got this very simple equation on the right-hand side saying that the normal velocity is just the difference between the pressure and the curvature. Very, very simple to write down. It's quite so easy to solve. When Carlos started tackling the problem, uh, he found that because the structure is geometrically much more complicated than a simple lens, it can undergo lots of different transformations. So it's a bit like zoology. You have to classify all these different types of transformations. The one on the top right is the same sort of transformation the simple lens undergoes. Uh, it's on the upper channel wall, we call that the T1U. Uh, there is also a uh, T1. Uh, T1C, which is a vertex vertex collision. That's the type of transformation that Renkin saw in the curved channels. 
Uh, we also see transformations on the lower channel wall. Uh, there's a downstream one that's called the T1L, and there's a T1L prime that is on lower channel wall but happening further upstream. So those, those transformations, they never happen with a simple lens, but they do actually happen with the three bubble system. Uh, the way Carlos solved this initially was at steady state. So he set it up at equilibrium. Uh, he then took a small step up in pressure, let the thing get to steady state. He was able to calculate the steady state. There are seven variables he needs, the three bubble pressures, uh, three turning angles for the films and the velocity, and he sets as the control variable the pressure that is driving the system. So there's seven unknowns there. Once he knows all those variables, he can work out the shape average. They're not arcs of circles because we're outside the younger glass wall, uh, but you can actually work out what they are analytically. It's a terrible instrument to do, but Carlos managed to do it. So we've got seven variables, and we've also got seven constraints on this system. We've got the three bubble areas, and then there are meeting angles at, at the two vertices. There are two meeting angles at, the, at, the, uh, at each of the two vertices. So we've got seven unknowns, seven equations. You can solve them. Carlos solved them, starting off with fairly small bubbles. What he observed is that uh, as you increase the pressure, the structure changes. And he kept an eye on L12, which is the length of the film between bubble one and bubble two. And as he increases the pressure, that film shrinks, and eventually that length falls to zero. And that's when we get this topological transformation, which is the T1C type, the drinking type of transformation. Slightly bigger bubbles now. Same idea, he's cranking up the pressure. The film like L12 goes down. If it reaches a certain point, we can't get to any higher pressure. When we can't get to that higher pressure, the system undergoes a saddle node bifurcation. There's a new branch of solution that magically appears. Uh, and if we track that branch down, uh, you can, it actually, the pressure starts to decrease on that branch and the length of this film decreases. It uh, eventually reaches a, a T1 and it's, it's once again a T1. But this is actually an unstable system. This is a steady state method, uh, but you can also do the unsteady state, that second branch is unstable. So if you do the physical experiment, you would actually gradually increase the pressure and you'd reach a point at which you can't, the pressure once it reaches a certain level, it will just undergo a dynamic instability. It won't be a quasi stable Slightly bigger bubbles again, yet another type of behavior. Uh, increase the pressure, that length goes down and eventually levels off at a certain finite length and it doesn't undergo any topological transformation whatsoever. So this was actually the sort of behavior we're hoping to see because then this shows that this system is a bridge between the simple lens that always breaks and the infinite lens that never breaks. So this sometimes never breaks and sometimes <laughs> always breaks, depending on, depending on what, what, what areas you choose. Uh, as well as working out that uh, Carlos also managed to work out the asymptotics for what happens when this thing is moving very, very quickly. And so he was able to verify that uh, what his solution was converging to was actually very clear. When it's moving very, very quickly, the films become asymptotically flat. But the flat films don't meet the angle constraints. So there is a curvature boundary layer. <coughs> in which the curvature gets very, very high and the angle changes very, very rapidly over a small distance. And in this curvature boundary layer, that's how you manage to meet, meet all the energy. And so Carlos was able to work out, work out this shape. Um, one of the big things he did was work out these phase diagrams. And the, the main thing you see, the main take-home message from these phase diagrams is it's a mess. There's this real zoom of topological transformations. Um, remember L1 and L2 are just surrogates for bubble area. So L1, make L1 bigger, the bubbles at the top get bigger. Make L2 bigger, the bubble at the bottom gets smaller. Uh, so there's a region of T1Us, there's a region of T1Cs, uh, T1Us in the bottom left, T1Cs at the top. In between them, there's this buffer zone where the system's not quite sure whether it wants to undergo a T1U or a T1C. And so what it does is it chooses one of those saddle node things. It's not quite sure what it wants to do. Uh, in the bottom right-hand corner, it's an even bigger mess. Uh, we've got some T1Ls. What's happening in the bottom right-hand corner is that all the bubbles are quite big. And so all the vertices start off quite close to one or other channel. Okay. And so there's lots of different ways you can create. Uh, it's a big mess. Uh, 
There's some T1L primes in there. There's some T1Ls in there. There's some T1Us and T1Cs, and they all sort of come together. And there's this region here that I've labeled PB greater greater than one. That's the region that never breaks. So lots of different types of behaviors. In some ways, it's more liable to break than the simple lens because it can break in so many different ways. In other ways, it's less liable to break in the simple lens because it has this certain regime where it can get very, very strong and resist the uh, We also looked at velocity versus pressure. Uh, so one thing you notice is that the velocity for given driving pressure for the three bubble system is less than for the simple lens. As they expected, it's got more films. What really counts is the uh, pressure drop per film. So we looked at the pressure drop per film, uh, which is the, the one on the right, and they overlay one another. But what you see is that the three bubble system is stronger. It gets a higher pressure per film and gets a higher velocity per breaks. You also see it's non Newtonian because they're not quite straight lines. It's not very non Newtonian, it's a bit non Newtonian, but it is non Newtonian. Uh, so there's, there's a set of conclusions that I think I can skip over for now. Uh, Carlos has moved on now from steady state to unsteady state simulations. And there was a surprise. Uh, he hit this. So the way the unsteady state works is rather than gradually cranking up the pressure, you just hit it with a very large pressure immediately. Okay. So he hit it with a very large pressure immediately. And he hit it with pressures up to 80 dimensions per unit. So I think we can talk about what dimensions per unit mean. Later on. Uh, when you hit it with 80 dimension units, it just uh, didn't break. Okay. Whereas if you looked at the steady state case, and if you hit it with as few as four dimensional units, gradually cranking up the pressure, it wouldn't, it would break after four dimensional units. Uh, and what he found, having got these new steady solutions, that there's this new branch of steady solutions that only kicks in at large pressures. So low pressures, it won't break. Then there's this band gap in which it must break, band gap pressures, and then it kicks into this new steady state. So it's a weird system. If you hit this thing moderately, it will break. If you hit it very, very strongly, it won't break. Just don't um, and of course, we're not just interested in one topological transformation. Uh, once it undergoes one topological transformation, you might undergo another topological transformation. So it's a bit like doing high energy physics. You've got this uh, subatomic particle that you hit and it breaks, and then, but that's an unstable intermediate state and it breaks into another one. So these are the sorts of states that Carlos found. The system can break apart altogether uh, and not, not propagate at all. That's what happens on the, uh, on the, the, top, the top left. Uh, on the bottom, there are these so-called bamboo states. Uh, once they're formed, you can't break them. They just keep propagating. Uh, and on the right, we found these two bubble states. Okay? Those states can be broken, but the system doesn't like to break. Very symmetric. There is a way to break them, but they don't actually like to break. So those are, are metastable states, particularly the one on the top right. It just loves going into that state of a very, very wide range of, of, of bubble areas. This one actually, when you figure it out, uh, moving quickly has the lowest mobility of all the structures. Um, so I'm going to finish with that. I guess when I was John's graduate student, uh, if you told me that uh, I was going to work on a problem for 17 years and still not managed to solve it yet, I don't think I believed it, but, it's, uh, but now I guess I do. Okay, so, so thank you. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So, do we have questions? John? I'm raising the hinge protocol. The hinge protocol in the hinge protocol. Not quite. The friction law yes. is because there's a pattern of water where it affects the on the base or on the top. Yes. There's quite a lot of fluid there. Yes. Uh, worry in the real world, you slowly leave behind a film of liquid. Uh, so it might, of course, the next time will catch up to the computer. But uh, will the friction law change in the time of friction now? So there's, there are issues in the chat. If you have a spectrum as well, 
um, how this is, as we said, a lot about how the surfactant gets distributed. So, uh, losing liquid is an issue. Uh, losing surfactant is an issue. It wasn't the question I was expecting you to ask. I was expecting you to ask uh, about nonlinear friction, uh, whether it's a nonlinear friction, which really should be there. Uh, the reason it's not there is because it's so much easier to invoke the, uh, if you use linear friction, uh, it's so much easier to work out what the pressures are because you just have to integrate the velocities around the surface and uh, set that to zero uh, because that then, that then invokes the constraints. So it's much, much easier to work out the pressures if you use the uh, linear friction rather than all of them, which should be a two thirds. So it's harder to pick up. Do we have any more questions? Stephen? Yeah, Howard would like to ask a question. Howard, please go ahead. Yeah, if there's time, I'll just ask a quick question. Uh, Paul, the talk was fascinating. I have a question near the very beginning about the bubbles that go around the corner. In the, um, I, I seem to recall in the foams literature, there's early work uh, from um, Elizabeth Cantor relating the friction on a bubble to the sort of Bretherton film on the wall. And I was curious whether there was any role for the uh, friction at the sidewall in the thin films in uh, changing the dynamics as the bubble on the inside and outside, which go at different speeds, go around the corner. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So there is actually some friction on the sidewalls. Uh, everything that we have, we've done uh, so far is, is assuming that the aspect ratio is very small, okay? Uh, you would need to add that extra friction in, but I think that extra friction is probably just like making the films a bit longer, mm. uh, because it's if you just make the films longer by the the gap size of the, uh, by the gap size of the Healy Shaw cell, I think that would then account fairly well for that extra friction. But it, it's a good point. In fact, thank you. Uh, in fact, the angles that we meet shouldn't be 90 degrees on those sidewalks. They should vary according to the speed. Uh, the 120 degree angles where the three films meet, that's fairly robust, but the ones at the sidewalks, we do need to correct. Mahesh, do you want to ask a quick question? Yeah, thank you very much. A very quick question. Uh, probably you did mention this. Uh, why is that when you go at a slower speed, you are, uh, the, the film doesn't break, but if you increase the pressure suddenly, uh, it doesn't break, sorry, slowly it does break and otherwise it does not. Yeah, that's a good question. So basically what happens is that the system would like to stay together. Uh, uh, young Laplace would make it, wants it to stay together. But if the asymmetry in the drag is too great, then Young Laplace can't cope anymore. And that's what causes it to break. So, uh, Surface tension is, is sort of trying to make it form a regular structure, but if the viscous drag gets too big, gets too big, then that will overcome the surface tension. And that's what we're doing. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Paul, for a nice talk. And I think now we have an online talk by Levy. I have to do some work here. Please stop sharing all. Lidi, are you there? I'm there. Very good. I'm here. To yes. <laughs> Could you share your screen? Could you please share okay, your screen? I share my screen. Okay. Up. Share screen. Hit the on. Do you see it? Do you see something? We don't see that. It says, oh, yeah. it's coming. There you go. Okay, I'm fine. Okay, yeah, so leading, okay. go ahead, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm a bit disappointed in not being with you now because I couldn't get a passport delivered on time. But anyway, I'm very happy to talk now, even to in front of a computer. And uh, I thank the organizing team for uh, giving me this nice opportunity to discuss some uh, ongoing work, actually, on the failure of a cohesive granular step and uh, whether it can tell us something on the properties of the material. 
So I have no nice pictures of me feeling very smug at the high table with John explaining me all the people, the faces on the wall. So I will only talk about uh, granular matter, hopefully with a bit more confidence than uh, when I started my postdoc with John on this uh, <laughs> very same subject. So uh, you've certainly heard many times that uh, granular matter is complex and difficult to model. So why adding cohesion there? Because it's not an obvious simplification. So the reason is that in the real world, most granular matter comes with cohesion at contact and this cohesion, for instance, prevents many industrial uh, processes to run smoothly because it creates clogging or obstruction and it's a phenomenology which is still poorly understood. And in nature, of course, uh, cohesion is everywhere with most soil uh, cohesive or snow flows much affected by the cohesion between snowflakes. So it's, uh, there are reasons to study cohesion. It's not an easy subject, however, mainly because uh, actually controlled cohesion is difficult experimentally. So cohesion is essentially produced by Van der Waals interaction in powders or capillary bond in wet granular matter. And more recently, some poly polymer coating was designed to achieve uh, a better control on sticky contacts, but altogether achieving a well-constrained cohesion of a, a large range of cohesive intensity remains uh, a challenge. So they were nevertheless measurements. We can nevertheless do measurements. So for instance, the measure, measuring the shear stress and the normal stress in flowing matter. So here, for instance, in a free surface flow made cohesive using the polymeric coating or here on the planar uh, flow in a, in a shear sail using a wet material. So these kind of study essentially allow to discuss the independence of uh, uh, the friction of the material, the internal friction of the material and the cohesive stress. But because it relies on the flow of the material, then it can only probe weak cohesion. So usually uh, stronger cohesion are uh, studied with other measurements, like for instance, the measurements of uh, uh, the angle of repose of the material. So here on this example, you see a heap of granular sugar with a weak or moderate cohesion and a heap of powdered sugar with a strong cohesion and we see how cohesion <laughs> induces much steeper slopes. We also see how cohesion induces uh, poor precision in the measurements. <coughs> and, uh, and certainly these kind of measurements are impractical for weak cohesion because we won't see anything. So in this context where uh, experimentally probing cohesion over a large range of value and make we through a consistent measurement is difficult. And there's a opportunity for numerics to show how useful they may be. But actually unexpected issue did turn up. So for instance, in the discrete element method where a somewhat uh, complex co uh, contact model is implemented, the stiffness of uh, the contact and the damping of the contact are mixing up with the uh, cohesive threshold in a way which uh, deeply affects the mean properties of the flow, which is uh, which can be can be captured actually by the definition of uh, effective cohesion. Uh, so here, for instance, you see the the depth, the thickness of a crust forming at the surface of a cohesive flow for different cohesion as a function of this effective cohesion, and we see that. Okay, this can be captured, but in, it's nevertheless uh, not trivial. So we might think that we are safe with the contact dynamics algorithm where not, no such elaborate contact laws are implemented. So in contact dynamics, cohesion can be crudely achieved by simply shifting down the non-interpenetrability graph, uh, thus making negative compressive force uh, sustainable, hence uh, creating cohesion. 
So if you do so, then the computational time step does not simplify out of uh, the momentum equation, which results in uh, the mean uh, cohesive properties of the material being dependent of uh, dependent on the uh, computational time step in the way that we see here, namely the larger the computational time step, the larger the cohesion. Okay, we nevertheless uh, did uh, uh, simulations. So here, for instance, we studied the uh, color of uh, cohesive granular material. We draw the stability graph plotting the height of the stable and unstable uh, systems as a function of the cohesion. And comparing this with a simple equilibrium model, we could derive an expression for the macroscopic co co cohesive stress as a function of the local contact force, cohesive force. And using a Navier-Stokes solver, we could perform continuum simulation and confirm the findings of uh, the discrete numeric numerics, I mean, simulation. So in the rest of the talk, I will just show more simulation of a uh, cohesive, uh, cohesive uh, material. Uh, briefly show how we characterize the failure and present a simple equilibrium model and just see whether we can uh, get some information about how the internal friction behave with cohesion. So we applied then the contact dynamic algorithm made cohesive by simply shifting down this uh, non interpenetrability graph, sorry, introducing a cohesive threshold and the cohesive threshold FC is simply a function of the mean weight of the grain time a number which is called in the literature, the uh, granular bond number. So it gives us a quantification of how cohesive the material will be. So in the rest, I mean, in our simulation, this is an input, this granular bond number is an input of the simulation with its value setting how cohesive the material is. So here, for instance, we see six simulations here with a small cohesion, namely a small bond number and here, here a larger These are extremely simple simulations, maybe two-dimensional, with one single grain diameter with a dispersion of 40%, and very few grains, which makes it easy to see something if you don't know what you're looking for. And the geometry of the system is fixed with a height which corresponds with an instable state and a friction between the grain, which is constant. And here, just to be perfect preside this friction is just the local friction between the grain. It is not to be compared uh, or mixed with the uh, effective friction of the material, the internal friction of the material. And we vary the cohesion from weak to strong. And for each value of the cohesion, we run many, sim 11, not many, 11 simulations so as to be able to estimate the error bars on uh, whatever quantities we may measure. And we focus on the failure initiation. So one part of the work uh, was uh, characterizing the failure. So I just give the ID, the main ID here, because otherwise it would be really long, which is finding uh, which allows to strike a balance between the very fine displacements at the early stage of the failure, but which are then blurred by all the diffuse motion happening in the bulk of the systems, and the coarser displacements, which are much better defined and give much better results that are late in the failure process. And moreover, you need to be able to draw a chronology of uh, the failure and uh, you need this uh, criteria to be <clears throat> valid for all value of the cohesion. So to make a long story short, we end up with a cohesive a displacement threshold of 0.2D, which give reasonably good results. Mm. And once we've decided for this uh, displacement threshold, 
we can locate uh, the failure or at least identify a failure uh, by simply locating the grain whose cumulative displacements fall in a small interval around this uh, threshold value at a well-defined time. And we can do this for all simulation and because of what we identify as the failure line uh, it can be nice, I mean, okay, approximated by a not fine function and we can simply derive its orientation. And so we do this for all the simulations. So here we use it, for instance, the failure line for three different values of the bond number, all approximated by an affine function. And so you can function of bond number. So as a function of the cohesion, as a matter of fact, uh, the failure orientation with the corresponding error bars. Uh, Nothing special to say, but that these values uh, are consistent with experimental results by uh, Gantz and uh, Gantz alone, actually, because it's a big. So now the question is can we get some information from uh, this, uh, this, this evolution? So, an obvious, I mean, an immediate thought coming to mind is just to perform some stability analysis. Uh, according to Morculon, but we are past anyway stability because we are interested in failure. So we rather uh, study the equilibrium of the system uh, along the failure plane, supposing that we are not too far from the equilibrium so that solving the equilibrium will give us information which are relevant to the state of our uh, system which is a strong assumption actually, particularly for the small cohesion, but we, we do it and we try our leg. So we just consider, uh, we are just balancing the forces along the failure line of length L and orientated at an angle alpha with the horizontal, uh, the gravity, which is driving uh, the failure and the cohesion and the friction, which are opposing the motion. We just write the uh, equilibrium along the field line. We go through a bit of arithmetic and we end up with a nice quadratic equation, which we think if we solve this, then it will give us uh, some interesting information on uh, uh, the relation between the cohesive stress, the orientation and the, the failure orientation and the friction. The only problem we have here though is that the cohesive stress is a macroscopic property which was introduced in the model while what we have in the simulation is a contact property namely something very local so that if we want to be able to compare the prediction of the model with the outcome of the simulation we need to translate the I mean, to reconcile the macroscopic and the local picture, say. So we do this in a very simple manner. We just define, I mean, we just say, right, that the cohesive stress is given by the contact forces addition divided by an effective surface. So the contact forces is just what we've implemented in the code, namely the bond number times the weight of the grain and the effective surface over which this force uh, applies so as to create a macroscopic uh, stress is unknown and we just write it's n time the diameter with n somewhere between one and ten we don't know which so then if you do this then you have a nice expression for uh, the uh, macroscopic cohesive stress as a function of the local bond number you just replace it in the equilibrium equation you change also uh, variable to make things nicer and you end up with the same uh, quadratic equation. And now we can solve it. So for solving this equation, you write uh, discriminant, and the discriminant is itself <laughs> a quadratic equation, which is uh, nice because uh, then it will give you, it will give us actually uh, an, an interval of bond number in which the equilibrium uh, equation admits solution. So, 
to the details of the resolution, but uh, the equilibrium equation admits solution for bond numbers smaller than the critical value, BC. Uh, for a larger bond number, there is no solution, presumably, because then the, the block of the granular matter does not fail anymore. There's no failure anymore to, to write an equilibrium. And so we test the solution in the interval of bond number in which solutions do exist. So in this interval, there are two routes. One diverges for a small uh, values of the cohesion, so we just dismiss it. And, and the other one is more tractable. It, uh, you see it here. So now we can simply compare uh, the prediction uh, of the model, which gives you uh, the way uh, the failure orientation should behave with the cohesion as a function of the cohesion, compare it with uh, the outcome of the simulation, namely the uh, failure orientation we've measured. So here we are, we need to know the height of the system. We know it because it's our system. We need a friction. So here we've uh, taken this, just this very extravagant value because it allows us to hit one point. And we make an assumption on the surface over which the cohesive stress is uh, computed. And this is a result from uh, the work uh, of uh, Abramian and co-worker, which I've introduced earlier. So if you do this, then you end up with one uh, solution in blue. This is a side of solution. So you see that first uh, we need an extravagant friction, uh, absolutely non-physical. And moreover, there's uh, no agreement whatsoever with the data. So, which certainly, I mean, the shape of this uh, curve certainly just reflects the fact that for a constant friction, if you increase cohesion, then failure can occur only on a steeper and steeper failure. So we go on and try, for instance, uh, okay, the height didn't change. We do not change the way we compute uh, the cohesive stress, but we need to change then the friction. So it's as before an absolutely extravagant value for the friction, but we just make it decrease with the bond number. And if you do this, then you obtain uh, something which agrees. I mean, we have an agreement say with the model and uh, with the data. But again, we have, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have an explanation at this stage for this extravagant value of the friction. So, okay, maybe, maybe something is wrong with the model. So we say, okay, we we'll change model. We'll just solve uh, something which is more, uh, let's say, okay, we just minimize the height at which equilibrium is lost. So we write the same equilibrium along the same failure plane, but now we single out the height of the system for which failure does occur. So we obtain this, uh, writing this, we can then obtain the yielding height, which is the minimum height for which a failure will occur by just minimizing this function. And if you do so, then you end up with uh, this expression between the failure plane and the internal angle of friction. Uh, and in that case, the internal angle of friction has physical value, oof. And if you plot it the way this uh, internal angle behave as a function of the bond number, we, as before, have a decrease with the bond number which uh, somehow uh, suggests that maybe some weakening may happen. So uh, to conclude, really, there's no conclusion here uh, because I've just discussed uh, some results rather than show uh, some solid conclusion because it's an ongoing work. So I'm just, to summarize what I've done, I've just presented simulation of coercive granular failure presented a simple equilibrium model between cohesion, friction, and gravity, and compare uh, the prediction of the model with the measurement from the uh, simulation. And uh, 
the only conclusion is that we have an agreement only if we suppose that friction decreases with cohesion. So there's a lot to do. Actually, I have rather uh, than a conclusion, I've rather a to do list to present. Uh, among which studying the variation of the failure with the uh, uh, the height of the system and see if this orientation is compatible with an equilibrium for all the height measured. Uh, and also study carefully the range of cohesion closer to zero to see if there's a continuity, uh, if we see a continuity of behavior between non-cohesive material and uh, weakly cohesive material. So, it's, it was a long talk uh, without any fluid. So for a birthday talk, but I hope it wasn't too dry, nevertheless. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much, Lily. My pleasure. Do we have any questions for Libby? Oh, this is the reverse hinge protocol. Yes. I don't know quite how you do the simulations, but uh, could you start with a lot of cohesion and then slowly in time decrease the cohesion? Okay, actually, I have because I, I, I'm I'm looking out in the uh, out in the country here, and we see the soil is fracturing. Due to yeah. cost of cohesion. Maybe okay. Study that on mass. So, the way I do the simulations, actually, all the systems initially are the same. So, I'm just making uh, uh, cohesionless packings, and all of a sudden, I just create some system with a huge value of cohesion. So, at the start, it's just solid blocks. And then I decrease the, the the cohesion and see how they fail. But uh, otherwise, it would be a study of the sintering uh, mechanism. I mean, if I was uh, doing the system with a different cohesion, then they would have different uh, uh, volume fraction, and then it would be a completely different uh, matter. It would be even more uh, complicated. So I, I, I don't know what. I think if I were to do what you're thinking about, what I think you're thinking about, I would really need to be 3D, which I'm not. Okay, I didn't catch up. But given the first picture of a pile of sugar powder, yeah. which was total mess, uh, your talk is brilliant. Thank you, <laughs> Thanks. Just... Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Questions online? I don't think we have any. Okay, so thank you very much, Lily, for your nice talk. Okay, so I think we are now moving to Howard Stone, who is also going to present online. Lily, could you stop sharing? Uh, I'm I'm trying to <clears throat> stop sharing here. Okay. Thank you. Howard. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Shall we wait a little bit, or shall we turn on? Okay. Okay. So the next speaker is Howard Stone. Uh, he's going to talk about a glimpse of fluid mechanics through the work of John Hinge. Howard. Um. Well, uh, thank you everyone for the chance to speak. I'm sorry, I can't be there in person. Uh, happy birthday, John, and uh, hello to many friends, both online and I think in the room. Um, I put together this uh, talk uh, to help celebrate John and I'll see, uh, we'll see how uh, it goes. But I wanna begin by uh, thanking my research group for, uh, and this is a picture of them and many of their significant others, since they contribute uh, to many of the ideas that I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, this picture was taken shortly before the pandemic began. This picture was taken just a couple months ago when, um, you know, many, many people in the last uh, year or six months have done a lot together. Now, my path for speaking here is because 
Uh, I had an advisor, Gary Leo. Gary um, was very important to my intellectual development. And Gary spent time in Cambridge because his advisor, uh, young Andy Akervos, uh, may be shown here about the time John, maybe a few years after or before John first met him. And then I ended up a postdoc uh, in Cambridge uh, with John Hinch. Uh, so with that as an introduction, I'm going to give a talk that uh, mentions my postdoc long ago, where I shared an office with uh, Oliver Harlan, who, who began the morning. I'll make a few remarks about some of John's work in low Reynolds number hydrodynamics and mention how it touches on some of mine. I'll mention the reciprocal theorem, I'll mention Jeffrey orbits, mention soft surfaces, and I'll make a remark just about polymers, but I, I won't say more about that. John is talking about that topic later today. Oh, I'm sorry, John is talking about the viscoelastic flows later today. And then finally, I'll, I'll spend a, a little time telling you some details about what happens when particles move near pattern surfaces. Okay, so with that as an introduction, long ago, I was a postdoc with John Hinch. Uh, he suggested I work on a certain problem that involved uh, shear flow over a surface which had a heated patch. Uh, I, I uh, made progress on the problem with a lot of help from uh, colleagues in Damped. And uh, as was already mentioned uh, this morning, there are a lot of people that acknowledge John. Uh, Oliver made that remark earlier, and so I did as well. Uh, but I will say that when I wrote up the paper for uh, publication, John Hinch's name was on it, and John uh, came to me and said, uh, what's my name doing on this paper? This is your work. My name should not be on it. And so I'm sure probably many of us have had that experience where we uh, gained a lot from John uh, and uh, thank him a lot as well. Okay, so uh, I found this picture online among the pictures for the conference. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't remember, I once had hair. It's uh, this picture is evidence for that. Um, this was taken a few years after uh, the postdoc, and Eric is going to speak later today, and Ashok Sangani is also in the picture. It's a nice event, my uh, last trip to Las Vegas, in fact. Okay, so now uh, a few hydrodynamics features. So John uh, has given us a, a means for thinking about a wide range of problems and a, a sort of a style for them. So I'll begin with the reciprocal theorem. Um, if you're interested in the reciprocal theorem and wanna see how it touches on many problems, I co-authored an article uh, with Hassan Masood, who's a real expert on the topic. Um, but in fact, uh, a very inspirational paper for us is an early paper by John published in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics uh, 50 years ago. Uh, it's called A Note on Symmetries of Certain Material Tensors for Particle and Stokes Flows. And in the paper, he points out uh, the way that forces, torques, and the stresslet are related linearly uh, through a you know, large uh, matrix or second order or higher order tensor to the velocity, translational rotational velocities in the rate of strain tensor. And very interesting for me is if you look in this paper, John comments the following thing. Uh, he says, uh, the first three, uh, those are the box in purple. I hope this is showing up in the room. Uh, the first three are known, see uh, two papers by Howard Brenner, but the remaining three uh, shown here as QR and C in the notation were recently overlooked by Batchelor and by Brenner. So uh, this is quite a list of uh, sort of heroes of low Reynolds number hydrodynamics in this sentence. But this paper is very uh, helpful for thinking through some of the uh, mathematics of these problems. And uh, from there, uh, John actually and Gary Leal wrote a number of papers on the Jeffrey orbit problem. Uh, this is again, a very classical problem that remains very important because it talks about how slender bodies reorient in shear flows. And in uh, thinking about this problem uh, recently, uh, with one of my students, we, uh, James Rogovine, uh, we recognized how you might be able to make progress using slender body ideas, but thinking about particles that break 4F symmetry. So the sort of particle shape we studied is in the lower right. And uh, this uh, paper, which looks at trajectories and shear flows of these funny shaped objects also um, uh, relates to some very nice work that uh, John Lister uh, published a couple of years ago. So there's a nice link to uh, colleagues and friends in Damped. 
Okay. And what we discovered, of course, when once you break 4F symmetry, which for whatever reasons uh, people hadn't done uh, much of, uh, particles can start to adopt uh, orientations that stop rotating, but permanently drift even in a shear flow because you've broken the symmetries of <clears throat> present in some of the Stokes flow uh, equations. Okay. So I've uh, done that. So what about soft surfaces? Well, this is a very uh, exciting area in low Reynolds number flows and complex fluids. There are many, many problems with soft surfaces or, or just uh, particles near surfaces to begin with. So an early paper by a whole slew of wonderful uh, hydrodynamicists, uh, colored scientists, Bill Russell, Gary Leal, John Hinch, studied uh, slender objects near walls and the dynamics, which are shown on the upper right, lead to different kinds of reorientations as a part of slender particle sediments near a wall, whether it remains sort of parallel to the wall or orients in a near perpendicular orientation to the wall. But others have looked at soft surfaces, soft particles near surfaces, and shown on my slide, I hope displaying for you, is uh, a vesicle in a shear flow near a wall. The same thing happens for a drop near a wall, where the drop uh, reorient um, changes shape, becomes uh, somewhat elliptical, and then drifts away from the wall. And this this is a very important idea. Then the interplay between the shape and the motion perpendicular to the wall. Now uh, there's a, a now a large literature on this kind of topic, soft surfaces and, and spheres. I've mentioned a few classic references here. And uh, <clears throat> my group a number of years ago worked on a variant of this problem where you uh, have a rigid sphere sedimenting near a soft surface. So I'll show you a movie on the, on the right. You'll see a green vertical line, I hope. Uh, maybe I can ask Stephen Cowley, is the green vertical line showing up in Cambridge? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So when you uh, sediment a sphere uh, near a wall, this is work done with Bargav Ralabandi and Naomi Oppenheimer, the sphere distorts the plane uh, as a bending deformation. And the bending deformation has a hydrodynamic effect that causes the sphere to slowly drift uh, perpendicular to the plane. And we computed this, in fact, using the reciprocal theorem uh, to, to bypass all the detailed calculations. But there are a wide range of these problems. And in fact, very early on, uh, well, almost 40 years ago, Rob Davis and John Hinch studied uh, the interaction of a sphere when there's an elastic-like interaction responsible. And I think Rob is going to talk about that later today. Now, uh, uh, there's a lot of inter interest in things like flagella and slender filaments, soft filaments, and very early in John's uh, work, uh, he studied the distortion of soft materials, in this case, a, a string-like object in a flow. Um, I highly recommend this paper for two reasons. One is, uh, as you see on the slide, there are only four references. In fact, only one of them really even deals with the problem at hand. Uh, Forgoss and Mason in a really inspirational work, seven, uh, more than 60 years ago, looked at aspects of this problem. The other references are about more slender objects. Um, and in preparing this talk, I went back to read this paper and it has, it's full of insights, um, some of which people haven't uh, paid any attention to, but they really should. It really helps think through aspects of this problem. Um, and, and then finally, in the spirit of soft filaments and flow, uh, it, it brings you to the kind of questions that come up in modern polymer science. And in modern polymer science, uh, when polymers are stretched by a flow, and Oliver mentioned this at the beginning of his flow, in the beginning of his talk, that uh, polymers can get highly stretched. And there's something called the coil stretch transition, which as far as I can tell was done independently, uh, effectively independently by Pierre Gilles de Gennes and John Hinch. Uh, I've referenced here the de Gennes paper, which is in uh, a proper chemistry journal. Uh, John's paper is first published in a conference uh, proceedings, and then he follows it up with a very nice paper in physics of fluids. And the uh, figures on this slide, I think, are I encourage anyone who's interested in the origin of this problem to go back and read. The Degen argument is 
a beautiful argument, um, some mathematics, a lot of physical insight. And John also gives a more dynamical systems picture to complement also the physical arguments. And if anyone wants to really learn about the subject, I highly recommend a talk online, which you can find by Eric Schockfey. I think there might even be a paper on the uh, coil stress transition after more than 30 years. It's a beautiful summary that really does justice to these two pioneering works, um, which remain very important if you're trying to understand the uh, science of polymers under weak and or strong flows. Okay, so my group uh, had the wonderful opportunity to interact with uh, Maria Akael Jezuska in uh, Warsaw. I think I saw Maria is online, so hello to Maria. And we were interested in what happens when you have a highly flexible uh, filament uh, in a shear flow and uh, account both for, uh, for, for bending uh, resistance. And our question was, uh, can the highly flexible object ever tie itself into a knot in, in a, a shear flow configuration. And uh, we studied aspects of this problem. We we eventually concluded that if you start uh, in an open configuration, it's very hard to get a knot, but you can see it's very easy to get uh, the filament winding within itself. On the other hand, if you start in a knot-like configuration, you can remain there for uh, long lengths of time. And uh, working with Maria, we've uh, written a couple, a, a number of papers uh, probing these features of highly deformable objects, uh, elastic fibers in, in shear flows. And really some of the very early ideas go back to John's uh, pioneering paper. Okay, so uh, again, in preparing this talk, I uh, ran across these beautiful pictures you have on your website. And I ran across this very nice image of Mahesh uh, Tiram Kudulu is also on the call, call and John Hinch, but there's a small world connection because uh, sitting right next to them is Akanksha Thawani who worked with Mahesh as an undergraduate. She uh, ended up coming to Princeton to work with me and uh, Sabina Petri, who's a world expert in molecular biology. Uh, uh, Akanksha was a chemical engineering student who arrived as a theorist, was retrained as an experimentalist and was the only engineering uh, person to be one of 12 uh, major awards in molecular biology the year she graduated. Okay, so that's um, a bit about a number of topics. I'm going to make one remark about viscoelastic flows. John is a world expert on these kind of problems. Evgeny Boyko uh, worked with me for a few years. I think he's on the call. And in, in trying to learn this uh, topic, it's one I had seen for several decades but never really understood, we struggled with how to think through uh, constitutive equations for low Reynolds number flows and, and what they had to say about experiments, because I was very interested in this interplay of experiment and simulation. <laughs> and we ran across this wonderful quote from 1992. It says uh, this, research in non-Newtonian fluid mechanics has been characterized by theoretical types, the left wing, who make predictions that cannot be observed and by the experimental types, the right wing, on the other hand, who make observations that no one can predict. Now, um, one can ask people in the audience whether they still agree with this, but the uh, it goes on to say, non-Newtonian fluid mechanics has been concerned with the development of general constitutive equations for materials, the so-called viscoelastic fluids. Unfortunately, this idealized program in rheology and non-Newtonian fluid mechanics has not been successful in defining a universally applicable constitutive equation. And Evgeny and I have been sort of obsessing with the idea of uh, how well these basic pictures, uh, basic constitutive law do in actually predicting experimental observations. But if you want to understand some of this and really get at the heart of what is going on, I can just simply recommend uh, two articles. One, and I think Oliver mentioned this at the start of the day, there's a, a beautiful paper in the late 80s from John Rollison and John Hinch on, do we understand the physics in the constitutive equation? Thinking about constitutive equations most relevant for uh, polymeric solutions. And a recent paper from John and Oliver uh, talking through the ideas that are known as the old Roy B uh, equation. And both of these, I think, are really good uh, introductions for anyone wanting to come to the field and 
just uh, not have to read a few hundred pages in a textbook, but read a sh relatively short article that tries to highlight important points. They've certainly been important to us. Um, okay, so I wanted to make that remark about this uh, link between math and physics, which is common to many of John's uh, papers. A great mathematician who is really focused on trying to draw the physics out of these problems. Okay, so with that, I'll turn to my last topic. I might be going a little too fast, but um, you guys can tell me. Um, we've been interested in a, for a while in what happens when particles move near walls which have patterns. This is joint work with my graduate student, Daniela Chase, and uh, Christina kurtz Thaler, who now is a, a group leader in uh, Dresden at a Max Planck Institute. So, I'm going to now show you some pictures you may have seen in the literature. Uh, they're classic pictures that think about mixing in microchannels from Abe Struck, Armand Ashdari, um, George Whitesides, and others on what happens when you have a pressure driven flow in a channel. The channel has in it corrugations on the boundary, and the corrugations induce a three dimensional flow in the fluid that helps you mix more effectively than you would otherwise have if you did not have the corrugations. Now, in this world of microfluidics, there are many other groups that have then recognized that the corrugations do things for you in the fluid uh, that you can take advantage of. So, for example, uh, shown on the bottom is if you have a corrugated microchannel with a pressure-driven flow along it and you put in any kind of particle, you tend to sort the particles. So the middle image on the bottom sorts small platelets from deformable uh, blood cells, either red blood cells or white blood cells. They sort of go different directions uh, relative to the mean flow direction when the corrugations are at an angle. And this is uh, reproduced in many different kinds of uh, uh, papers. And the arguments you tend to see for why this happens, a typical argument would be shown on the upper left. People say, well, there are these different forces. Uh, now, there are other more detailed uh, measurements here shown on the uh, upper left. The pressure driven flow is left to right. They track a, a particle in the flow and they observe that the particle is moving uh, in some cases primarily along a corrugation, then transverse to the corrugation, then along the corrugation, then transverse to the corrugation. And we have found this uh, obs observation in many papers. Um, I'll just show a few slides here. Although, as far as we can tell, there are no uh, explanations or calculations for uh, thinking about what is this trajectory. And so I've on the slide, I've just given you uh, two different references over uh, a time period in the last 10 years where these kinds of uh, unusual trajectories, if you like, zigzag trajectories are shown in these corrugated microchannels. So uh, my group got very interested in uh, what could we say about this? And we uh, worked on it first uh, experiment, first theoretically and then experimentally. And the idea was to uh, study the low Reynolds number flow problem uh, shown here on the right of a sphere uh, moving uh, adjacent to a surface and the background is colored black and white because it's uh, a rough surface. I should say at the outset that uh, many of you are probably experts on Brownian motion on in, in hydrodynamics problems. I uh, we were curious for a while whether if you put randomness on the wall and had hydrodynamic interactions, how does that randomness on the wall show up in the trajectory of the particle? I'm not going to talk about that today. It's something I'm still interested in, but I don't know really enough about the um, mathematics of randomness to to say anything probably too intelligent, although we learned something numerically. So we looked at flow near uh, rough surfaces. We used some uh, theoretical ideas built on uh, things you know about low Reynolds number hydrodynamics and the reciprocal theorem. And so our generic math problem was shown on the left. And we, uh, with Christina, worked out aspects of this problem for determining the translational and rotational velocities of any object if it experiences a force and hydrodynamic effects with the wall. And at the end of the day, we end up with a formula that says, if you tell us the shape of the wall, no matter what it looks like, 
there'll be a mapping, of course, of the force and torque to the velocities. And the shape function shows up in the mobility tensor. And we calculated the mobility tensor for uh, small amplitude shape distortions. And so we can then calculate analytically for any given uh, shape what the uh, trajectory of a particle is. Uh, we did this for arbitrary shaped surfaces. We compared with boundary integral calculations and showed that this asymptotic uh, perturbation method is very good. Uh, it fits all the details of the numerical calculation, and we can uh, use it for different amplitude and different wavelength uh, random surfaces and or pattern surfaces. So we then move to asking, uh, what could we say when you're a particle moving over a uh, uh, pattern surface like these corrugations. And then we also developed in a lubrication theory approach to tie the pressure field around the particle to the uh, position of the particle near a rough surface. I don't anticipate that anyone's going to uh, check the formula. If you notice a misprint, of course, please tell me. But this is just to say that we have a, a theoretical framework for studying the trajectory of a particle near a surface. And then we went about doing experiments. And we used roughly millimeter-sized particles sedimenting due to gravity near surfaces that have patterns on them. A typical experiment is shown in the middle. We're going to uh, have a sphere that sediments. Uh, if you look hard, and we'll see how this shows up in Cambridge, you will see that in the background, there's a black and white image. Those are the heights and valleys of the corrugations. The sphere as it uh, sediments uh, is uh, has a, a, center, a, a center of mass position that's slowly oscillating. Uh, the sphere, as you can see, is slowly drifting to the left. That's along the direction of the corrugation, but it gets there via this zigzag trajectory. Shown on the right is uh, the experimental uh, center of mass positions in the green dots. The black is the theory that we developed uh, that has in it only an input of uh, the shape function. And the, the scales in the horizontal and vertical on the right are uh, different. The, the trajectory that you're seeing is actually one for a 45 degree angle. And you'll notice if you look on the axes that they're uh, distorted. And here, lambda is simply the wavelength of the corrugation. And so we've done an enormous number of, well, Danielle Chase did an enormous number of experiments and Christina did a little a lot of calculations. And we were able to then study uh, different, different shapes of corrugations, whether they're rectangular step-like corrugations or sinusoidal corrugations, triangular and sawtooth corrugations. And we did them for uh, smooth surfaces, which even had finite patches and shown in the upper right is a uh, comparison again of a sinusoidal uh, corrugation, the data points in yellow and theory in black to show that we can capture uh, many of the features of this. And so in, uh, to kind of wrap up, I'll just say the big surprise came when we looked in detail at the uh, theory and then started to uh, use two cameras to get the total trajectory. And we realized that uh, all these images people had been taking where they'd only been looking down and describing zigzag trajectories. In fact, they're helical. There's a three-dimensional trajectory, which may not surprise you in hindsight, and that we can calculate uh, uh, really quite well the uh, three-dimensional trajectory, helical trajectory, uh, as shown on the upper right, where we compare uh, theory and experiment. And so we now feel we have a, a really quite good understanding of uh, these hydrodynamics, and we're now also looking at uh, two problems. One. Uh, a pressure-driven flow, where it's now effectively a, a shear flow near a corrugated surface, and also looking at how these surfaces uh, change the Taylor dispersion of solutes because they modify the um, effective interplay of diffusion and translation. Okay, so I think I'm about out of time, so I want to end with just a few remarks. First, happy birthday, John. Uh, for many in the audience who are experts, I think we know this, that low Reynolds number hydrodynamics broadly construed is this wonderful uh, playground and uh, entry place into the world of classical physics. One of the things, of course, you learn working with John is he's a great uh, person for knowing how to calculate, but there are many, many calculations in the literature. But John also emphasizes that 
understanding is important. And we know that in some of these problems, that's much more challenging. Now, of course, I should say that 34 years ago, I was sitting in the old damp uh, over tea time. I thought I had learned something. I tried to explain what I had learned about three or four uh, really detailed papers uh, to John. It, it took me a few minutes and writing lots of equations to say, look at all I've learned from these three or four papers. And uh, John gently said to me, uh, Howard, you just have to learn how to think. And then he explained everything in about 48 seconds and two or three equations. But it was a great experience. And um, uh, I'll always value tea time, as I'm sure many of us in the audience do. And with that, I'll just, uh, I'm not sure what happened to my slides. Uh, I'll just say uh, the last thing, John, thanks for emphasizing where possible. Uh, do algebra in place of PDEs if possible. Uh, think about the physics and the PDEs. And I think as several people already said, thanks for being a great mentor to many of us. And with that, I'll stop. So I'm done, Stephen. Thank you very much, Howard. Do we have any questions? Herbert? You could ask uh, how this could to see you on the screen. Pity you're not here, but there it is. You said earlier in uh, your talk uh, that you could divide uh, people who do experiments and those who do uh, theory. You're one of those who do both. Could you explain why you put one in the left wing and one in the right wing? No, no, no. I, 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 uh, Herbert, I didn't actually, I, since I can't see the audience, I wasn't sure who was there. there. Um, so oh, it's great to uh I'll see you Herbert though I don't quite see you but um I it wasn't my quote I was giving someone else's quote uh that uh those people divided the world into two pieces because in one part of non-Newtonian fluid mechanics and it might be a large part uh, it is not simple to make quantitative comparisons uh between experiments and theory or simulations in large part because the constitutive equations that are used are approximate. And it may be that even for relatively well-characterized materials that the constitutive equations are missing features needed for that quantitative comparison. So the that quote was simply one saying, there seem to be these two worlds and they don't talk to each other much. And in fact, I think it's fair to say that, and I would probably best do this offline, they're, they're, they're very uh, if, uh, common problems, I'll even say steady flow problems, where it is not easy to find in the literature a quantitative comparison for a complex fluid in uh, comparing simulation and experiment that's quantitative. And that's because of the challenge for the stress strain and stress rate of strain relation that's built in to constitutive equations that almost by nature are approximate. Well, how do I might say that's an interesting response, but it doesn't answer the question, which I asked, why do they get to be left wing and right wing? And you in America who ought to know about left wing and right wing presidents. Oh, no, no, I, oh, I see, you're, you're asking me to make a political statement, Herbert, but I don't want to make a political statement. I'm just saying this is their quote. This is their quote. And one can try and draw political analogs, if you like, and I prefer not to. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick. Okay, let us speak. Okay, all right. John, please. So you were quoting David Boga, who is Australian, point out. <laughs> the difference between the difference between the experiments and the theory was worse at one stage because doing the same tackling the same problem the um, uh, experiments differed because they had poorly characterized materials and it was only with the m1 round of a standardized materials the uh, how to characterize the material and different people, different labs getting the same experimental results started to happen. And also at the same time, there were some benchmark numerical problems. It was that different codes produced totally different answers. And it was only when we had the benchmark problems that we had to get the same answers to, we managed to get the codes to all get the same answers. 
So now we just can get reproducible experiments, reproducible numerics. They still don't agree with one another. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one of the things that John Rouse and I just discussed in, do we understand the physics? We understood a bit of it. Very good, very good. Jerome? Hi, Harry. Uh, Jerome Newcomb here. Um, you, you should be able to see Howard, the, the audience, if you want, on Zoom. So earlier you spoke about sorting between small particles and large particles. And I think the large ones were at least partly deformable through a microfluidic uh, device that had um, corrugations. And at the end, you showed these really nice helical patterns with the particle sedimenting down beside a, a, a corrugated wall. How does that helical pattern depend on the ratio between the particle size and the wavelength of the corrugation? Presumably there's some uh, length scale of corrugation at which the particle no longer feels the corrugation. Yes, yeah, so um, the challenge with trying to get a, give a clean answer to your question is in this problem, there are three length scales. So at least two dimensionless ratios. There's the particle size, the wavelength and the amplitude and the strength of the interaction is set then by the distance from the wall so that would give you four uh length scales so the detailed answer to your question requires a numerical calculation so in our paper we I identify sort of the optimal parameters to give you the biggest drift but it 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 depends on three dimensionless ratios and that that then gets tuned so I can't give you a clean answer, but I can say in our paper, we try to identify using simulations to sort through this three world of three dimensionless uh, ratios, an answer to your question. The wavelength certainly is key, as is the uh, amplitude of the perturbation. And, you know, you uh, because you're sedimenting, you interact with the, the corrugations for a finite time. I should say I spent a long time trying to use slender body theory in the sense of a long rod having a resistance two times um, its value in the perpendicular direction versus uh, tangential direction to try to come up with uh, simple arguments for this, and I never uh, succeeded. But I think at least one part of the answer to your question is a given in a graph in our paper where we try to summarize exactly um, what you just asked. Good. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear who asked the question because then I could send it to them after. But it was Jerome. It was Jerome Marshall. Oh, Jerome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask, you may be interested in the answer. Uh, how large are these uh, printed surfaces that you've made? So it's low Reynolds number hydrodynamics. So you can do kind of any scale you want so long as the Reynolds number's, Reynolds number's low. What we did was 3D print surfaces that were uh, effectively a few millimeters in wavelength, uh, a, a tenth of a millimeter, say hundreds of microns in uh, amplitude. And then we used millimeter size particles a little more dense than the fluid uh, for the sedimentation. So that was the scale, but you could do different scales, of course, as you know. Could you uh, do a hundred times that size? If you could get a fluid that was uh, sufficiently viscous that the Reynolds number remain low, then you'd be in a similar regime, but you'd also need a tank rather large to eliminate sidewalls. Well, well I have, what I have in mind is we've been doing some work on lava flows and comparing them with uh, previous uh, eruptions and would like to do some experiments to combine the left and the right wing. And oh. uh, so- No, I, no, no, but you're not, be, that, that's not quite fair. The left and right ring remark really is about the complex fluids world, but maybe that affects the, the fluids you have, Herbert. I don't well, know. Okay, but we want to get, and we talked about it just yesterday, as large as possible, some three D printed surfaces. So, um, if I if you send me an email, I might be able to at least tell you where to go. But you can get very large three D printed surfaces because people now three D print components for homes. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have that size printer in our lab, but. Um, such things exist, but labs are normally at the millimeter scale and smaller for 3D printing uh, fine scale structures because the 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 printing scale is normally uh, tens of microns. Thank you. Well, I'll send you an email and we'll suggest a Zoom meeting. 
Very good. I think we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Howard. It was very nice call. I think now we have to move on with Jean-Pierre Rilard. Yes. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jean-Pierre. Can you hear yeah, the screen, please? Right, so I try to share the screen. Okay, may, uh, that's a, a little uh, bit anticipated. <laughs> that's what you call a preview. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me to this celebration. I'm particularly happy since it uh, gives me the opportunity to thank uh, John to, for uh, all his patience of trying to of, and teaching some very important things about fluid mechanics to poor experimentalists like me. So that uh, must be that has been a great investment. I don't know if it was rewarding, but for us it has been extremely rewarding. Uh, the topic I'm going to speak about uh, today and typically a uh, problem in which uh, discussing with John would have been extremely helpful is uh, cooperation with colleagues from Argentina, particularly through Alejandro Garcia, who is doing this, his thesis between France and Argentina, with colleagues from France, and also with uh, Herman Drazer from Rutgers. Now, what are we studying? We are studying an oscillating suspension of non-Brownian particles in a confined geometry, uh, LHOCL. And typically, these are uh, concentrations between 20 and 30%. And it's a low Reynolds number uh, work, typically, uh, always Reynolds number below one. This is a typical setup. Uh, we have a glass uh, uh, LHO cell. Typically, the gap thickness is one millimeter. The width is 10 millimeter. Uh, we use a suspension of PMMA particles, 40 microns in diameter. And we use a fluid, which is both isoindex and isodense with the particles. The flow is uh, oscillating. It's, uh, the, we have a square wave variation of the flow rate with a period between two and 20 seconds. And uh, we, the setup is illuminated by a laser plane uh, perpendicular parallel to the gap thickness and perpendicular to the large side of the cell. And a small part of the spherical particles is uh, dyed with uh, rhodamine so as to be able to track them uh, after acquiring the image by a camera. Here's typically what we obtain the, the view is enlarged. And uh, we, uh, after tracking, we are able to monitor the motion of the particles. Uh, yellow is past locations and green is uh, future locations. And the, the important thing is that in the center of the, of the gap, the, the, at short times, the motion is practically parallel to the mean flow, while there are some, some more deviations when you get closer to the walls. Uh, yes. Here is what you get typically after particle tracking. These are trajectories. That's what, what you see. And uh, this confirms that uh, the largest side devi transverse deviations are uh, in between the center of the flow and um, the walls. Uh, and uh, in the center, the trajectories are completely reversible. Now, as I said, the, at early times, the mean, uh, the mean flow 
is exactly parallel to the walls. There is no mean transverse velocity. Here is a classical profile of the mean flow at different particle volume fractions. At low, uh, for 20%, we follow typically uh, Poisson velocity profile, whereas while there is a significant blunting when you reach 40% in volume fraction, uh, which implies and which exists afterwards that you have, we have a larger volume fraction of particles in the center of the flow. Uh, as I said, there is no mean transverse velocity at, uh, in this early phase but uh, there are fluctuations of the particle velocities. There are some instantaneous transverse velocity, and here are profiles of this, um, the, the root mean square of this transverse velocity, which is of course not equal to zero. And the interesting thing is that in the center part of the flow, you have a minimum, uh, which is quite uh, shallow, and while the maximum is uh, rather farther towards the walls. Uh, qualitatively, these results are in agreement with, for instance, uh, numerical simulation of EO and Maxe. I don't know of um, a lot of experimental work on, on these transverse uh, velocities. Uh, the other thing is that if you increase the volume fraction, the minimum in the center gets definitely shallower and occupies a larger fraction of the gap sickness. Now, last thing, and still at short times when we have a, a mean flow parallel to the walls, is that we have, a, a, by counting particles, we show that we have a higher volume fraction in the center part in the, of the gap and lower on the sides, which is also in agreement with previous uh, experimental and numerical work. So this is not, uh, as I say, there have been already publications uh, by other authors, but the, this proves that we have a reasonable suspension for and a reasonable particle tracking methods. The new things are more when we look at what happens at longer times. Uh, uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Alors, here is uh, the variation of the transverse velocity of a single particles. For other particles, it would be different, but the qualitative features would remain the same. At uh, up to uh, the vertical scale is uh, the transverse location across the gap distance from the, uh, the gap uh, middle plane, and uh, horizontal is the number of oscillation cycles. Initially, you have some drift of the location, but no, no very definite pattern. And uh, afterwards, at a certain point, you start to have uh, clear cut, very periodic oscillations. The red corresponds uh, to different, uh, red and blue correspond to different directions of the mean flow, and you see that uh, the change of direction of the particle motion, the transverse motion, occurs at the same time as the reversal of the mean flow. Now, more quantitatively, this is a spatial temporal diagram of the local root mean square uh, of the transverse velocity average over the center part of the gap thickness. The vertical scale corresponds to distance along the flow, parallel to the mean flow. Horizontal scale is the number of oscillation cycles. And up to, uh, again, about uh, 10, 9, 10 oscillation cycles, there is no very definite pattern of variation. And after, you start to have very, uh, very clear periodic structure, which is periodic both with time and periodic with distance parallel to the mean flow. The red 
parts correspond to, cert to a certain direction of the transverse velocity, the blue to the opposite direction. Or again, we see that changing the, flow the mean flow direction reverses the transverse velocity. And uh, the, the periodic flow pattern parallel to uh, the distance, parallel to the longitudinal distance, follows the oscillating motion of uh, the, fl the, uh, the fluid, that which accounts for this zigzag pattern. So, uh, zut. So, uh, in order to, to have a, a little uh, quantitative idea, we have plotted in this spatiotemporal diagram the root mean square transverse velocity. The low values are in blue, large values are in red. And in this, the vertical scale is distance across the gap thickness. Longitudinal scale is the number of oscillation cycles. What we see the most interesting feature is that uh, in the center part of the flow, uh, you have a very low transverse velocity up to, as could be seen in the profiles I showed before, up to the, the time at which the oscillations appear. And then, the transverse velocity increases. These are the periodic oscillations with which we have shown. And uh, this variation is localized in the center part of the gap center. And then you have a strong increase of the oscillations amplitude and of the RMS, RMS transverse velocity decreases slightly, increases again. Close to the walls, we have large values which are uh, due to the random motion, transverse motion of the particles, but they are not too much perturbed by the occurrence of the instability, the occurrence of the flow. Alors, the, the drawback to plot, like we did here, to plot the root mean square of the velocity is that you mix to sync, you meet the trans, random transverse oscillations, random transverse motions of the fluid, and you mix the well-organized periodic transverse motion, which is in the center of the gap. So to make some more quantitative evaluations, we have plotted instead of the, the root mean square transverse motion, we have plotted it's uh, the autocorrelation of the transverse velocity, the autocorrelation, the, the <clears throat> vertical scale is the difference in longitudinal distance, which appears, delta x, which appears in the definition transverse velocity. Again, the horizontal scale is the number of oscillation cycles. And we have a periodic. Uh, array of red and blue uh, bands, which uh, corresponds to the, uh, which reflects the special periodicity of uh, the tra transverse flow field. And uh, the distance to the first maximum corresponds to the wavelengths of this transverse structure. We also note that at short time was just white, which uh, corresponds to a zero autocorrelation, which corresponds to no, uh, no well-organized transverse motion. Now, what we have done is to, to, to characterize the magnitude of this organized transverse velocity by the first correlation peak, the one which is marked by the dark line. And we have plotted the, magne the, um, the amplitude of this autocorrelation peak as a function of time in the right graph. So here, that's something which I would like to get rid of. Also, it's very nice. And we have this variation of the autocorrelation peak 
we observe that we have a maximum uh, and we observe that the location of this maximum increases much when we increase the oscillation amplitude. Blue is a low oscillation amplitude, orange a high one. And uh, this proves that uh, the, you have a much longer development time at uh, even when you normalize by the, the period uh, at low amplitudes and at high one. So we've characterized, we can get rid of this, right? good. We characterize the growth rate of this instability by the, from the time we reach, we reach, is marked by the black dot at which we reach half of the maximum amplitude of the autocorrelation peak. And uh, we define the growth rate as the inverse, uh, from the inverse of T50 multiplied by the, the period. And here, as you Now, the second thing we've done with the same experiment, the same method, was to check the influence of the Reynolds number by comparing curves obtained with the Reynolds number of 0.4 and curves obtained with a much lower Reynolds number obtained with a more viscous fluid, 4 to the 10th phi, the minus 5. And in spite of these 10 to the 4, relation between the Reynolds number, the, the time for the appearance of the, uh, the periodic structure, the periodic transverse flow structure is the same. So it doesn't seem that inertia has any influence on this instability. Here is the variation of the dimensionless growth rate, which is characterized by the ratio period divided by T50, its variation with the oscillation amplitude, uh, horizontal scale, and uh, with the, uh, the volume fraction of particles. We, you have, we have a very linear, uh, rather linear variation of two uh, the dimensional ratio A0, A0 over H of the order of five. And we observe that we have a threshold for observing the instability, for observing the secondary flow of the order of, uh, for A0 over H of the order of one. And the second important thing is that the rate, of the growth rate, the and its slope of variation increase very much with the, uh, with phi, with the volume fraction. And in fact, we do not observe the secondary flow below about uh, 20%. Second thing, it, it's uh, the dimensionless influence of the dimensionless thickness. If we double the gap thickness from one to two, the slope of variation of the growth rate decreases by a factor of, by, of about four. Or this tends to suggest, it's a little daring, but it suggests that the growth rate would have a variation like uh, it would have a certain function of the volume fraction multiplied by one over h square, which we uh, made dimensionless by multiplying by d, multiplying by a zero over h corresponding to the linear variation with the amplitude of this growth rate. Alors, now the next question is what to do with that? Ah, mass. Ah, oui. Uh, what does it maybe correspond to? So we were very tempted to look at the variation, uh, to compare these results to the variation of the dimensionless characteristic time for the shear diffusion. And from uh, uh, classical work like uh, Nott and Brady and Leighton and Acrivos, it should have a very similar very similar variation with a function 24 G of phi 
for which these authors have given um, uh, theoretical, it's not theoretical because it's extracted from experiments, but uh, an analytical expression. And we observe that the function f, corresponding function f, which is uh, the, dark, uh, the dark points, which we extracted from our experiments, follows roughly the same trend as uh, predicted in the work of uh, Nutt and Brady. So this seems to suggest, and it still work on a progress, that is, there is a strong connection between shear induced migration and the development of this instability. Now, but, well, uh, uh, in the first part, we, we have checked the value that uh, this suspension, this system uh, had in the initial parallel flow regime characteristics similar to those uh, found in the literature. And uh, at longer times, we, uh, we found that we had no more a parallel flow, parallel mean flow, but a secondary uh, velocity, transverse velocity structure, periodic, both with time <laughs> and with distance along the flow. It's uh, uh, an appearance which uh, doesn't seem to be influenced by inertia. And uh, the important thing is that it has a roughly linear dependence on uh, the, the amplitude. And uh, it has a threshold both with the volume fraction and with the amplitude. And uh, it uh, increases very fast with the volume fraction. So here we are. And uh, something I must not forget is happy birthday, John. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. So do we have questions? Jean-Pierre, nice to yes. see you. Yes. Yes. Right, I move back to Zoom. Yeah. It, 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 it. You have some very impressive data of a totally unexplained phenomenon. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, with me, you are very well used to this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it, but, but I have no journey in at present. Right. It, it would be, I don't understand why the shear induced diffusion will cause the instability. Why well, I don't understand what causes the instability. But one thing I recall is Babette found that there were second normal stress differences in concentrated material. And I wonder whether that is capable of driving an instability. So I have no idea. I have just a remark, I remember something. No, that, that, that's, uh, we have looked at, uh, <coughs> of course, closely at Bebe as well. Now the question will be that um, we feel that it's important we believe that it's very important to have high concentration of particles in the center, yep. in the center part of the gap. And that would be the way in which, uh, <coughs> um, the way in which uh, uh, there would be an influence of shear induced diffusion to keep this, uh, uh, this concentration to a high value. Maybe. Thank you. The, the, there is a comment by Jeff Morris on the on the chat. Jeff, do you want to say something? Can you read that? Stephen? So he says migration is generally related to normal stresses. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. So those things are, are quite uh, <coughs> interrelated. <huh? coughs> All right. Okay. So, so my thought is, <coughs> it's the normal stresses that drive the instability. Mm -hmm. The normal stresses also do the shear induce <coughs> And so you've managed to get a good correlation with normal stresses rather than with shear induced diffusion. That's very possible. Probably we should look more closely at the, what, what is the, the exact variable. <coughs> 
no, we had we made the comparison because we had this uh, this nice paper from uh, papers from that body, uh, which made a, a quantitative prediction from the de dependence on the mean value fraction, which was quite precious. So the, that looked encouraging. But I agree that everything which is going to depend on the concentration may display very similar dependence on the mean value fraction. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. No more questions then? I think we should thank Jean-Pierre. <laughs> so I stop the sharing, here we are. And I think we close the session for the morning and I think we're going to have lunch now. And we come back to this room at 2 p.m. Rex? Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all for being here. Let's start with our first afternoon session uh, of this day. And I think uh, we have now Michael Lowenberg who will give talk. On pairwise hydrodynamics on permeable particles. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Keep an introduction. Um, thanks for organizing this this session. It's really lovely to be here, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, we're in the title of this talk, but um, actually, this is really a tour of my interactions with John over 40 years. Um, yeah, that's surprising. Um, I had a, I did a postdoc here in '94, but the beginning of my interactions with John were in my dissertation research. Okay. Um, <laughs> That's all I got. <laughs> Hi, Steve. Oh. Ah. Ah. There. I gave that away. That's the. Yeah. Ah. So, in my dissertation work, actually was inspired by a seminal paper of John's, um, written in the in the seventies, on an average uh, equation approach for particle for systems with dilute uh, particulate microstructure. At that time, uh, there was some uh, work that had been developed by his PhD advisor on sedimentation of particles. And the interest was in finding the average sedimentation rate and finding out what the long range hydrodynamic interactions, what effect it had. And it's difficult owing to the divergent integrals and Batchelor uh, developed a way of dealing with that through known average quantities, for example, that the average velocity in a sedimentation, in a suspension of sedimenting particles is zero. Um, and a problem that appears to be similar, the permeability problem, where you have a dilute array of particles that are fixed in space, and you're interested in the average particle acting on them. That's not accessible by volume averaging, and people dealt with that by some sort of ad hoc modification of equations, giving rise to the Brinkman equation, which has screening in it. Uh, and you can see from the series expansion, it's not something likely to be obtained by a expansion and volume fraction. Um, so what John was interested in doing is unifying, uh, developing a unified approach. And it really just went back to the fundamental idea that you want an average of the, of the microstructure. Um, you want an average of the microstructure, not a volume average of the suspension. And well, um, Andy Akrovos was over here in the late seventies working with John on slender drops. And I think they must've talked about this problem. Then Andy Akrovos went over to Caltech and worked with I uh, talked with my advisor, George Gavilis, and they thought it would be interesting for me to look at the problem of the flux into a medium containing, um, into an inert medium containing reactive sinks. 
Um, and the idea was Laplace's equation governs the um, distribution, steady state distribution of the reactant. But when you configurationally average the problem, you get an equation for the conditionally averaged field, which is um, has a sink term generated by the possibility that the field point is at the surface of one of the reactive particles. So this serves as a sink. One generates a hierarchy of coupled equations with one additional particle fixed at each level, and away you go. But to be able to deal with it, you truncate maybe based on the on the assumption of diluteness, and that, that allows you to cut off this system of uh, tr um, coupled equations and solve them in a reverse order. And in the reaction problem that I looked at, um, the governing equation then is a reaction diffusion equation. So it has screening in it, and that just appears naturally um, using this approach of John's. Um, I keep walking over here to my computer, but actually, I use that. Uh, so then I should back up and say, well, I was excited about this paper, and I wanted to, uh, and I realized I ought to figure out a way I could work with John. I actually came over here to visit it at some point and talk to him about some work I was doing, doing on thermal capillary motion. And he explained the scaling for a problem that uh, Bachelor had looked at on high conductivity, um, granular media with high conductivity particles. And I was impressed by the scaling argument that he could just explain to me quickly. And I thought, I've got to get over here uh, and work with John. Um, I applied for a NATO postdoctoral fellowship with John's help. His idea was that I could develop a numerical simulation to look at concentrated emulsion flows. That was a great problem. I, um, I really enjoyed my year here. I learned a lot. Um, and that's what you might have thought was the beginning of my interaction, but that was actually 10 years later or so. Uh, then um, the next summer, I came over and worked on another problem, which was really inspired by work he had done with the Koina uh, in his dissertation research in 96, uh, the, the paper that came out. And I'm going to talk about that paper. So that brings me to the third point in my interaction with John, which is my most recent work, um, is inspired by this paper that he wrote with, the, um, with Francisco de Koina on. Um, on the transport of particles resulting from it, pair interactions uh, of rough particles. And so I'm just going to tell you a bit about this paper. The context for it, it came out at a time uh, when people were finding funny things going on in concentrated suspensions, uh, measuring viscosity and correct viscometer, and finding that the measured viscosity varied over uh, several hours, uh, even the whole day. Um, and the idea was that maybe particles were being pushed out of this gap owing to some sort of uh, transport mechanism. And the argument was that even pair interactions might give rise to this. We know that pair interactions are, are reversible, but roughness might be enough to break that reversibility. Late and Ackerboys had come up with some scaling arguments, which ultimately led to the diffusive flux model describing the rheology of microstructure in suspension. And the crux of it is a, a particle flux that has a diffusive term and a drift velocity due to gradients of stress, these two coefficients measured empirically. Um, and the idea that particles have roughness is uh, supported by experiments that, that showed that particles, even just particles that buy, would, would um, have a roughness on them of up to a percent. And that was plenty to break the symmetry of the interaction. So this is kind of a cartoon of what it looks like. Um, John's idea was to model the hydrodynamic interaction of rough particles in the simplest possible way, that they behave like hard spheres, except for the fact that they can't actually come into contact. Only the roughness elements can make contact. That cuts off the, link, uh, the lubrication singularity, but otherwise they behave the same. But that's enough to break the symmetry of pair interactions. So I've got this cartoon here, the particles come in on these trajectory, they, they can come into contact because the hydrodynamic uh, resistance is cut off by roughness. They rotate, the particles don't experience any extensional, uh, any tensile force due to the roughness. And so this breaks the symmetry, compressive force here, nothing here, and the particles are displaced from their trajectories. Um, and so De Coyne and, and John, uh, Francisco and John, explored this problem uh, and showed 
showed that this in the, the trajectories of uh, symmetry of the chip trajectories are broken. Um, you know, roughness is reversible, but as the roughness is increased, this is roughness amplitude of the roughness normalized by the particle size. The um, displacement uh, increases approximately logarithmic with the amplitude of roughness. And then they also show that now in place of just a fit to, um, to experiments, they could find the coefficient for the diffusive flux. And it's shown here as a function of roughness and two different, I forgot to mention, two different um, models could be looked at for the friction, the solid friction between the two particles. If they have infinite friction, they, they move like a, a locked pair. If they have no friction between them, then it's only the lubrication resistance. And in fact, it makes very little difference, suggesting it's the lubrication resistance which dominates the solid friction anyway. So this work um, inspired my most recent work and so the last stop on this tour uh, of my interactions with John. Um, so this research motivated um, Rodrigo Bruce's uh, PhD research, which he looked at two problems, the interaction of permeable particles where the dimensionless permeability is small so that the particles behave also like rigid spheres. But when they come into close contact, the pressure in the region is enough to push fluid into the particles where the flow is governed by Darcy's law. We also went on and looked at particle distributions in flow, and in particular in Bozell flow, which has a particular wrinkle in it because the shear rate vanishes at the center. Um, so first I'll just explain something about what the permeability does um, when you have permeability of the particles. When particle, so this is a blow up of the near contact region. The near contact region has a geometric length scale, which follows the profile of the particle surfaces, the square root geometric mean of the particle size and the gap. So fluid can flow out of the region through the gap, but now these particles um, allow for some of the fluid to flow into the particles. So there's two different um, flows from the gap. Um, and there's a length scale associated with this uh, permeability effect. When the gap becomes smaller, less of the fluid can escape out of the gap and more of it goes into the particles. If you set these two volume fluxes equal, it gives you a way of coming up with the lateral length um, associated with this process of uh, fluid flowing into the particle. And it turns out to be this fractional power of the dimensionless permeability. With this length scale, we can then say something about the lubrication force acting on the particle. The length scale which dominates is the larger of the two. When the gap is large, these behave like impermeable particles. The dominant length scale is the geometric one. When the gap is small, the dominant length scale is associated with permeability. So put in the maximum of the two length scales here and you find that at large gaps, you have the usual singularity and at small gaps, the lubrication force is cut off. It no longer depends on gap and just depends on the permeability. So uh, Rodrigo developed a lubrication analysis of this problem. It gives rise to a Reynolds lubrication problem, which is an integral differential equation. You see the ratio of the two relevant length scales shows up as a parameter. The flux into the particles is given by this boundary integral that results from solving Laplace's equation inside of the particles and matching to the pressure that's in the gap. Um, we did the same thing for the transverse lubrication problem, similar looking equation. By solving both of these, one can find the resistance functions for the near contact motion. And they, this is uh, the axisymmetric ones and the transverse ones, both. Um, these functions here are the functions you'd have in the absence of permeability. So the impermeable functions, these two. And for axisymmetric motion, there's a multiplicative multiplier and here a subtractive and additive one. So just two scalar functions completely describes the 10 or so resistance functions that describe the two particles, the lubrication interactions between the two particles and they're graphed here at large gaps the function G disappears, you go back to the lubrication resistance for impermeable particles, this function goes to one. So you recover that 
at small gaps, these two functions have a behavior which gets rid of some of the lubrication behavior that you have with impermeable particles. And I'll more easily show that to you in the next slide. Um, so that now I'm showing it in terms of mobilities. The axisymmetric mobility now for per impermeable particles is non-singular, but we showed that by scaling. So this result that um, at contact, the um, axisymmetric mobilities are non-singular. But an interesting one too is that um, permeability provides access to rolling motions. So rolling without slipping is non-singular for a permeable particle. That's not true for impermeable particles. So these two problems are interesting um, for if you're thinking about filtration, but actually for the purposes of today's talk, where I'm gonna go on and talk about microstructure and suspension, it's interesting to see the equivalence of roughness and permeability. Uh, if you take two particles and push them together by a force, so I'm gonna just, I'm gonna define an equivalent uh, roughness in this way. Look at the contact time for two particles being pushed together by a constant force. And you can calculate this for permeable particles and you can compute it for rough particles. Both involve a constant, which has only to do with the hard sphere part of the trajectory and the initial conditions. And the part which has to do with the, um, well, this has to do with the lubrication behavior and this has to do with the cutoff of the lubrication behavior. Setting these two equal suggests that the equivalent um, permeability should be defined by this equation here, where C0 is a numerical coefficient. Well, it turns out that if you calculate collision rates uh, between particles in all sorts of flows, uh, this holds up um, for all of these cases. And in a way, you might expect it because as they come into near contact, they are kind of two particles being pushed together by a flow. But it also suggests that the tangential mobility isn't changing at all that much. So this is collision efficiencies and shear for permeable and rough particles, and they almost overlay for a range of size ratios. Um, and you see here that there's a critical uh, permeability below which you have no collision efficiency, just as with rough particles, if the roughness is, is too small in amplitude, you have zero collision efficiency. Um, and that also means, by the way, zero particle displacement um, in, in these flows. So now I'm gonna come back to particle transport. First, just uh, going back to the phenomenological models that exist, the diffusive flux model, um, which has this particle flux, has a diffusive term. Now I've split up the term that was due to gradients of shear stress into a term due to drift and a term due to gradients of the viscosity. So I'd like to look at dilute suspension. So these two are both sort of order of volume fraction squared. And this one is even weaker because you might expect that in a dilute system, the viscosity would be that of the solvent. Uh, and then these coefficients are determined from experiment. There's also um, the suspension balance model, which is a bit different, but I want to focus on this model because it's closest to the um, Boltzmann approach that I'm gonna describe for looking at particles, uh, of suspensions of rough particles and what John had developed with uh, De Coina in his dissertation research. So um, what, Francisco and John did is to develop, well, to use a Boltzmann formulation for it, whereby a collision integral de defines um, the particle displacements um, and the particle displacements and the particle flux due to their collisions, just based on pair collisions. And uh, by expanding it for, by expanding the number density, we could find the diffusive, the coefficient for the diffusive flux term. And so that's given then um, quantitatively, not by scaling arguments, and this is the formula they have. Um, we can similarly expand the shear rate in just the same approach. And it turns out that the coefficient for this term is given by the same integral they already found. It's just one half the value. So that's convenient. Um, I'd like to say something else. When you do this integration here, this is an integration that involves particle displacements, pair of particle displacements. You only need to go out to the collision cross section between the two particles. So the rough particles, if they're more offset than this dashed red line, they're not going to collide. And so you only need to integrate to there. But another piece of that is the maximum displacement of equal sized particles 
is a half of this um, half of this cross section. So, uh, given that these coefficients are in the ratio of one to two, setting the particle flux to zero to find the stationary distribution, you can immediately find that this is the stationary distribution. It turns out that this also holds in a polydisperse system. So they're completely decoupled. Um, but um, that's not going to be true where the she rate vanishes. So this is a simple solution. Um, now, if you look at Brazil flow, uh, so we were restricted in this way with the shear rate. It wasn't supposed to vanish. And if you look at a problem where the shear rate vanishes, you, um, you sure enough get a singular distribution. This applies as long as you're this far away from the center of the flow, that far away from where the shear rate vanishes. And the reason for that is you can't allow the shear rate to vanish inside of, inside of that expansion that I showed before. Um, so the diffusive flux model, the way it deals with it is by keeping the gradients of the viscosity. So I'm adding that back here, this term due to, the, due to gradients of viscosity. It requires a viscosity model. It requires one that diverges at some maximum packing PM. The result of that is a non-singular distribution where the concentration of the center is always going to be the maximum concentration of the particle, say 68% by volume or something, which might be questionable if this is, if it's a dilute enough suspension. Um, so the, and the behavior here is just, uh, turns out to be a cusp with an exponent of about one. These are all phenomenological coefficients, but it turns out to be one. And so the um, approximate solution for it is given right here. So another feature, besides this reaching the maximum packing, a funny feature about it is, this only has the scale of the channel width, no scale of the particle size. And so that, and that's at odds with experiments. People did experiments with different size particles and get different results. So um, what we did is to pursue the same approach that John did with Francisco. And now expanding the number density the same way, but keeping the full quadratic behavior of the velocity there. And if you do that, you get a particle flux that has the same two terms. And this is the shear rate here. So again, we're applying this uh, shear rate gradient. Um, so this is the shear rate, but the coefficients now aren't constant. That's the only change. The coefficients now depend on position. And here I show the profiles of those two, show the profiles of these two coefficients. So in the case where it's constant, the diffusive flux will just disappear at the center line. And um, the drift term will just have an abrupt, it will be constant, but just change sign across the center line. When you take into account the, the full scale of the, the full profile of the velocity, the diffusive flux goes to a constant at the center, and the drift velocity goes linearly to zero through the center. So when you look at the behavior of the near contact region now, um, it resolves the singularity. So this is the case where the transport coefficients are constant, what we already looked at. Um, you get this equation, um, and the particle distribution is, has the singularity. But now the diffusive flux doesn't disappear in this term. This doesn't disappear, and the drift velocity has the linear variation. Both are important for avoiding the singular behavior. And you get this quadratic disappearance. Some recent works have taken into account this, but left this to be a constant, and then you still get a cusp in this. So to get the scale of particle, to get the particle scale into the problem, both are needed. Um, and you can solve this problem. It's actually, it's a simple problem to solve. Uh, it has a separable form, a function of the channel width. This is normalized by the collision cross-section and a universal function of position, again, normalized by this collision cross-section. So this function n is just an integral of those position-dependent coefficients that we compute from trajectories and um, makes the blue curve shown here. So this should depend only on roughness or equivalent roughness. But what turns out is over quite a range of roughness, it makes a hardly visible difference. So it's insensitive to it. And then beyond one half of a collision cross-section, you're out to the outer solution where constant coefficients describe the behavior. 
So I would call this a boundary layer, mm -hmm. except it's almost more of a patching because it agrees exactly with the outer solution there. And the reason it's this abrupt patch is because of the interactions in the model that outside of a collision cross section, they, they're all together zero. Uh, so, so that's uh, the solution for the problem. And here's just a couple of curves showing the result. You know, I'm just comparing with the diffusive flux model again. And this is for two different channel widths or alternatively for two different particle sizes, the red and blue curves. The blue curves are for larger particles, the red ones for smaller. Yeah. The diffusive flux model doesn't distinguish between the two. Um, now, here's some comparison of experiments. And I wouldn't say it's perfect, but um, <laughs> some sort of qualitative you know, agreement. These um, earlier experiments and mono dispersed suspensions and more recent ones uh, in a binary suspension. So we also looked at polydispersed suspension. And it turns out that um, to a very good approximation, a superposition works that you can just add up the distribution for the particles. So this is just the larger particles. Um, in these experiments. The smaller particles actually didn't have enough time to get distributed. Um, I think that's all I've got for you, except I'd like to thank a lot of people. I'd like to thank the organizers of the meeting, Stephen and Yuri, for making this happen. This is really a wonderful event. I'm so glad to be here and glad to participate in it. I want to thank uh, Rodrigo Rabusis, who is now a uh, postdoc with Petya Blahovska and Michael Nixis at uh, Northwestern, and he's working on vesicles, on, on, on vesicle shapes. I'd like to thank funding from CAPES, uh, the Brazilian organization that supported uh, Rodrigo, and uh, a grant from the National Science Foundation. And a huge thanks to John for um, helping me at so many stages of my career in my PhD research, but in my postdoc research, I really wanted to say, I think that's how I got my academic job and um, how I got started in this business. So really grateful. And, and your research continues to inspire research that I do now. And I can see from the people here that that's, that's true. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Well, do we have questions? <laughs> okay, so so the lot of detail that I not um, you're saying that on the center line where the shear rate vanishes. If you put a little bit of the quadrat, you put the quadratic variation of velocity in, then and then do the appropriate integrals. Yeah. All these singular similarities that some of the models that they they go away. Correct. So, at what length scale does the quadratic become detectable from the linear shear rate at the particle size? At the particle size, it's the collision cross section which scales with the particle size. That sounds good. Do we have more questions? Yeah, what else? Just on that thing. So what you do on the on the top is uh, sort of non-local development. Uh, just doing the collision integral to include properly the velocity you um you have an absolute velocity difference between the particles. And what begins to happen is that particles on the other side begin to affect it. It's the same thing that's done with the um, stress balance model. They, they use a non-local shear rate. So that's a phenomenological approach that gives the same thing. But so in this dilute system, you get it exactly. Okay, do we get questions? From? There's no, nothing online. Nothing online? Okay, so I think we should thank Michael again. Thank you. And I think we have now Rob Davies from Colorado.
Stephen, can you put Rob's presentation up? He's going to do it from here. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Well, I, I guess I can speak without having a PowerPoint. <laughs> at, least, at, least I'll, at least I'll start. In, in, in fact, I'm sure, John, when you started, PowerPoint didn't exist. So, yeah. First bank, the best tool was when he took the first bones of it, and he had to make it up. And just talk. Yeah. I'm, yeah I'm so, sure. can I just explain what's happened? <laughs> I was nowhere near over there. It yes. Not my fault. So it's Michael's it's, laptop fault. I, I, is that the console has decided to puke? Yeah. Okay. Um, and we're a bit worried about speed of regurgitation um, it, because it's not fast because we had this last time. And um, so we've got to re we've got to wait for the console to reboot before. Yeah. Um, 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 wait a second. Projectors up. up, but not the. Uh... And we need to press a button here. <laughs> well, I could still talk. No, wait, 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 wait a second. But, but maybe we want to wait. Can, because can I just ask somebody, somebody online? Can you see um, Rob's slides? Yes, we can see it. Okay. okay. Does anybody know how I get uh, uh, on a PowerPoint, how I get rid of the slides on the left hand side? There's a magic combination. Yeah, just slide. Presentation mode there. Which one? I think the, the, the last one there. Try that. No. So the first one on the, the first one. Normal. Yeah. <gasps> I'm not a Windows user. No. Oh, that looks like a little. Screen. Is there any, anybody under age sixty in the room? <laughs> Just that one. That, that one. And Windows user. So yeah. Fine. Right. So I think we have the system back, Stephen. And I'll give you a PC here. There you go. Okay. So everybody's talked a little bit in the second slide. I'm going to introduce the subject first, although they kind of tie together. And the subject has to do with so either a particle colliding with a wet solid surface or with other particles that are wet. And so of this problem. Um, do I have fiber capability? Uh, not there. 
No, no, no. Stephen, did you give in? No, I, I can't move anything. <laughs> All right. Stephen, so, so click on the click on the click on the presentation. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. So, so this is the um, original paper that came out. Um, in JFM and uh, came out a few years after the postdoc. And we coined the word elastohydrodynamic because these collisions had an elastic component where the solids would deform and then perhaps release. And then there was a hydrodynamic component of the viscous fluid in between the particle and the surface it was colliding with. And the pressure could build up in that viscous fluid and cause the elastic deformation and potential rebound. Next slide, or am I doing it? Okay, and so a little bit about the governing equations. Uh, I think we've already seen this one. This is the Reynolds lubrication equation that relates how fast the surfaces are coming together with, with how fast the fluid is being squeezed out. So surfaces coming together, fluid being squeezed out is solely a mass balance. And it doesn't have to be a constant rate at which it's coming together. The uh, surfaces can deform so that the relative velocity is different in different locations. Just a second, Thank please, Rob. The Zoom is not behaving. Yeah, it's because we shouldn't have done it this way. There. Yeah, yeah but it's Where's not, it? it's... Yeah, that's good, now to be... Sorry about that, Rob. No worries. What do you want me to do with this? You, you, um, whoops. whoops, your favorite word. Let's make that. No, it's up here. Um, it is, it is, it is. It was not, but now I think it is. If you click the square one, it will just fit to the window. Right? See this, the, the middle yeah. one. Yeah, the square one. Yeah, but I can't get rid of it. And, and now now slideshow. Yeah. Beginning. From current. Oh, from yeah. current. Better. Well, except for the current in, in the, the previous one. <laughs> one more. Yeah, but my now my screen sharing's um paused. It's, it's paused. Ah, uh, yeah, it's not working. Sorry about that. I think I think you should share the whole screen. Uh, <laughs> it's PowerPoint, yeah. It's having no screen one, screen one. Go for screen one, it's, it's and now share. <laughs> okay, it's there. Now, if we go, it's, it's, it's go back one more. That one, from oh, May, one more. Okay, so that's where that, you were. That's where you were. Yeah. Okay. So this should work now. Okay, which. I think, yeah, that way. Right one? Yeah, right one. Okay, so the the, the top relates to the pressure in the fluid gap that's squeezing the fluid out um, to how fast the, the two surfaces are coming together. Um, the deformation is just the gap minus, if it was still spherical, which is approximated by a paraboloid in the region of near contact. And then that's equal to um, a Hertzian contact deformation which is a boundary integral of the pressure times a kernel over the area. And the theta here is an inverse uh, Young's modulus. So it's a stiff uh, inverse of the stiffness of the material. And K here, and so P is this uh, uh, kernel and it's proportional to the elliptic integral of the first time. Okay, and so you can get the deformation at any location based on the load of pressure uh, at all locations. And so these two equations are coupled. They both have the gap and they both have the pressure in them. And one of them is a differential equation and one of them is an integral equation, but they're not too difficult to solve numerically. And then you would also solve them with the kinematics of the motion of the sphere towards the other sphere or towards the surface, where this is the velocity of the center of the sphere, x is the un undeformed distance, and then this is the force is just the integral of the pressure over the surface that's resisting the motion. So this is a viscous resistance. Okay. All right. So here, this is a result from that original paper 
Uh, the printing is a little bit small, but this is the rebound velocity divided by the initial velocity as a function of the Stokes number. And the Stokes number is like a Reynolds number. It's the ratio of uh, inertia to viscous forces. But in this case, it's the particle inertia um, based on the mass of the particle um, here, and uh, rather than the fluid inertia. The, the Reynolds number is small in the gap because the gap's really thin, but the Stokes number is not small because the particle is big. Okay. And so, and then epsilon, which is probably a poor choice, but it actually is a small number. So this was not a perturbation analysis, but it's a elasticity parameter that to measure the inverse stiffness. So epsilon is really small if you have a very stiff sphere. Okay. And, and what you see, the key result is, is that there's no rebound below a critical Stokes number because the initial kinetic energy is all dissipated into viscous dissipation. But the Stokes number is large enough. Uh, it penetrates so fast and gets so close that the pressure builds up really high and elastic deformation occurs. And then the particle is able to rebound above a critical value that depends weakly on the elasticity parameter. Okay, so that's the key result. Now, go forward almost 40 years. I picked this problem up again, but more, a little bit more from the granular flow perspective. We're interested in lots of wet particles. For me, lots right now means three, but uh, <laughs> hopefully it's more than three in a few years. Um, and they're covered with a thin layer of viscous fluid and they're colliding with each other. Um, and so it's an event driven process. And then the question is, is, do they stick together? Do they bounce apart? If they do bounce apart, do all three of them come apart or do two come apart, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. And then they're just governed by Newton's laws of motion. Mass times acceleration equals the sum of the forces. The forces could be gravity. They could be lubrication forces, which is the primary thing I'm looking at. If the particles are small enough, they could be capillary forces, which were mentioned in a previous talk. And then if they penetrate through the liquid layer and come into contact, uh, maybe on the roughness elements like Michael talked about, then there'll be solid solid contact forces and potentially friction as well. Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about the lubrication forces. So two, two spheres or a sphere in a solid surface, you just use the reduced radius and so you can be quite general. Um, they have a small gap H between them. Their initial gap is H naught when their liquid layers first begin to overlap. And so this is not a fully immersed situation where particles are surrounded by liquid. They just have a thin layer on their surfaces, okay? And they have a normal relative velocity and a tangential relative velocity as well. The, Reynolds, the normal Reynolds lubrication equation is modified when there's a gap of finite thickness. But when H is really small, it just becomes the Reynolds lubrication that becomes in inversely proportional to the gap that we've seen before. And then there's a sliding lubrication, which has a logarithmic singularity, a much weaker singularity but there's not a plus constant term because it's not surrounded by fluid like in the O'Neill solution, okay? And then there's also a capillary suction, which surprisingly doesn't depend on the gap. Smaller gap, uh, higher curvatures, higher capillary forces, but smaller contact area and the area ends up canceling out, okay? And you put those in the Newton's laws of motion, and make those uh, dimensionless. And this is just for two spheres. We'll talk about three spheres in a moment, but you get essentially a mass times acceleration. And then you get the lubrication force I just talked about, the capillary force that has a, a weak, that's fairly weak if the capillary number is large for very, very viscous fluids. And then there's a centrifugal force because we now put the equations not in X and Y coordinates, but in R and theta coordinates. So we have a rotating coordinate system where one of the axes is along the line of center and one is normal. And so you get a centrifugal force. This is along the line of center. This is tangential motion, normal line of center, which makes the line of center rotate. And so this is that term there. And then this is the equation that just tells you the, the moment of inertia times the time rate of change of rotational velocity. Each sphere is equal to the sum of the torques. And that's this equation here. So we have these three equations 
plus the two kinematic equations. So five equations govern the process. Two dimensionless parameters, Stokes number, inertia over lubrication, capillary number, which is lubrication over capillary forces, and then geometric parameters like film thicknesses. Oh, and then one really important thing is when they get close enough, uh, we consider them to have come into contact. And again, that could be on roughness elements, or it could be if they get really close and that elastic elastohydrodynamic deformation makes them deform and rebound. And so we have a rebound criterion uh, that we put in place. And that can, in the, in the models I'll show you today, that'll be a hard sphere criterion. That is, they reach a minimum thickness and then they suddenly rebound, but it could be a soft sphere collision as well. So here are some experiments from our lab from about 10 years ago. These were done on pendulum, so solid metal balls on pendulum strings. Uh, here's a contact that has a high Stokes number. They come into contact here and then they bounce apart almost immediately. They penetrate that thin liquid layer really fast and then bounce. Here's an intermediate Stokes number, or you know, this one's actually a small Stokes number where they come into contact. The viscous forces dominate until so they stick together. They don't have enough kinetic energy to bounce apart and they just rotate as a doublet. And then here's a very interesting intermediate situation where they come in contact, they stick together, they rotate as a doublet, but very gradually the centrifugal forces pull them apart. What we call stick rotate separate. That's all experimental. This is experimental as well. Don't quite know how to. Okay. okay that, was a, that was a rapid bounce case. Um, this one's going to be a stick rotate separate case. They're going to stick just for a short while and then separate. Oops. That's that one. And there's that one. Okay. So those are the three different cases. Um, this is on an air table. The reason we decided to do an air table was to get rid of those pendulum strings because you can't rotate two spheres together very far before their strings cross. Okay. Plus they also swing up and they start having a gravitational component and we wanted to avoid both of those. I hope we can see this when we get it. All right. I will skip ahead pretty fast, but these are some um, models of the separation versus time. High Stokes number, very, very rapid bounce. Um, intermediate Stokes numbers, you get stick together, rotate, and then separate, and separate up here. And these very slowly separate with low Stokes numbers because we set the capillary forces to zero. If the capillary forces are not zero, at low enough Stokes number, they'll eventually stay agglomerated because of capillary forces. So comparison of theory and experiment. This one, first of all, is head on. Okay. And so no bounce and low Stokes number, a bounce uh, and high and increasing coefficient of restitution as the Stokes number increases. So viscous dissipation becomes less important. Um, the critical Stokes number in this case was a fitted value because we used a hard sphere collision and we didn't know what links. We knew a scale, but not an exact number for what gap they bounce. And these are two different viscosities and two different metal metallic materials. Okay. And then these are oblique collisions, which work sort of okay. Um, three different areas, high Stokes number, rapid bounce. Uh, low Stokes number agglomeration. And then there's an intermediate case where you can get the stick together, rotate and separate. This is essentially a phase diagram. Pretty good agreement, but uh, some of these cases here are in the wrong quadrant. So the agreement's not perfect, which will be part of our future work, bringing the left and right together. <laughs> um, I button squid work. Can you advance? <clears throat> okay, now three shares, and we're going to start with them along the line of centers. Um, fairly low Stokes number. This, this sphere is impacting this one. 
and these two are already starting together and they all just stick together. So what we call full agglomeration. Very high Stokes number. This one impacts this one and bounces back. This one pushes that one and it bounces away and they all three spheres separate. Um, here we get, I think uh, we've seen a picture today of Newton's cradle. I forgot who showed that, but somebody did. Um, where these two spheres are touching to start with. This one comes in and hits, and these are mislabeled. This is what we call reverse Newton's cradle. So sorry about that. Where the, no, this is correct. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah, yeah the, the first two stick together, the last one goes away. Okay. And then this one is actually reverse Newton's cradle, where this one hit this one. These two stuck together as a pair, agglomerated, and this one bounced back. It didn't actually go backwards, it just went slower than the other two, and so they separated. Okay. And we've been able to predict that. The agreement's good, but not perfect, where these are the coefficients of restitution of the two pairs, which in turn will tell you whether you have agglomeration, separation, reverse Newton's cradle. This particular set of parameters didn't have the Newton's cradle outcome. And pretty good agreement between theory and experiment. Okay. And then we've just started simulations of three spheres that are oblique, but like colliding in a plane. <clears throat> so this is a fairly low Stokes number of two. This one's colliding with that one. These two are stationary to start with. And the three of them agglomerate and rotate together. An intermediate Stokes number, same initial conditions, but this one now has a faster velocity. And we get um, reverse Newton's cradle. It pushes the other two away. And it itself, the colliding sphere bounces off. And then this is yet a higher Stokes number and all three spheres eventually separate, okay? All right, and then future work, we'll put these rules uh, for collision into a discrete element method. Instead of using some existing codes that work all in Cartesian coordinates, we're going to create our own code that has a rotating cylindrical or polar coordinate system for each pair, and then keep track of where all the pairs are relative to each other. And um, this technique works even if a sphere is touching more than one sphere, so that it, it has multiple coordinate systems associated with it. And then we are going to do further experiments with the air table or collisions of three, or maybe even we'll be bold enough to do four spheres maybe, and uh, see how well the theory predicts uh, the outcomes. And so I wanted to thank John for helping me get started. He really, <clears throat> you know, like I said, the inspiration came from the talk we heard on sandblasting old buildings, but John was the one who showed me for the first time kind of what a boundary integral is all about and how to think about the deformation of a of a surface in terms of a, a distribution of load or pressure on that surface, which has applied not only to this problem, but to deformable drops like Michael talk, talked about and has been really valuable in my career. So John, thank you and best wishes. Thank you, Robert. Do we have questions? Michael, please. Yes, um, um, that's a lot of stuff we put in the, in the puzzle that really worked in it. I'm wondering if this is a vacation description of the case that did on the reading order of calculation. And would there be interest in treating the treating it as being immersed in a low viscosity fluid? A way to do that. Yeah, so, so first of all, um, the initial work we did had the particles immersed rather than in a thin film. The more recent work is done with a thin film. But it assumes that they're already close enough that the Reynolds number based on the gap is small. And so for a low viscosity fluid, you'd have to be very, very close. Okay. <clears throat> but what happens, Michael, is if you have high inertia and low viscosity, the, the uh, particle is going to penetrate to very close contact very rapidly without slowing down. And so you, you can use as an initial condition the far field initial velocity and then use some small initial separation 
and be okay. All right. All right. Yeah, on, you know, the initial velocity, which maybe we want to solve a problem of ignoring the representation of which they make velocity. Pretty much. Yeah. So you can use the initial velocity, the jet velocity of the sand, sand blaster. Any further questions, Ian? No, not really a question. I'm curious in your air table, when the your particles came out, it almost looked like they were erasing the lines that you had on the air table. Or is that, is that? Yeah, so so we, we, we bought a cheap off the shelf or actually off the boat uh, air table that's made for a high school physics course. And the, the, the uh, paint for the lines was uh, easily came off with a little bit of friction. So so we had used it enough times that it, it oh, worn out. It wasn't a deliberate um, experimental technique to see where they were. No. Oh, okay. No, they they that's <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just like your road. The, the, the stripes that you you know eventually wear off because people drive on them. Yeah. Jerome speaking of your uh, air table experiments, which are really quite nice. How, how do you measure or control the thickness of the film on the outside of your cylinders? Oh, yeah. So, so first of all, those, those are spheres. And the spheres are mounted on the pucks that come with the air table. And we had to use a shock back that was strong enough to elevate the higher weight. And, and uh, we just take the sphere on the puck, dip it in the viscous oil, pull it out, drain it. And then it, the thickness is a function of time, how long you allow it to drain. So, so we were allowed to drain to the point we wanted, turn it back over, and then do the experiment. John? <laughs> so another question I have, there's a comment, a story about Newton's cradle. So um, one story I won't tell you how I got involved with it, but as you know, there are five spheres, and typically you'll talk to you, pull one sideways, it impacts, and one flies off at the end. Right. And careful examination of the uh, for the dry interaction hertz in contact, you find that the one that comes in really sort of feels an elastic body, and so it bounces back. And then it bounces back at quite a serious velocity, and you're suddenly worried about. Well, I'm going to have to send quite a bit to the pull forward on to conserve momentum, and then how am I going to conserve energy with all this? And they, it all works. So I with with um, saying John, we, we we solved this problem, and it was Christmas time, and uh, my father-in-law asked one of those embarrassing questions, "Young man, what are you doing these days?" I thought, "Ah, Newton's cradle. I can explain this." Did, but in very simple terms, and he said, "Did you know what happens if you take two spheres and swing them in?" Not done that problem, <laughs> <laughs> which I did after. Two go away, right? Yeah, two go away. If you take three in, three go away. But then it's complicated because they actually there's a bit of bounce back. Yeah. Finite time duration of contact. Yes. Yes. I'm a little bit aware of that. My colleague Christina Renya did some work on dry case as well. Very good. Do we have questions online? We don't. Okay. All right. So I think we don't hear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mark. Okay, so our next speaker is Constructor Bill. Thank you, Constructor Kelly. Thank you to the organizers of this meeting that allowed me to tell a few words on the open stone out of my suite, out of my research. And more generally, in the research in France, as I did in Europe, 
and destroying mining land. I will briefly discuss three problems. So, three problems I work with John, uh, which have a common thread, which is to understand physical mechanisms. So, what do we mean when we say we search for physical mechanisms? Um, we know since Galileo the extraordinary power of mathematics to provide a unified view of physical phenomena and make precise predictions. However, uh, mathematical symbols are not sufficient. We need words. Every scientific article or talk or book involves many, many words. And words uh, allow to ask questions. They allow the mathematical answer to be related to what we knew previously. And they allow to think simply. And as declares the splendid title of the last book of Jones, think before you compute. <laughs> Moreover, words allow the opening to new questions. And uh, as the, the French poet uh, René Char says, ne t'attarde pas à l'ornière des résultats, which may be translated as approximately as do not dwell in the rut of results. You understand? Indeed, the most desirable effect of a result is the displacement of the question and the renewal of the question. So what we call uh, searching for a physical mechanism is precisely bringing a mathematical results back in the realm of words, in the more qualitative and general world of words. And the great advantage of this search, as I learned with John, is that it may light up neighboring problems and make them clearer. However, we must be careful with the use of too many words. Too many words may dilute or weaken their object. And John likes, we know that John likes short explanations, short papers, short books. Not that short explanations generally require more work for the writer or the speaker. And they are also more demanding for the reader or the student who has to be more active and to find his own way. So after this short preliminary, I turn to the, my project, my talk. So three problems. The first one is the viscous instability of a shared interface. So the, we have two, uh, two fluids, um, one above the other with a plane interface and different viscosities. And the, the, the fluid is, is the, the fluids are made in motion by the motion of the upper plate, which is a quite flow or a quasi flow with a pressure gradient. So the, the bounded flow problem, that is for long waves, has been solved by uh, Lee, the CSC in 1967, and we showed that um, the interface may be stable or unstable, depending on the value of, of the numerous coefficients, the dimensionless uh, parameters. And the short wave problems has been solved uh, after, a little after by Upper and Boyd. And they show that without such extensions, short waves are always unstable. So this is the mathematical result. Why? And here, uh, John uh, wrote a, a paper a year after Upper and Boyd, uh, a very short paper, three pages, and uh, a note on the mechanism of the instability at the interface between two shearing fruits. And this paper was very inspiring for me. So uh, the first picture, the first figure of John's paper uh, is this one, and it shows that um, at the deformed interface, longitudinal velocities must match. So disturbances are created, velocity disturbances and associated vorticity disturbances. And um, the, the disturbances are larger in the less viscous fluid, which is below. And uh, so at the dominant order, the leading order, the vorticity disturbances are in phase with the deformation of the interface. Note that uh, an important thing is that vorticity disturbances are stronger in the less viscous fluid. Now, if uh, we consider uh, advection, inertia effects uh, by the base flow, uh, advection creates small out of phase corrections. 
So in the in the upper fluid, in the more viscous upper fluid, advection uh, drives the, the, the vorticity disturbances out of phase. And you can see that the velocity field associated with uh, this out of phase vortex field is stabilizing, creates a flow which uh, decreases the, uh, the amplitude of the disturbance. On the contrary, in the lower, uh, less viscous fluid, uh, the same uh, advection creates a destabilizing flow. And the net effect is uh, the instability since uh, uh, it's the destabilizing effect in the lower, more, uh, less viscous fluid is stronger than, than the other, in the other fluid. Hence the instability. So, so uh, this is the, the short paper of John. And uh, from this paper, I tried to, to understand uh, the opposite problem of long waves. For, for long waves, the problem is studied first by, by me. Um, so uh, if we plot the, the growth rate versus the uh, wave number, so the, this, the problem may be solved by uh, solving the, the ozone buffer equations, of course. It, it appears that the short waves are always unstable, positive growth rate, but long waves may be either unstable or stable according to the, to the viscosity ratio. If the thin, thin layer adjacent to the wall is more viscous, long waves are unstable. And if it is less viscous, uh, long waves are, are stable. And it's as important uh, um, in industrial uh, you know, applications, uh, for, in particular for lubricating uh, um, the, the, the transport of oil in long in pipes. Uh, uh, we, we inject water in, in, the, in, the, in the crude oil and water migrates to the wall and lubricates the, the transport. So uh, the interface is stable when the thin layer is less viscous. Why? So if we uh, adopt uh, uh, the same uh, ideas as, as John, continuity of tangential velocity drives the limiting order disturbances as, uh, as progressive. And this leading order disturbances create the wave velocity. Indeed, if you consider a small drawing here, uh, the, the disturbances uh, are, are, are as, uh, as it is here. And it, it's clear that uh, the, the outer flow must drive the interface so that it reduce the volume here, hence the, the velocity to the left. Now, if we consider uh, the, the inertial correction, in first consider the, the, the case where the thick layer is less viscous. The inertial correction driven by advection creates uh, a stable, uh, unstable, unstable, unstable flow as previously and creates an interfacial shear stress here, two y two in the upper fluid. Now in the thin layer, Advection is completely negligible. So the stabilizing effect is, is uh, negligible and the inertial correction is driven by, by the shear stress to Y2. And uh, mass conservation is the, the growth rate. So we, we confirm that uh, the, the, the flow is unstable when the thick layer is less viscous. Now, if the thick layer is more viscous, then the effect of the advection in the thick layer is stabilizing as previously, and as the destabilizing effect in the, in the lower layer, in the thin layer is negligible, the, 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 stable, um, the stable effect dominates, so, that's, uh, the, the, so that the thin layer effect, which is that the, the, the mesh viscous thin layer uh, is, uh, corresponds to a stable. Uh, now we could ex expand the, the analysis to the case of an unbounded upper flow when, um, due to the finite penetration of depth of vortex disturbances, the exponent in the in the growth rate for the for, this, for the long wave parameter is different, but uh, this is not very important for what I want to say here. Ah. Ah. Now I, I go to the second point, uh, second topic, which is viscous bedrock transport. And 
so um, the question is when the viscous liquid flows over a granular uh, layer, uh, only the, the, the surface layer moves at the, uh, the close to the close to the fluid, and the bulk of the of the particles do not move. So only a thin layer moves. And the question is, what is the motion in this very thin layer? And to to study this, uh, we we perform an experiment. A student, a PhD student uh, in Toulouse, performed an experiment in a, an annular uh, channel, annular quick flow, and a uh, laser sheet who uh, was illuminating uh, the, the flow. And we, we matched the refraction index of the, of the fluid and the particles. So the fluids are invisible, we can see inside. And we dyed a few particles so that uh, the laser sheet. Illuminates the dyed only the dyed particles, and we obtain uh, uh, some pictures uh, like this. So we can film, make a video of the of the motion of the particles. We see here we here see here the, the the particles in the moving layer, and from this uh, video we can uh, obtain the velocity profile of the fluid by PIV. And the velocity profile of the particles using PT, particle tracking velocity. And we obtain, uh, we obtain uh, this, uh, these uh, profiles. So when uh, each plot corresponds to a different Shields number parameter, which is the bench shear stress normalized by the apparent weight of the particle. So here is. Uh, small shear stress, high shear stress. And when the shear stress is small, we see that the, the, the fluid velocity is equal, nearly equal to the uh, velocity of the particles. There is no lag of the particles. And when the velocity uh, increases, when the shear stress increases, at some point, we see that the particles lag behind the, the fluid, which is an inertia effect. So, uh, can we understand, uh, in particular, this uh, velocity profile at small uh, at small shields number? So to do that, we, we tried uh, some existing models, in particular the models of Bagnold and the model of, of the viscous uh, research mentioned by uh, Rayton and Akhilos. And in fact, we it appeared that these models fail. And uh, the reason that this model fails. Um, maybe in particular for that of Lighton and Kremos, that the layer, the moving layer is very thin. It's about two or three particles diameter. And the Lighton and Kremos model is a resuspension model, which, which, is, uh, uh, which, which probably is better for the large, uh, large thickness of the, the moving layer. So John, we, we discussed this problem with John, who, who what the idea to simplify uh, the Bagnon's model consider that uh, the, the friction coefficient between the grains is uniform and that the particle volume fraction is, is uniform too, and that the, the shear stress may be divided in two parts, particles and crew. And for the particles, we say that the, 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 the momentum transmitted by the particles is a product of a friction coefficient constant times the particle pressure and uh, the hydrostatic particle pressure. And for the fluid, the, the, the fluid shear stress is the total shear stress, which is known, which is imposed by the upper plate, minus uh, the, the particle shear stress. And this fluid shear stress is written as the product of an effective viscosity, which is different from the, the viscosity of the fluid or the molecular viscosity because, uh, because of the fluctuations inside the, the, the fluid times the, the velocity gradient. So here we have a, a first order differential equation, which can be uh, which, which can be integrated and which gives the parabolic velocity profile for, uh, for the fluid. And the only uh, fitting parameter here is the, the effective uh, fluid viscosity, which we took from the figure of the correlation equal to 2.45 times the the molecular viscosity of, of the fluid. And it appears that surprisingly, the, the, the model 
uh, agrees very nicely with, with the experiment for the small shins, shin, uh, shin numbers 0.2 to 0.5. That is for the fluid. And since the velocity of the particles is equal uh, to, to that of the fluid, we have the same uh, uh, the same agreement for the for the particles. Now, if we superpose uh, the points for the higher uh, Shin's numbers, of course, this point uh, fell uh, all out of the, the model because this is uh, because inertia is present here. And it's not so. We, we, we stopped here the analysis, we, uh, including the, the inertia and the particles in the analysis is, is, is certainly more, more difficult. But we conclude that we have a good agreement, uh, at least for, for a shield number uh, smaller than 0.5. And now I turn to the third topic, third point. Okay. Which is uh, the third and last point, which is sand ripple formation and the oscillating flow. Uh, this uh, problem has been addressed by Emily Larieux, a PhD student. And I must mention that Emily did part of this PhD here, invited by, by John. And she, she worked with John and, and with Lady Staron, which taught this morning. Uh, we talked this morning on a different problem of the collapse of the granular column. So, I mean, the experiments on the oscillating uh, motion of a fluid over a bed of particles and to, to understand the formation of ripples as the ripples we see uh, on the beach, uh, the ripples that are formed by the, the oscillating motion of the sea created by the surface waves. So uh, first consider the, the calculation. Um, for the calculation, we consider that the ripples are fixed. The, the, the velocity of the particles is much smaller than that of the fluid. And we consider long waves. So we can use the boundary linear equations, small amplitude waves, small inertia, and the velocity scaled with the amplitude of the motion A of the upper plate times the frequency, the angular frequency, is such as the power series in the two small expansion, uh, ex, uh, an expansion in the so, two small parameters, Reynolds number and uh, wave amplitude. And then, so we solve the, the successive orders, and at the second order, uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the power epsilon times Reynolds number, we find uh, a, a, mean, a mean Eulerian flow, which no longer depends on time, of course, and which is uh, this, uh, this uh, prefactor, which involves the square of the wave number and the amplitude, that is the slope of the, not, 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 it's not the slope of the, of the, of the, of the ripples, times uh, um, the polynomial in, in Y and times the sinus KX, which means that this, uh, uh, this Eulerian mean flow is uh, in phase with the with the uh, with the bottom with the wavy bottom, and if we plot this Eulerian mean flow here, we obtain this. So this is the Eulerian mean flow, and um, so we see that the Eulerian mean flow tends to to drive particles from the truth to the crest. And hence the, the instability uh, of the, the ripples. And now we can understand this mean flow by using the, the previous analysis um, we made for the for the two two fluid uh, problems. Indeed, uh, if we consider the, the first half period where the, the fluid goes to the right, so we have the dominant order, the leading order of disturbances, which are advected and which creates uh, a velocity field. Here, out of phase with the with the deformation of the interface, and during the second half period to the left, the leading order disturbances are reversed, but not uh, the, the, the the inertial correction. The inertial correction has the same sign. So, if we average these two pictures, we obtain this one. Now, we turn to experiment. Can we? 
uh, visualize uh, the, the mean flow by using uh, a filament of dye, vertical filament of dye over a wavy wall. Here, it's a, it's a wavy, it's a fixed wavy wall with triangular uh, shape. So at a time equal zero, we have a vertical uh, filament of dye, and then we, we we put the, mo the, the motion, the oscillating motion of the particle, so that the uh, the filament of dye oscillates like this, it's stretched. But at the end of each period, we see a little bit residual deformation of, of the filament, and this residual deformation grows with time. And after 39 periods, we have this picture for the filament of dye. And now, if we compare with the Iranian mean flow, we observe that uh, this shape is opposite to this one, except very near and the wall. You see that in the bulk of the flow here, the flow is to the right, here is to the left, and near the upper wall, here it's to the left, here it's to the right. So it's completely wrong. So, where's the problem? Uh, the problem is that here is a but what we see here is a Lagrangian deformation of the filament of dye. The filament of dye is fluid particles, and uh, we have to compute the Lagrangian uh, the, uh, displacement of this of this filament. So uh, we can to compute the, the Lagrangian uh, deformation. We consider that the displacement of the fluid particle is the sum of a small oscillation of, of, the, of the particle plus a slow drift. And the slow drift uh, um, is on the time scale, which is, a, a, which is a capital T, which is the, the, the actual time T times uh, the, the, this, uh, this small parameter. And uh, the Lagrangian velocity of the particle at position X at time T, when we uh, put this uh, expansion here, we can uh, develop in Taylor series and consider that this velocity is the sum of the Eulerian velocity at the position capital X plus the gradient of the velocity times the, the, the oscillation. And here, the, the, the displacement may be computed as an integral of the of the, the, the Eulerian uh, velocity. So that here we have uh, quantities which only depend on the Eulerian velocity, which can be computed. And we can average uh, these, uh, these expressions over one period. The average of this term is simply the Eulerian mean velocity, Eulerian mean flow. And the average of this term is known as the Stokes rate. And the Stokes rate and it has this, uh, this expression. And now if we plot the Eulerian velocity in, in, uh, in blue and the Stokes velocity in red, we see the large difference. And we see in particular that, uh, that there are nearly opposite of opposite side. And the sum of the, these two uh, mean flows is the Lagrangian mean flow of, 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 the, of the filament of that. So uh, the stocks, the conclusion is that the stocks dominates the Eulerian mean flow, except near the wavy wall, where the uh, here the, the, the tangent of the of the stocks flow is uh, is vertical, so that the contribution of the stocks drift to uh, to the global mean flow is negligible very near. This is why we can use the, the Eulerian mean flow to compute the shear stress. So the, 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 the shear stress calculations are right, but not the, 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 the displacement of the, of the film. And now if we, if we go back to experiments, we, we did new other experiments. We drew um, a bed of particles over two uh, ripples, natural ripples. But here we, we are on a new problem, which is that the amplitude of the motion is not small. Okay, a, uh, to obtain ripples, to move the, 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 the particles, we have to impose large shear stress, so large amplitude of the, of the oscillating motion. 
And then um, the, the previous calculation of the Lagrangian velocity is not enough work to perform uh, finite amplitude uh, calculations. And these uh, fin uh, finite amplitude calculations of the, of the uh, Lagrangian flow, uh, as made by John uh, in, in our collaboration. And the result is here. So we have here uh, the, the, the experiment. The, 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 the deform uh, the element of dye from the experiments. And we have here in, in red uh, the, the small amplitude uh, calculation of the Lagrangian grid. And in blue, the, the large amplitude calculation made by John of this value of the, of the parameter. And we see that now we have the right shape. And uh, the the small amplitude calculation gives the right shape, but not the right amplitude. And the, the large amplitude calculation uh, ultimately uh, gives a better result. So uh, this is the, the final uh, uh, point, of the final uh, slide for the, these three problems we worked with, uh, with John. And I, I would like to, to conclude with a, a, something a little different. I prefer to read it will be shorter. So I would like to conclude with a few words about the great French, uh, the great debt that French fluid mechanics owes to John. Yes, John made numerous stays in French laboratories as invited professors, especially in Paris. We saw Lydie and Jean Pierre this morning. Uh, in Marseille, we saw uh, we listened to to Babet and in Toulouse too, and uh, he participated to a great number of PhD committees and various committees aiming at the improvement of the French science. Above all, uh, John pays great attention to the work of students. And uh, a little story will illustrate this point. This story was told me by Patricia Helm, uh, which is now CNRS researcher in, in Toulouse. And Patricia was then preparing a PhD thesis with Eduardo Vespre at uh, the laboratory PMMH in Paris. And uh, a scientific committee, so that was uh, something like 20 years ago, a little more. A scientific committee of which John was a member met there for the evaluation of the lab. And while visiting the lab, John lingered around experiments and lost the committee. Patricia found him in a corridor and, and trained them and trained him towards the uh, experiments. And they spent there a long time discussing until somebody of the committee eventually found John, whom everybody was looking for, and uh, pulled him back to the to the meeting. So my own, so this is to illustrate the importance that discussion with students has to offer John. And by on John's uh, friendship to France. His uh, profound European feelings must be finally pointed out. Uh, as you know, in June 2016, the 23rd, the United Kingdom voted by a short majority <laughs> to leave the European Union. Not quite true. Uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> the majority of the voters, but not the majority of the people. Sorry, majority, a small, a short majority of the voters. <laughs> decided to leave the European Union. And John sent me an email the following morning in French. He was shocked and was telling with great emotion the night he spent with his wife, Christine, listening on the radio to the progress of the counting of votes. And you are true, John, we are Europeans. And uh, beyond the European countries, organizing conferences like this one, and maintaining the friendship is certainly our best way to preserve the fragile peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nafar. Do we have any questions? <laughs> so we've seen a bunch of talks that have given slides that have um, a picture of an article that has your name. 
Have you published all of the article in the AFF? <laughs> no? Okay. I just thought that would make life so easy, much easier. <laughs> It's over half, but not much more. Oh, okay. All right. Well, maybe, maybe it's the better half. Because that's just kind of <laughs> Apparently, to be the selector. That's right. It's because we are in Cambridge. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> paying honor to the queen or whatever. John? It's been always a very enjoyable, but always a great challenge to visit Toulouse and Francois. So I arrived on this ripple problem, and after a year of trying to get this experiment to work, there were no ripples in steady motion. The student had foolishly hit the wrong lever, and there was an oscillating motion, and ripples appear. Now, to predict why ripples appeared is quite easy. To predict how they appear, but then on another configuration they don't appear, is more than double the challenge. And it took a long, long time to find out why they wouldn't appear in the steady mode. And then having got all that nicely set up, and we found it was the average velocity in the oscillating flow. To foolishly go and check this experimentally by putting the die streak in to see what the average motion was and finding it was in the wrong direction. <laughs> New challenge. It's, it's, it's been very enjoyable, these challenges. Yeah. Yes, that was a great moment. <laughs> Indeed. Very good. Do we have questions? Anything online? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Stephen. Why don't the French give citizenships to Knights of the Order National de Merit? Why don't the French give citizenship to Knights of the Order National de Merit? Because I think well, I can think of one who would be overjoyed. <laughs> Well, just recently, my French bank account has imposed large charges because I don't live in the European community. Mm. I shall have to disclose. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Helen? Oh, Yeah. I think it's this one. Thank you. Um, uh, well, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so I worked out on the slide I'm sitting down the subject. I've known John half my life, uh, but only a third kid. <laughs> I'll leave that there. Um, and I'm going to talk about a problem that emerged from work that you did just before I started my PhD and on which my PhD was first based, and then what I built on that since then. So I will talk in outline about interfacial instability and where it started. I'll introduce shear banding in case I'm going to one of those, or I doubt it, in this audience. Um, introduce the BMP model, which I suspect many people don't know in this audience. Johnson Seligman and stability of all of those things. And there will be a bit of light relief because I think, well, two reasons, three reasons. One is I realise that I'm the only thing between you and tea and biscuits now. <laughs> um, but a much more important one is that I don't think it's been mentioned enough today that working with John is immensely fun. And we've not had much, well, no, we have been having fun, but we haven't talked about it. So I'm going to have actual proper imposed fun on the occasional time. Also, because it's the school holiday. So when I was writing this talk, I had children at home. My daughter went, Mummy, if you need any jokes, I'm right here. And I'm like, how can you turn that down? So it's, it's not very exciting to start with. So in steady shear of any homogeneous fluid, there's only four three variables. You've got the normal stresses, you've got shear stress. Um, and we will describe a steady shearing thing by its shear viscosity, first normal stress signal, and second normal stress signal. Just putting that up so everybody knows what conventions I've given for notation, not because I think it's news to anybody in the room. Um, and again, just a reminder when we have an interface between fluids, 
and I'm assuming there's no interfacial slip, and I'm assuming that we don't have surfactant, so we haven't got gradients of surface tension. So it's as simple as it could possibly be. Then across that interface, we expect continuity of the velocity, we expect continuity of the shear stress, but we don't necessarily expect continuity of the normal stress, but if there is a jump, it's got to be um, balanced by the surface tension. Okay, I think I've set everything up there. In a shear flow, those interfacial conditions where the normal to the interface is vertical as I've drawn it in this 2D setup, the flow is all that way. Continuity of the flow of, of the velocity tells you continuity of the one component that's non zero. And then the shear stress um, tells you that SXY and SYY have to be continuous. But SXX, there's nothing that tells you about it at all. So the along the flow lines stress can do anything it wants. And this particular set of the flow won't object to that. Um, if you then perturb flow, so this is drawing on what we've just seen in the previous uh, speech. Um, if you perturb this just a little bit, then you will expose that discontinuity if there is a discontinuity in the stress along the streamlines. Um, and you will also expose a discontinuity in the, the shear rate. So um, I have to say the way this was drawn by the previous speaker was much clearer than what I've got here, but I hadn't seen that then. And I, next time I give this talk, I'll have been called for this. But <clears throat> we'll, we'll go with what we've got. You end up with continuity of the perturbation Vertical velocity, yes, just continuous. The horizontal velocity will have a jump that is related to the jump in the base flow shear rate. In the same way with the stresses, the vertical vertical stress component must be continuous, but the shear stress of the perturbation has a jump in it, which was related to the jump in the along the, the flow stress in the base. Taking that as your starting point, this is then when. John came in, and I haven't got a screenshot of the title of this particular paper, but it's Hinch, Harris and Rallison, um, 1992, published while I was an undergraduate, but this is kind of the, the work that I started from the beginning of my PhD. So this is a three layer flow, um, plain quasi flow, with equivalent layers at the top and bottom of one fluid and a layer in the middle of another. So it's a 2D equivalent of co-extrusion. And if, the viscosities are matched, but the first normal stress difference is mismatched and is mismatched with higher values on the outside, then you don't need anything else about the fluid in terms of constitutive relation to work out the long wave stability and explain it. And this is what John did, essentially just moving those interfaces and saying, well, what happens at the point where it is slanted? And if you look, say, at, okay, mistake, <laughs> mistake. If you look at this arrow, at that point, to the right of the interface, you have the upper fluid, which is pulling you hard to the right. Below it, you have the middle fluid, which is pulling you only lightly to the left. So that piece of interface gets moved strongly to the right. <clears throat> and equivalent, arguments go about all the other slanted bits of interface. And then you say, well, I've got all my fluid flowing in from those two red arrows at the top and all my fluid flowing out from the two red arrows at the bottom. And I've got to do mass conservation. So it's got to go somewhere. Where's it going to go? It's going to go down. And the other place is going to go up. And that enhances the perturbation that we put on the interface in the first place. And it's a really clear and simple mechanism for instability using absolutely nothing constitutive. It's beautiful. So I built on that and expanded it and made it an ordinary B fluid and got beyond long waves and got into short waves and moderate length waves and different arrangements of liquids and all the rest of it. None of which I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> because what I really want is that fundamental bit where you take an interface and you go, well, there's a jump outside this interface. It's dragging things places. And I want to see how far that argument can take you. But first a joke break. <laughs> what do you call a sad strawberry? Nobody. Blueberry, well done. 
<laughs> right. So now I want to talk about surfactants. So surfactants, as I suspect we all know, but I'll do it quickly anyway, have hydrophobic ends and hydrophilic ends. And I tend to think of the hydrophobic ones as the head, but I think I might have my convention upside down on that. It doesn't really matter. It only affects the pictures. It doesn't affect the science. Um, they are widely used in soaps because the hydrophobic end likes to stick its head in the muck and the other end likes to be in the water. And so they encapsulate the muck in your washing up water and keep it off the plates. Um, if you get water that has no muck in it, they'll go to the interfaces short and make it more likely to give you bubbles, but also they can at the right concentrations and salt, salt and stuff for my cells where they form little blobs with all the heads together and all the tails sticking out on the outside. And if you're very, very careful, they form worms instead. Worm-like micelles are lovely because they act a lot like linear polymers, except that when they come across each other and are pulled, there's no strong chemical bond along the length of them. It's just the fact that they like to have their heads out of the water. So they'll smoothly pass through one another in a way that linear polymers just can't. So they'll orient and stretch with the flow. They go back to a relaxed coil if nothing's happening to them. You can get tension along the streamlines. All of this is familiar from linear polymers, but because of the reconnection thing, the shear viscosity gets a bit weird. And this is what's observed in experiments a lot of the time. You um, impose an average shear rate, that's what the x-axis is, sorry about the lack of labels, um, and you measure the resultant shear stress, and what you find is that for a range of shear rates you get the same shear stress. Um, and the hypothesis is that there is an underlying curve of which we are sampling bits, um, and that what you are actually seeing when you get something somewhere in the middle is two regions of different shear rates, and that's also for that So let me now introduce a model. This is the Bautista Monero Puig model, not necessarily all pronounced correctly. Um, and it's a model of thixotropy that also incorporates shear banding if you mess with the parameters in the right way. So uh, the first thing is the evolution of the stress tensor, and that's basically Maxwell like. Um, it's got this parameter. G, which is just like the elastic modulus, and it's got phi, which is one over the viscosity, it's called the fluidity, and that will vary. But apart from the fact that the viscosity varies, it is just a Maxwell evolution model for the stress. The evolution of this fluidity has two terms, uh, so that's a material derivative on the left, of course it affects, um, but all you have is breakdown by flow, and reformation of structure by being left alone to recover in an elastic way. And the parameter for the breakdown has this one plus theta times the shear rate term in it, and theta is the shear banding parameter. If you turn that off, it doesn't shear band, but it does do thixotropy nicely. If you increase theta enough, you'll get some shear banding, which is what I want to talk about today. Um, in Wet flow, if you impose homogeneous flow so that you absolutely have a, a steady shear rate ever the same everywhere, even if that wouldn't occur in practice, then it does this what we expect for a shear banding thing of, of the non monotonic. Um, and of course, if you pick a shear rate that's in the decreasing portion, what you actually see in reality with the, mod with the model, if you just simulate and allow unsteady behaviours, is it'll separate out and give you shear banding. There is unique selection of shear stress for this particular model, um, and the first normal stress difference is continuous across the interface. So now what happens if we put this in plane quasi flow? So if we put it in a plane quasi flow such that we go through that critical shear rate where you get the jump somewhere in the channel, then you will get th three layers, two interfaces, two matching interfaces, one up, one down, symmetrically placed around the center line, um, and continuity of first normal stress difference across it, but a jump in the shear rate. Recall, if I was going to do stability, which of course I am of these interfaces, um, 
the things which need to be continuous are the vertical velocity and the double vertical stress. And then with the jumps, we have the shear stress and the horizontal velocity. In this case, the jump in the shear stress isn't there because I said my normal stress, first normal stress difference is continuous in the base case. So everything that happens is going to be driven by this term, the jump in the shear rate. Um, and have a slight issue here in that this fluid does also have the ability to have bulk instabilities even when there isn't a shear landing interface at all. So we need a way to identify which is which. Um, what we do is track them down to long waves. If it's a bulk mode at long waves, it is absolutely stable. If it is an interfacial mode, it goes to zero. So we like we identify as an interfacial mode something whose long wave is neutrally stable. Um, and for this particular model, there are both interfacial modes and bulk mode modes, and they can both be unstable. And let me just show you some. Um, this is uh, the dotted one is an interfacial mode. You, uh, is a bulk mode. You can tell because it's got an actual decay rate as k goes to zero. This is a wave number. Um, and the black one, which is growing only very slowly, is an interfacial mode. So we have an interfacial instability there. And at very long waves, it's the only thing that's unstable. Although, if you're going to perturb at all wave numbers, which in reality you always are, the bulk mode is almost always more unstable. So the bulk mode matters more. Nonetheless, we've got an interfacial instability there, which is quite nice. Um, and we attempted to reproduce it by putting in a couple of Aldroid B fluids with viscosities. Now, of course, the viscosity in this thing varies across the channel, but with viscosities that match the viscosity right next to the interface and with the normal stresses engineered to match at the interface and to match as best you can everywhere else. And we found that long waves for that setup are always stable, although they are definitely unstable in this case. So although it's driven by the jump in the shear rate, the fact that the fluid as a whole in the bulk shear thins is critical for making those long waves unstable. So that's my first mini fluid. Jump break. What starts with a W and ends with a T? Yes. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Now I want to go back in time to an older and simpler model simply because we can do more with it mathematically. So the Johnson Siegelman is not as well posed physically. Um, it's beautifully simple, but it doesn't have a reason why these structures should build up and decay or anything like that built into it. Nonetheless, it captures phenomenologically the way that shear thickening happens. So, sorry, was I too fast? <laughs> sorry, we haven't explained the joke. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's all right. We've left the EU. We trapped up and believe in that problem. It's all right. It's not the most important bit of the story. You need it waking up. It's fine. <laughs> so I've got Mary Reynolds. And well, you've got us to sleep. <laughs> Mass conservation. Momentum conservation. Zero realms number, no inertia. And I write my stress tensor out in standard form. And again, I've got an epsilon, which is not a small parameter. Sorry. Um, so uh, the total stress is the pressure, the Newtonian component, and then the extra stress, which I'm going to call sigma. And it evolves using something that looks a lot like an Audrey B model or a Maxwell model, except for this slit parameter A. So if I set A equals one, I have actually got a Maxwell mode there. But I don't set A equals one because that would be dull. Um, I set it somewhere between zero and one, and then interesting things might happen. Um, what does it do in simple shear? Uh, well, that's actually the solution to the question I just asked. But what does it look like? Uh, oh, and the positive, the normal stress difference is positive. That's what it looks like. It's um, another of these non monotonic flow curves. And if you impose a shear stress, then to work out the shear rate, you end up solving a cubic. And like most of the bits, sometimes there are three solutions to it. And there, oh, no, not there. there on the blue dot is a point where there are three solutions. Uh, so we've got 
something which has the potential to be shear bounded because we can have three different shear rates, one of which is clearly physically 1D unstable because it's on a descending part of the flow curve, but two of which are viable at the same shear strength. So we've got shear bounded, but where am I pointing this? There we go. There's no mechanism in this model to choose the shear stress. Any shear stress will work within the region where there's three solutions. Whereas in experiments, you can reproducibly keep on seeing the same amount of strength. So that's not right. There's also no penalty in this model for having lots and lots of bands. You can go alternating tiny bits of low shear rate, high shear rate all the way across the channel, and that's fine. And in experiments, you don't always just get two, but you always get small numbers. You don't get this mess. Um, so there's something wrong. Basically, the equations aren't quite there yet. Oh, that's my fault. <laughs> okay. So there is a non-unique solution set, as I pointed out, with all of these possible ramifications, and that's because the equations are singular. So the, this got, the model came about in 1977. In I think 19. 2000, no, not 90 anything. In 2000, um, Peter Olmsted and his co-workers co -co came up with this nice fix, which is that you add a tiny bit of diffusion. Um, and they chose to add stress diffusion because it seems natural that a polymer that diffuses from one place to another would carry its stress with it rather than its shear rate. Mm -hmm. Uh, and what you find from that is essentially it solves all of the problems. You blur out the interface a little bit, it gets a, a dimension that's typical length scale of L, um, but you get unique selection of the shear stress and therefore of the interface position, and the equations become regular and everything is nice. So that's nice. What does the solution look like? Well, so now I'm in, I'm just doing shear flow, steady shear flow. Um, you have two outer regions, each of which has a single shear rate and over, over which nothing varies, except the velocity, obviously, which varies in a nice, uh, well understood way. But the, the shear rate is constant, the stresses are all constant in each of those regions. And then between them, there is an inner region of width L um, where the derivatives are important and it does the matching onto both of the outers. Uh, those equations are true in both the outer and the inner. In the outer, you can write down T11 and T12, which are the two relevant components of the stress, just in terms of the shear rate. And in the inside, you have differential equations governing how the shear rate evolves across the width of the interface. And you get unique select selection of the value of T, T star, which is the shear stress across the entire thing. All right, type of gender. What do you call them? Train. Choo choo train, thank you very much. <laughs> right. So now I want to take this situation that I've set up and do the 2D stability of it. So I'm looking at stability of a shear flow with a band in it of, I'm going to go back to the original Johnson Siegel one for a moment with the sharp interface. So I'll do standard temporal linear stability analysis. I'm going to use a string function. I'm going to do Fourier transforms in all, all the places that I can. Um, and I end up hitting a philosophical snag, which is this interface. What is it? It's the same fluid both sides. So is this a material interface? Are my fluid parcels going to carry with them the information about which root of a cubic they have selected? Is that something that fluid elements can do? <laughs> anyway, let's assume that they do. Um, which means that we're assuming this interface is a material facing surface which is fluid and does not go off. Um, and we can do a long wave stability analysis, absolutely equivalent to what John was doing with that co extrusion thing right at the beginning. Um, you can expand since it's a long wave, and the growth, the eigenvalue, the temporal eigenvalue, starts at order k, which is the wave number. The leading order term is advection. And I've written it down there, but it's not particularly exciting because all it does is affect. The second order term is the growth or decay. 
um, and it's too big to write down, but it has been done. And that is the a just just a phase diagram basically of where it's unstable and where it's not. It's unstable in the middle. The bottom axis is how much of the lower shear rate I've got in my channel. So if I'm right at the left hand side of the graph, there's none of the low shear rate, it's all high shear rate and vice versa. If you're somewhere in the middle, you've got half and half and it's unstable almost everywhere. Uh, the blue dotted lines are the minimum and maximum possible values of the total stress that, I'm, that I have. Um, and yeah, you can see it's unstable most of the way, but we did have this horrible assumption. What about if there isn't an interface? If it's diffusive and there is no real interface, there is just an inner region. Well, let's just do the same thing with our fluid treated as a single continuum. Um, do the same thing, put a perturbation series in the outer and in the inner, but now a perturbation series in L, which is the small length scale associated with the, with the gap. Um, and it needs to be singular for the stresses inside the inner. So this bottom term here has an L to the minus one in. So it is large, despite being a small perturbation. Glossing over that, you can actually do the calculation in the inner. You get leading order quantities, which are just the derivative of the outer, of the leading order, of the non-perturbation flow, which when you integrate across this tiny interface to give the conditions, the matching conditions you need to apply on your outers tells you that actually, yes, you could get away with it being a material interface all along. That's exactly what we should have been doing. And when you do the, I've just said that. So you, you've got the inners, you integrate across them and you get conditions on the outer, which are just as if the interface was a real interface and a material interface of that. Got a little bit of caveat on it. You can't do it for short waves because they're <laughs> shorter than the size of your interface because that would just be horrible. Um, but for small L, as long as your waves are long enough, you can use pure Johnson Siegel and it's fine. And this is, I have this on my title slide, but I didn't tell you what it was then. So the green line is the long wave asymptote just doing John's calculation with a material interface. The red line is the pure Johnson Siegelman calculated numerically. And then all the little dots are for different values of L, again, calculated numerically. And if I add a multiple of L to them, they collapse really rather nicely at the left-hand side of the plot. And I found that by complete chance because I just happened to have the graph for a set of parameters for which the magic number was 10. And so I saw it when I looked in the data. We were then able to prove what the asymptotics was, um, the shape, and not actually predict the 10, but predict a function that the 10 was a part of, not which I have time for today. Last joke break, wide wall, which is where black. So you can't tell which which is which. <laughs> right, so to summarize, and I'll leave the references up, you basically can get away with interfaces, even if there aren't interfaces, if you're doing stability. Um, diffusion of stress does not destroy everything. You can get away with the material interface, even when you think you probably shouldn't. Um, it's not quite as simple as it might look, taking the jumps at interfaces to drive things, because what's going on in the bulk matters as well. And I will leave it there because it's well done. Thank you, Helen. Do we have questions? Oliver? Helen, so you did, you did get this in spirit to do two old way spirits, right? So what would happen for this bit We didn't get it a wrong way again. Yeah. So what would you need to do? Would it just be I could put some, you know, if you did a big shift that being modeled with and feed and feel or something like that, would that, would that be enough? I don't know. I haven't done the other things. <laughs> I would hope so. I, I mean, it's, there's so little in it uh, uh, that stability can sample. It can sample kind of 
only tiny changes in things. So I think a, a little bit of shear thinning would have to be enough. But it's a guess. Jerome? Possibly a value credit. When you put in diffusion of stress, does that introduce an, a time varying base state? As in, um, are you doing a fairly time classic product? Mm -hmm. It doesn't. And I can't remember why not, because that's a that's a really sensible question. I tried to look at permissible Newtonian fluids by adding a diffusion, and absolutely you have a time varying base state, and eventually I gave up for exactly that reason. I think there are things driving it the other way within those equations, but I can't, it's too we go. There's a positive drive for the value that it's taking in the top, and a positive drive towards having it in the bottom, and then it's just a diffusion between. Right, yeah, so it only diffuses There's a real away. reason yeah. to do something in the top, and a real reason. Yeah, so it, it's driving towards the steady state, I think, so it's the balance between the two, but you do end up with a steady, a steady base state to go from. John? In the BMP model with Pisay fluid, yeah. was the base state something analogous to Newtonian fluid with just variable viscosity? So you said the shear stress is continuous. There's no the shear stress isn't continuous. But the shear stress is continuous, but yeah, sharply varying viscosity. And do your results then match the sort of like analysis for just Two Newtonian fluids with different viscosities. No, no. There, there's there are. I'm not sure about the information mode, but there are definitely modes of interest. So the first thing we did was add um, just Newtonian viscosity that varied across the channel, and that damps the instability really rapidly. You need the elasticity to be in there as well. John? You don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to try and keep this up. <laughs> I agree when you had that thin layer, you had a term in the layer which was an order of magnitude bigger than some people would expect. Yeah. I'm afraid they happen. It happened to me in a totally <laughs> different problem. And it took me a year to see that I needed it. Yes, it took me longer than it should have done to spot them. That should have been done. And so big things happen in little layers. Yeah. Thank you. Stephen, do we have? I've been doing it for five years or more. I think we can start. Yeah. Okay, so let's start our final section of the day. I think the first speaker will be Eric Schachter, who will be joining us remotely on Zoom. And he's going to talk about particles in viscoelastic fluids, sedimentation, and swimming. Eric, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, John. There are a few people that I would wake up at seven or eight in the morning and put a collared shirt on to celebrate their birthday. <laughs> but John is one of them. Why is John one of them? I, I get to embarrass him. It's his 75th birthday. So uh, there are, I often say this, there are actually three people that educated me after my undergraduate education and prepared me for my future career, John Hinch, Andy Akervos, and Bud Holmesy. Uh, and I was uh, John Hinch's postdoc in 1986. On my uh, CV, it says George Bachelor and John Hinch. However, I probably had three or four conversations with George Bachelor, whereas I uh, met with John every week. Uh, and so I've got a little, uh, prelude uh, about uh, what his impact on my career was. Uh, I was, he was my postdoc mentor. And we essentially worked on two problems, uh, the sedimentation of suspensions of non-spherical problems, uh, particles. Uh, that was my idea. That's actually what I wrote my application to do. And then the second one was a non-local theory for the average stress in a fiber suspension. The first one the idea was that uh, particle interactions would create an order one change in the sedimentation velocity because the orientation distribution of particles was not uh, determinant for single particles. Um, 
The second one was John's idea, and that the idea was that the ensemble average stress was defined in a suspension, even if the flow wasn't locally linear on average. And so you could now redefine the average stress in terms of a convolution operator that uh, of the flow with uh, the velocity gradient. And that's a new way of thinking about stress in situations where the flow varies on the same scale as the fiber. Now, out of that work uh, came a, a whole series of papers, but I'm just showing the three that immediately came out of that work. I actually got the Frank Yale Award for the paper on non-local theory. Don Koch and I, I needed help uh, solving the instability, the dispersion of sedimenting spheroids. And then probably the most cited paper is the idea that non-local stress can describe screening in fiber suspensions. And you'll notice that John isn't an author on any of these papers, and that's, that's his doing. The man is incredibly gracious, so he's acknowledged in these papers. Uh, and it's not like I didn't ask him to be a co-author, but he, he's that kind of person. He gives his ideas freely. And unless he uh, does half the analysis or more, he refuses to be on it. So he's acknowledged. Now, that wasn't the end. Uh, he visited my group in 1996. I'm sure he remembers this. And he worked with Pat Doyle and me on Brownian dynamics, a part of polymers. He was working with uh, Paul Grassi at the time on the same problem. And the idea was, uh, and I think he's going to talk a little bit about this in his talk, that the, there's a problem with the stress in simple dumbbell models uh, for polymer solutions because the stress appears to be missing a viscous term. And uh, the only way we could establish where that missing stress was, was take a fine grain model of a polymer and do Brownian dynamic simulation. And the key here is the development of an algorithm that you can accurately and efficiently get the stress out of a Brownian dynamic simulation. And we developed this algorithm with John called stochastic filtering. And that resulted in a whole nother series of papers. Again, John's not on these. Um, he, he published a parallel set with Grassi and Hinch. Uh, but again, this is... Uh, the foundation of my work in the area of polymer mechanics. So at the end of the day, he created the foundation for all my future work in both particle suspensions and polymeric fluids. Um, and that's why I'm in a college shirt at 8 a.m. sitting here saying, thank you, John. Uh, what did I learn from John Hinch? Well, what I meant here is not the technical aspects because I learned a tremendous amount of technical uh, material from John. What I meant here are the fundamental principles that I apply to solving problems. And, and I, I hope other people have said this and you'll recognize these. The first thing is keep in mind a simple but important physical idea model when you do analysis. And it's the best if there's already an experiment. And if there isn't an experiment, it's nice if you do one to keep that in mind. Uh, and then don't be afraid to make approximations uh, to mathematically understand that simple physical idea or model, um, because what you're after is a clear physical understanding and a mathematical model for that. And if you have to add bells and whistles after the fact, that's fine, but get at the heart of the problem. And then the other one, and anybody that's heard John speak, I think, gets this one. If you can't describe in clear physical terms the results of your analysis, you're probably wrong. Um, and uh, I apply this one all the time. If, if, if you can't say in a few simple words what your analysis is just, you're, you know, it's probably wrong or you've made an approximation that's too complex, etc. So what I'm going to do now in the rest of the talk is uh, give a technical uh, story which takes these principles into account. This picture, which I didn't give uh, which i'm free to give in this compendium of pictures is a picture i actually keep on my wall uh, as motivation um, this is one of the best pictures of john and i together you'll see the other cast of characters here howard stone that's a shok sangani on the right hand side and my graduate student richard sheik uh, and there's two reasons why this is motivating for me first of all 
it's at the Fine Particle Society in Las Vegas. Okay, so the three American professors here are here to get money, unabashedly to try to get money from the Fine Yeah. It's not from the slot. <laughs> We've lost your your um, voice. And now you might ask, well, why is John Hinch here? It's is my voice fading in and out? Yeah. Can, the video on. yeah. Can you hear me now? No? Yeah. Am I okay now? Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Uh, he, he, he is here because he's invited and he has something scientific to say. And that was uh, motivating for me. So I keep this on my wall. It also proves that uh, John and my hair color was brown at one point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I've been on a rant for approximately the last 10 years about uh, suspensions of particles in viscoelastic fluids. They're everywhere. Uh, in biological context, additive manufacturing, fracking fluids, drilling muds, etc. And there's relatively little known about them. There are uh, kind of a sundry disparate experiments. And those that exist basically show qualitative different behavior than in Newtonian suspensions of the same, let's say, shear viscosity. And the reason we don't have much of an understanding in my opinion, is because the usual approximations that are made in suspensions of Newtonian with Newtonian suspending fluids are not applicable and there's no equivalent Stokesian dynamics for these. And so I think it's a great place to work. So I've been working in this area for about 10 years and I'm gonna show you how the principles that John taught me help you understand some of the simple problems in this area. Um, I don't think I have to tell this audience this anymore, but I will anyway. Uh, I believe Helen probably talked about this uh, already. Uh, we're going to talk about polymer solutions today. And so the primary rheological difference between Newtonian fluids and polymeric solutions is that when you deform a large high molecular weight coil in, let's say, a shear flow, it resists that deformation because of the thermal fluctuations. So the extra stress uh, as this is trying to drive itself back into the equilibrium coil produces normal stresses. And in this simple uh, example, when you spin the top plate, you basically create stretched polymers in hoops. Those hoops stretch in, press in, and you get a higher pressure. So you get what's called the normal force and you typically measure the uh, primary normal stress coefficient as another material property uh, that characterizes these polymer solutions. And these normal stresses are uh, important for many phenomena. For example, if you don't have a top on the spin, then you get rod climbing. The normal, uh, the hoop stresses can support uh, some height or weight of this fluid. Right, so you need a model to describe this. And this is, again, a qualitative dumbbell model. So you take the dumbbell model, that is to say, you say the restoring entropic restoring force of that deformed coil uh, depends only on the end of end to end vector Q. And then you can run with that in statistical mechanics and you get the following set of equations. This is conservation of momentum, continuity. And then an equation for the dyad configuration of the dumbbell, in this case, capital lambda. Uh, and this uh, particular model that I have written up here has uh, some bells and whistles. The linear spring model gives you the Uldroyd B model. If you have a finite extensibility, that is the spring stiffens, then you get the Feeney P model. If the drag coefficient on the dumbbell changes with the local configuration of the dumbbells, you get the Giesegas model. So all of these are qualitative models that you can use. Um, they aren't quantitative, but they're qualitative and we'll use those, uh, I'll use those in the talk. The key parameters are the Weisenberg number, a concentration parameter, that is the number density of dumbbells in the solution. It can also be uh, interpreted in terms of a partition coefficient beta. Uh, and then if you have these bells and whistles, uh, the finite extensibility parameter and the mobility parameter. So 
The Reynolds number for everything I'm going to talk about is zero. So these are the key parameters and I'll uh, refer to them as I go through the talk. So, oh, sorry. Uh, why is this not advancing? Okay, here we go. So uh, if you're in this field uh, nowadays, you also have to have uh, some big numerical methods, uh, essentially because to check your approximations if you're going to develop models. And, and we have uh, a large code that we developed over the last 10 to 12 years, both for when particles move in the fluid and also uh, for when you can go to a reference frame when the particles are stationary. And so I'm just going to describe very briefly the particle moving code, which is the immersed boundary code. So what you do is you solve those equations uh, over the entire region, and then you uh, add these forces called constraint forces to force in the red regions essentially solid body rotation uh, and motion if the particle is rich. Um, those are called rigidity constraints. You apply those rigidity constraints and then you go back and iterate until the rigidity constraints are satisfied and you recalculate the fluid. Um, and, and this works because there are actually no interfaces. There are just grids and then you move the particles and the red grid, the Lagrangian grid, moves in the green grid and you interpolate back and forth. Uh, the problem is, of course, there are errors at the interface. There's not a, not a nice, uh, sharp, smooth interface, and so there are interpolation errors. But this is far better than regridding every time the particles move. So it turns out this is computationally efficient, and that's what it looks like uh, if you want to create a little movie of it in the immersed boundary code. Now we have both a body fitted code, which is on the left and the immersed boundary code on the right. And I claim that you, you better have both of these because it turns out that to do immersed boundary calculations, you need far more resolution because of the fact that the interfaces are diffuse. So we have gone back and checked that our immersed boundary code reproduces the body fitted code. And what do you see here is shear flow past the cylinder. You're looking at the trace of the polymer stress on the left from the body fitted code and what we needed to do on the right to get the immersed boundary code to reproduce this accurately. All right, uh, that's all I'm going to talk about numerical methods. Now let me go through a series of uh, relatively simple problems um that we understood doing this and so the first one is fracking uh you can't do fracking research in the united states anymore or at least nobody's going to pay for it um, even though there are states economies that are still dependent upon fracking but when we started this we could still do it halliburton was making fracking fluids these are fluids uh that are the second step in the fracking process they support supposedly the propent meaning they carry sand miles underneath the ground into the fracks. And the point is that there's a good fracking fluid and a bad fracking fluid. And a good fracking fluid has the sedimentation velocity go down as you shear it. And a bad fracking fluid has the sedimentation go up as you shear it. And the question was why? Why if you shear uh, these fluids, do you get a change in the sedimentation velocity? And the short answer is because they're elastic and so now there's a nonlinear coupling between the shear and the sedimentation velocity, and we wanted to understand how that worked. Um, and so, for example, there are these uh, papers that appeared kind of early in this process. We don't, we don't know what's going on. Is it viscosity? Is it shear thinning? Is it elasticity? So again, following the principles, we did our own little experiments. So here's a, here's a titanium and aluminum sphere falling in a coet cell. We have the inner cylinder rotating and the outer cylinder counter rotating. So when you see the, there it is, there's the, there's the particle and it's sedimenting down at the stagnation line and you can measure the stagnation, you can measure the sedimentation velocity in one of these elastic fluids. This is a Boger fluid and the black lines are the fits of that Feeney P model that I showed you. And you see there's a primary normal stress coefficient, large normal stresses and a modestly shear thinning viscosity. So we did these experiments, and this is the kind of data we got. You have dimensionless sedimentation velocity as a function of the shear 
Eisenberg number. And what's obvious, I believe, the black, uh, the open symbols are the experiments and the black symbols are the simulations from those codes that I showed is that the sedimentation velocity decreases and it decreases rather rapidly with increasing shear. The epsilon parameter in this case is the blockage parameter. So these spheres were finite size relative to the gap of the Kuwait cell. So I would say this is qualitative, not quantitative behavior, but the simulations all show a decrease. The experiments all show a decrease. <clears throat> and so therefore we were bold enough to say, okay, we can now uh, data mine the simulations to understand the physics. And here's what happens. So if you look at the wake behind the sphere as it falls at zero Weisenberg number, and now the shear is in the orthogonal plane in this case. So the shear is in the plane out of the board, the way you're looking at it. What happens is as you increase the shear, the wake splits. It broadens and then it splits. Uh, and we uh, called these things viscoelastic wings when you get up to high enough Weisenberg number because they look like wings. But they act actually more like air brakes, it turns out. So what happens is the fluid has to deform along the fluid flow has to go around these wings because they're regions of stretched polymer and that results in what a high pressure in the front of the sphere which now hinders its settling and so that at the end of the day that's the mechanism so we have uh, form drag going up dramatically uh, because of the formation of these wings um, whoops sorry let me go back if I can yeah, so form drag was the culprit. Uh, now the problem, of course, is that the, you don't uh, you don't frack at zero concentration. So what happens in a suspension? Well, it's already known, actually, for a bunch of years, that sedimentation, even under quiescent conditions in viscoelastic fluids, is not simple. So if we go back to even uh, Ron Phillips. A number of people you find that sedimentation of quiescent uh, suspensions in viscoelastic fluids forms concentration streamers and so you see them here uh, this is in the late 90s uh, and so if we're going to do it with shear flow we better first start to understand what's the what forms these streamers now this brings me back to the uh, to the postdoc work so we predicted the same thing for non-spherical particles in sedimentation uh, in my postdoc. And Don Koch and I wrote a paper that said that spheroids sedimenting in a Newtonian fluid was actually unstable to concentration streamers. And then Babette and Blown Metzger did some beautiful experiments demonstrating that. So here are those experiments. And the idea is, in a mean field sense, if you have a concentration fluctuation, you create a shear flow, as I see here, a, constant, a shear flow, and then that tends to, particles tend to align such that they fall into the high particle regions, the dense regions, and that causes a growth of the instability. Uh, the same thing was predicted in viscoelastic flow. Because of an imbalance of normal stresses, you get a lateral migration for a sedimenting fluid and it happens to be in the right direction. That is to say such that it would create instability. This was actually done by two sets of researchers, Einerson and then Santione. They got different coefficients for the drift velocity. And then we did some numerics that showed that actually Einerson was correct. Uh, but it, it doesn't really matter. Both of these analyses show instability. Uh, now, going back to Halliburton, they saw it as well. They put some one of their fracking fluids and they put some uh, concentrations in here and under quiescent conditions, it forms these streamers, but then they put orthogonal shear on it. The streamers break up and they still get a reduction of the sedimentation speed with orthogonal shear. So the question is, what, you know, what mix of this uh, instability and orthogonal shear are necessary to get this desired effect? that is the reduction of sedimentation velocity in the suspension. And again, following the principles, we did our own experiments. So we uh, colored some spheres. We actually did these experiments at 5% volume fraction. We have 10% of those 
spheres green and then the 90% clear and they're fluorescent dyed so we could follow them. We have both a quiescent cell and a coet cell. And so we did the experiments. These are some experiments in viscoelastic and Newtonian, same shear viscosity, but the right is elastic and the left is Newtonian. And lo and behold, you indeed get these streamers or regions of high particle velocity uh, in the viscoelastic case, nothing in the Newtonian case. And indeed, if I, I can use those streamers to get velocity statistics. And the bottom line is in the viscoelastic case, you get a very broad distribution of sedimentation velocities, which is the purple distribution here. And the mean sedimentation velocity is even larger than isolated spheres. Uh, this is similar to what happens for non-spherical particles. The Newtonian, you have hindrance, and the viscoelastic, you actually have enhancement of the mean because of the formation of these concentration instabilities. So now, the punchline is uh, what happens if you shear it. So here we go. These are exactly the same suspension. One is quiescent, and one is sheared, and I think you can actually see that you're, you're almost levitating the sheared ones. The sheared ones don't look like they're sedimenting, but they are just at a much reduced velocity than the, uh, new to, than the quiescent ones. And uh, now, so why are, does orthogonal shear work even in a suspension? And we go back to our uh, numerical simulations and our answer, and if you just look at the pictures, you can kind of see the answer, the wake splitting. So when there's a finite concentration of particles, a particle that drafts another particle splits its wake, and it splits it a lot more efficiently than even the shear does. So you've got a particle following one particle that splits its wake. Once it splits its wake, it creates a higher pressure in front of the first particle and so we actually found that uh, reduction in selling velocity was more efficient at finite concentration uh, than it was at low concentration. And our answer was wake splitting. Um, now, uh, this, of course, once you start doing stuff, everybody starts calling you about sedimenting particles. And so Robert Zenick called us and he had succeeded in spinning a particle in a magnetic field and allowing it to sediment. And it did exactly the opposite of what it does in shear. It actually speeds up. So he found that the sedimentation velocity increases as you spin this particle. And we did sediment, we did simulations and proved that again, it's the pressure, uh, but the hoop stresses are convected to the back of the particle, creating a higher pressure now in the back instead of the front. And so it gets a little push from the pressure and so that increases the speed uh, and we published this uh, but then uh, robert said to us well you know e coli swims faster in a viscoelastic fluid so maybe there's something about this sedimentation problem that can teach you about swimming in viscoelastic fluids and here's the data from paolo aratia that shows that you get you swim faster in elastic fluids for E. coli. Now there's obvious differences between these problems. Particle sedimentation has got a force on it. E. coli don't have a force on it. Plus E. coli swim by the tail spins and the head counter rotates. But nevertheless, we started to say, can swirl propel a freely suspended swimmer in an elastic fluid under Stokes flow? And we made, again, according to the principle of model. So Obviously, E. coli is too complicated, so we made it two spheres. One sphere, rotate, smaller sphere, rotating, and the other sphere, counter-rotating, such that there's no torque on it. So now there's no torque and no force on this object, and it's a swirler, if you want to think about it that way. And we uh, numerically calculated the propulsion, and lo and behold, even at zero Reynolds number, this thing propels. It propels in the direction of the bigger head. Uh, and the physics is reasonably simple. The tail is spinning faster than the head by conservation of torque. 
So all the hoop stresses are in the tail. Uh, it's been known since the 60s that if you have a spinning sphere, it sucks fluid in and spits it out along the poles. And in this case, that creates a pressure behind the object and that pressure then propels it along. At least that's what the numerics say. So, uh, and the theory, uh, this John would love this, or maybe not, I don't know, but John, uh, this is really simple. You just take a rotating sphere in a second order fluid and you do the method of reflections between the spheres and you end up with a propulsion velocity that's proportional to the primary normal stress coefficient and a correction for second normal stresses. There you go, simple. Um, and we made it. So here you go. Here's a, uh, a swimmer that we call Proteus. Uh, it's got its motor in the head. It spins its tail. And in Newtonian fluids, the right is corn syrup, so it's Newtonian, and the left is water. It does nothing. Uh, at zero Reynolds number, which is a pretty much an approximation in this corn syrup, it, uh, by reversibility, it can't go anywhere. It turns out it's a terrible swimmer even with inertial effects. This is a Reynolds number of about 100. But you put it in a, an elastic fluid like this one. We now have some fish tanks in my lab full of these mucus-like things. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, a few relaxation times to match the linear vasculosticity. And this is what you get. Here is Proteus swimming in an elastic fluid. And it now just scoots along the fish tank uh, with a propulsion velocity that is presumably related to the normal stresses, right? Because this doesn't work in a Newtonian fluid. And so we did a bunch of experiments. Here's a, a second Proteus that's spinning along and we measured the velocity for different rotational Debra numbers of the tail. And this is what we get. So this is the prediction of the theory. And the green line is our best uh, estimate of the numerics using numerics, the multi-mode Gizagis. What we did find is to get nearly quantitative agreement, we had to include the confinement. So our Proteus now is about the size of a fist. So it fills a significant fraction of the tank. So we had to include confinement, but if we do include confinement and we match the fluid, well, we actually can predict the propulsion velocity. All right, that's uh, what I have to say. I think you see uh, how the principles that John taught me are applicable. This is my group. Uh, those are the people that actually did the work. I'm the mouthpiece for them. Happy birthday, John, and thank you for the foundation for my work in particle suspensions and polymeric fluids. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. So do we have any questions from the audience here? Or online. Norn, any questions online? John? <laughs> <laughs> He's beating. <laughs> it, it's unfortunate your orthogonal Shear sedimentation is a very complicated geometry, even if it is smooth. So you need a really big computer that I can't afford. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, it, it, so I, I, I bought the computer 20 years ago and now it's been upgraded many times. So yes, some of these you need a very big computer for, yes, so. But then we do some simple models. You can do perturbation theory on that orthogonal and it does reasonably well at low Debra number and Weisenberg number. The problem is the real effects are at high Weisenberg number, so. <clears throat> Tim? Um, I was thinking about your two sphere, whatever you call it, that swims. If, um, 
Yes. If you slightly generalize that to a, mo a, a model of E. coli with a corkscrew at the back instead of a, another sphere, does the rotational effect actually beat the viscous thrust effect in, in um, swimming? Right. So I was just, so I've been at now three workshops in the last six months on swimming and swimming in complex fluids. And there's a group at the University of Florida that has done some initial work where they looked at a corkscrew now uh, and they see some interesting things uh, because they claim that it depends on the pitch. Uh, let, let's put it this way. It depends on kind of everything, the, the pitch, <laughs> the pitch angle, the uh, essentially the thickness and length, the corkscrew, et cetera. But the sometimes, depending on how big the Deborah number was uh, and how so <clears throat> how fast it swung. I think that's a it's a very good area to work in because um, it's certainly clear that you can get thrust that's normal stress thrust now. But the question is, is it important, for example, for E. coli? Is that actually the reason they swim faster or is there something else uh, happening there? And and I don't know the answer to that. We. We have done uh, different tails. So this turns out the two sphere tail or the spherical tail is actually a very poor tail, a pretty poor tail. You can make tails. A cylinder tail is more efficient. Uh, a frustum cone, believe it or not, is even more efficient still. The reason we're doing this is because we want to get as much signal to noise as possible. So we're now making tails that have propulsions that are literally 10 times the propulsion you're seeing here just by changing tail shape. So you can get a, quite a bit of propulsion, normal stress propulsion out of these, but you have to fashion your tail correctly. So. Okay, all right. I think it's time. Thank you very much, Eric. Okay, thank you for inviting me. Happy birthday, John. Eric, could you stop sharing? Yep. Wait a second. Right, I can't get rid of Eric. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Eric. I didn't mean that unkindly. There, no, there are a lot of people that have that complaint, actually. Okay, they don't do anything. Is it working? Not yet. Is it so, on Zoom? So it's not shared on Zoom, Stephen? No, it's not working. So I'm delighted to be here, of course, uh, to uh, celebrate John's birthday with a little delay, I think. Okay. So I've been, uh, I guess I met John through Etienne Guillon, who was my PhD advisor, but I don't know when exactly. And better not to say the year. It would be very improper. Okay. <laughs> and well, I've been, working with John on many problems and mostly on sedimentation. That's why I thought we had to talk about sedimentation. I, uh, well, my, my way of thinking has been profoundly uh, affected by uh, my collaboration with John. And you know that John wrote a book which is called Think Before You Compute. 
I think you can just do the same thing and say thing before you do an experiment. <laughs> so I think what I learned with John and think before you tackle any problem. And uh, so I want today to um, talk about the real, um, this problem of sedimenting suspension of spheres. And so Eric talk about the, the fiber business. But uh, this is the work that I've done with uh, Laurence Bergogneau since a long time. And actually this work took us maybe 10 years because um, it was, we did the experiment and then it took us some time to figure out what was going on. And so, so uh, really I'm gonna talk about velocity fluctuations. Okay. And that uh, doesn't work. Try again now. Ah, okay. <laughs> and this is beginning with everything has to start in Corsica, as you know, because this is a place where things are starting. And this is a picture of John with a very short short <laughs> in Corsica in 1987. Uh, during the summer school, uh, it was called uh, Disorder and Nixon. It was organized by uh, Etienne Guillon, Jean-Pierre Nadal, and Yves Pobo. And uh, really, but this, this was very important uh, summer school. And, and uh, for two reasons, because first, because uh, John did the series of lectures. But also because this is when I started really uh, moving toward fluid mechanic and uh, starting to work in suspension. And I met Bud Omzilla, and then I did my first job where they and I learned a lot. But, and uh, actually, so John did uh, lectures, and that particular this lecture on sedimentation of small particle. I attended a lecture, but I think at that time I didn't capture every or everything. <laughs> so I need I needed then to reread this uh, course that he gave many times before figuring out, out things. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of this. And uh, most of the new things is on small inertia. So. Everything is starting with this paper of George Bachelor that was, uh, as we know, uh, John Advisor and Michael mentioned this paper. And really the, the thing is that when particles are sedimenting in the fluid, if they are on their own, they sediment with the Stokes velocity and Stokes computed that in the mid 19th century. And it took about 120 years to figure out the problem when you had a mini particle because you have long, because of the flow decay of the disturbance of the single particle. And when you want to sum the different disturbance, you very straightforwardly, you end up with diverging integral. So Bachelor in 1972 uh, wrote this paper when um, it solved the problem. And uh, and this is and th this problem of divergence that was solved for the mean velocity, and indeed you don't have a divergence of the mean velocity, and you, you have a velocity which is finite. Now there is the same problem for the velocity fluctuation because when particle are sedimenting, there is a mean velocity, but there is also velocity fluctuation which are about uh, of the order of the mean actually, because this is long range interaction, multi-body long range interaction, and you have very large velocity fluctuation. And there was this paper of Cartesian and Luke, which claimed that there was also a divergence problem for the velocity fluctuation. And John actually fr framed that in a scaling argument, which is, uh, much easier to understand. I'm going to frame that uh, in this uh, in sketch. Uh, if you have, you think that the mixing is really random of the suspension, you have on every length scale going from the size of the container to the smallest size you can have 
in the system, which is a mean interparticular uh, distance, which is A, where the phi being the volume fraction with the power minus one third, you, you have uh, on each length scale, you have statistical fluctuation of all the square root of the number of particles. Now, you have fluctuation in the weight, and if you balance that by the Stokes drag of one of the, the blobs, we call a blob the square root of n uh, number of particles, you have convection current, which are on all length scale L, and which are, as you see, going like the square of its length. So it's, and if you think that the, the fluctuation on the length scale of the container are dominant, so you have fluctuation which are diverging, or at least they are on the side of the container. So what's going on experimentally? It took us some time to uh, decipher all that. Maybe, can you, maybe more? Anyway, so initially, this is experiment that we did uh, with, and using PIV. So you have the, uh, you, you put a laser sheet and you look at the, the particle and you're using the idea of what's going to happen with the You have, initially you have large scale fluctuations which are dominating. We can see them, they are this wheel here and uh, they dominate the dynamic on the scale of the container. But actually they are transient. And this is what John was explaining in this lecture that we gave in project, and the heavy part settled to the bottom and the light part raised to the top. And think that you have fluctuation on all the scale, so you end up with the smaller scale fluctuation. And as John was predicting in this uh, lecture, and uh, which are dominant in a steady plateau regime, before the sedimentation front comes into your system. And here you have this little swirl that you can see here. And as John was predicting, they are the order of the mean interparticle distance. Well, actually it's not the mean interparticle distance. Strangely, it's 20. <laughs> we don't know why, but it's like that. So this is what uh, <laughs> we, we, we figure out with the experiment. Okay, now, okay. Now, what John was saying also in this, uh, in this paper, in this lecture, is that uh, you can have also a screening of the fluctuation by inertia. But in an experiment, actually, you, if, you, if inertia decreases, it's likely that the inertia was on the side of the particle is small enough, but it's inertia with the container, which is going to be important. So you can do the same, uh, the same uh, argument, and instead of uh, uh, limiting the, the, the larger scale convection current are limited by viscous force, they are limited by inertial force, and you find uh, the prediction which will decrease with the size of the container instead of uh, increase. And you expect that the fluctuation with the length scale of the crossing between the viscous regime and the, and the, and the inertial regime are uh, the good one. And you find velocity fluctuation, which are strained with a decrease in fluctuation with scale at the Reynolds on the size of the particle, which is one, my, minus one third. Yeah. There have been other things, other work on that, especially a work by Don Koch, because but they, he thought about the moderate particle Reynolds number, meaning that you have an OC, the particle are interacting with their OC wake. And in that case, you have a small, uh, 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 an increase which is weak with a log of your container, and you have an increase like uh, the Reynolds of minus one over, divided by two. And you can also see this decrease of the 
the situation in the in numerical simulation that they were not so many experiments and finding were inconclusive when we did this experiment with Lawrence. So what we did. Uh, just, yeah. Sorry, my fault again. Ah, okay. <laughs> so we did some experiments. It's, it's the same system as we used before. It's, a, it's not very expensive. It's a very frugal experiment, which we said. You have a big tank. You have little particle. Actually, we have two batches of particle. And uh, you can image your sedimentation and go by uh, with a light sheet, actually two laser sheets. You can do particle image or symmetry PIV, or you can look at the particle microstructure by looking at the disposition of the particle. And we can decrease or increase whatever you want the viscosity of the thread. And, and so we you can have a range of Reynolds and in particular a range of Reynolds number on the size of the tank. The Reynolds number of the size of the particle is still uh, pretty, pretty small. And the container is big enough that it's much larger than 20 mil, uh, distance between the particles. So what do we get? This is the velocity field structure and coronation. We get actually the same behavior when it's uh, the Reynolds number is increased as in the Stokes regime. At the beginning, here, here it's for the small Reynolds number. Here it's a larger Reynolds number. And you see that at the beginning, you have big vortices of the size of the container, which reduce to vortices of the order of 30 minutes of distance. And actually, the correlation function are giving you that because here, again, a and B are the correlation function, uh, the, the correlation function of the velocity distribution. And you can see that we end up always at about 30 min until particle distance, meaning that you are correlated. Yeah, <laughs> or like that. <laughs> and you, you, you observe some vortices, even when you have your Reynolds number increase. Now, what is more interesting is to look at this plateau velocity fluctuation where you reach this regime where the large fluctuation of decay and you end up with this third, this fluctuation which are of the order of 30 minute distance. So we can see that it's a Reynolds number in terms of particle. Here it's a Reynolds number of the particle in terms of the size of the particle in the in terms of the, the, the size of the container. You see that up to here, you have a plateau. This is the, the vertical velocity, velocity fluctuation and the horizontal velocity fluctuation, that is the ratio two between the, between the fluctuation. And you can see that there is a plateau. You are in a stock regime here. And then you see that there is a decrease. But this decrease of the fluctuation with inertia uh, do not correspond to the modeling, even the one predicted by John, or even uh, or that predicted by Don Cock. But Don Cock, we are not in this regime because he was thinking about interact weight interaction or seeing weight interaction between. So what can we think about? Okay, so we did the same argument because you remember that John thought about an argument, the, the, an argument saying that you could you, you have an, in, an inertial drag. Here you can say, well, you can start the same argument and say that in the fluctuation in the way now, instead of being balanced by inertial drag, they are balanced by a transitional drag on the block, meaning that we are in a weak inertia regime. It's not fully inertial. So actually, you do that, and you, you find summation current on the length scale L, which is given by that, with a correction 
which can be given by Osin or by some correlation which are known as Schiller Neumann for the drag, meaning that we have a weak inertia. And you can see that if you can if you do that, then you plot the plateau velocity uh, versus the Reynolds number on the side of the particle. So this is the vertical velocity fluctuation. This is the horizontal velocity fluctuation. So the Schiller number correction with a broad size of 30 min distance is doing a very good job. Yeah. Meaning that the, the difference here is that instead of using something which is uh, fully initial, you have a little bit of uh, correction. And uh, actually, the reduction of the fluctuation and use the small inertial increase of the drag on the density fluctuation block. So the, the, the way of thinking is the same, except that instead of using the full inertia, you have just this transitional inertia. So now I want to go a little bit further than that. All this, so this can explain a little bit of things, what's going on, but there is an hypothesis on all this work, which is about the, the that everything is fully mixed and uh, that you use statistical fluctuation, which are square root of n. Is it the case or not? So we can look again. I told you that you can do PIV, but also we can do something which will, can compute the particle occupancy. I'm assuming you should really, the idea is you have the picture of the center of the particle, you draw a little square in it, you can move it. Each square you measure the mean number of particles and the fluctuation, you get the fluctuation. You can increase the size of your box like that, and you can get the particle uh, distribution. Uh, in the Stokes regime, at the initial time, you see it looks very close to Poisson distribution. And later on, it's very close. It's slightly shorter and wider, but basically it's okay. And this can be seen here because the, uh, the sigma n is can be seen as uh, proportional to not square root of n, but the n with an exponent which is 0.59, it's not so bad. <laughs> here it would be 0.5 and here it's 0.59. Here. Now, when we are in a regime where it's inertial, a little bit of a little bit of inertia, I mean, you can see that just distribution and initial time is symmetric, a little bit shorter, but it's due to the mixing. Mm -hmm. that we do it very but at the last time, it's positively skewed. And this is what you can see here, because in the weak energy regime, at initial time, which means initial mixing, we have a distribution close to what we get for the Stokes case because sigma n is proportional. I mean, the fluctuation in, in, in uh, number of particles is nearly square root of n, not, not really, not with a 0.5, but it's 0.59, but later on, it's much larger. It's six, 16, 16, so with increasing inertia, the structure change and become what we call sub in the sense that the variance grows faster than the mean. We don't know why, it's like that. And this is increasing with inertia. And this can be also uh, seen by looking really at the structure. And uh, if you look, this 
self homogeneous already structure is can be seen revealed by alpha shape. We we tried to use this persistent homology technique, but it didn't work because it didn't give much difference. So, but the alpha shape is, is really nice to obtain that. And alpha shape is something which is done, which is used in computational geometry to reveal structure in um in a set of dots. And you can see that with this two example are for uh, Reynolds, which are in the side of the tank, which is uh, pretty large, and you can see that you develop holes, which can range from five to a little bit more than this 20 min distance. And uh, these all become more larger, more numerous, more complex than those that we observe in the Stokes regime. So, uh, just uh, to conclude on this uh, inertial correction to Stokes sedimentation, it's really something that you see for Reynolds on the side of the container, which is point one. Quickly, you see the decrease of. Uh, we can adapt the calculation in each angument with a drag experience by the blob accounting for the small inertial correction. And this seems to give some decent <laughs> agreement. Now, what is interesting is about the microstructure because this microstructure become more homogeneous when you increase the uh, with depopulated region and mercury region concentrated in particle with holes, which seems to increase. <coughs> so this is uh, what we did with Ross on the inertia problem. It's small inertia. And uh, it will be difficult to do an experiment with very, a lot, lot, much larger inertia, but still you can see that we can see the importance, the influence of the uh, inertia above. And that's number two. Thanks. Thank you, Babette. I was worried. Yeah, no, that's fine. Do we have questions for Babette? Do we have questions online? Ah, Jerome. Maybe completely irrelevant to this talk, but if you if you take a suspension and you also Force it, for example, by heating and cooling, so convection. Do, do the fluctuations change in a similar way? Or what do you mean? You make so in, in in your case, you've taken a suspension, you've allowed it to settle. The fluctuations develop either without inertia or with a little bit of inertia. If you pump energy into the system in another way, for example, by heating and cooling, mm -hmm. do you get similar kinds of fluctuations? Well, I think they will be different because. Uh... That will be dominated, maybe, but it uh, depends a little bit the strength of, of the cooling and heating that you have. Because you should so you, you, you made a big effort to stop convection. Yeah. For, yeah. Uh, in the old fashioned illumination technique, the hot lamp, was yeah. the other side of the laboratory with a big wall in between and a little window that the light could go through, so there was no warming. Of the yeah, you switch. You try to the light would actually make convection so bigger than the sedimentation speed. Yeah, because I was thinking people have done experiment with relay binar convection mm -hmm. with particle, but this is dominated by the relay binar convection. Here, when we do the mixing, as John said, you do the mixing and you 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 add the initial mixing and you wait for the, the initial. Mixing and the initial perturbation to disappear, and then you are left with with your product, and you try not to <laughs> to do anything else. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I think we have one back there. Uh, thanks, Doctor. Uh, could you just comment on the rheological aspect of uh, these fluctuations or influence of rheology of the liquid on the fluctuations? For example, if the particles are sticking in a non liquid area. So, really, fluctuations be kind of similar to scaling, or it will be. Uh, it will be uh, as Eric has shown that if yeah. you are. 
this was the last week we didn't have streamer and uh, if you have uh, depend on the on the 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 rheology of the suspending tree here it's a newtonian tree it's the simplest thing you can expect but still as you can see you have this uh, convection current which are due to the really the, this velocity the fluctuation which are developing and maintaining during the sedimentation. Right, just follow on from this question. If you have a fluidized bed and you increase the fluidization, you can get bubbles to form. I wonder if that's a similar phenomenon to what it, you It's similar, but at the same time, the boundary condition are not the same. Yes. In a fluidized the bed, particles are still going in. If you are in the distance regime like that, you have it for meaning that the particle will have to be faster in the middle and not the Let's for that, it's based on uh, there's a lot more inertia in the mm -hmm. system. Yes, but they do say that it's a problem. Also, yeah. So, in Fidel's bed, you have an instability that we, we look at a while ago. But it's a different regime. So oh. we were talking, no, 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 but carry on. So uh, John, yeah, John, John, okay, no, this no, fine. If not, okay, John Hinch. So that Carjay is meeting, yes, a magical place. And I think I can be let off. It was a wild speculation, which was probably unwise. <laughs> um, and uh, late, later I realized that there are big problems when the inertia based on the Reynolds number, based on the sedimentation velocity and the size of the apparatus mm -hmm. uh, exceeds one. Yeah. Just creating the suspension in there, the initial condition mm -hmm. is full of swirls from the filling process. Yeah. And this, because you've just told me the Reynolds number is large, they take a long time, those initial exactly. filling um, eddies take a long time to go away. Exactly. Compared with the time it takes to uh, sediment. So it, it's something I, you shouldn't speculate about. Um, okay, so no, no, that, that, that's an important thing because when you do this experiment, you have a certain height yeah, in yeah. the experiment, of course. And when you do your mixing, you need to be, and when you do uh, the measurement, when you increase inertia, you want to be sure that the initial mixing is decay yeah. before you, you can measure anything. And then that's why we can go to higher Reynolds number. So you go to taller apparatus. Yeah. So, so you get that meters, because, and now you're going to mix. But, but then, then, then you want no tool to mix it. <laughs> because here we mix the. I didn't explain everything, but no. we mix we mix the, the the suspension with a small propeller, hmm. and we have all the technique to be able to mix this. And avoid bubbles. Yeah, and avoid bubbles. Okay. All right. I think we shouldn't leave it there. Thank you, Bobette. Okay. Thank you. 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 Oh my God, is that Right, let's go Okay, uh, in April, uh, uh, Howard and uh, Jenny uh, published a paper in JFM with a simply this title The Flow of an Oil Boy Flew into a, a Slowly Varying Effect. Slowly Varying Equals Lubrication Theory. Um, I saw this paper and it, I recall some things I worried about uh, 30 years ago and then thought perhaps I could add something to this analysis and add some more. And I've added some. As you can see, I've added the first word. That's <laughs> only the public type. And it's an old word. People have been describing that, but I probably and it's a work in progress. 
Okay, an old boy, he flew it. It's the simplest mathematical model of a viscoelastic uh, fluid. The stress tensor you can see has a viscous part, which is a viscosity we know trying to strain it, and it has an elastic part, the elastic model is G plus the deformation of the material. The material is the deformation of the material is described by a second order tensor, which would like to relax. To the state, so my topic state on the time scale of tau, and it's uh, the material is formed by velocity gradients in the flow, just like vortex lines are distorted by straightness. It's a very simple model, it has three parameters. Any more, there are lots more complicated models, they have more parameters, and uh, it basically fits uh, both of the it is much used in computers to be then had in computation to be then had to be um, So the question is, what is the behavior of this <coughs> mathematical model going through a slowly varying lubrication contraction from one to the one channel of one width going down to channel of a smaller width? Can um, we understand the predictive behavior and is the predictive behavior correct? So how does um, uh, you have to you, you need to understand two things about this uh, all the way to be fluid. The first one is its transient behavior. Um, it, the, it's in the linear mode. Forget about tensors. Just think about the time derivative. What happens if we have no flow? We switch on the shear rate for a certain time. We keep the shear rate off. Um, what happens to the stress according to this mathematical model of a uh, complex fluid? But as soon as you switch on a straight rate, you switch on a risk of stress. But you haven't deformed it yet, so there's no elastic stress contribution. You have to wait a certain time before you deform it, and then there is a constant uh, stress. You switch off the flow, you immediately you lose your viscous spread, but you've got a deformation that has to decay in time. Uh, how, how large the deformation do you generate? That is the deformation rate, the shear rate, times how long you can remember the, the amount of deformation. You can't remember beyond the relaxation time because it's forgotten. So the amount of um, uh, the amount of deformation you get is the shear rate times the uh, memory time, and that is why we, if we multiply that by an elastic modulus, we get this steady stress up here. So, and it just happens to be because of the shear rate um, building up the deformation gives me a certain elastic stress in proportion to the shear rate, and that means I've got an effective viscosity for the steady state. That are here. So, an interesting thing is it has an initial value viscosity and then a much bigger steady state viscosity. So, now thinking about this contraction, if I go through this contraction very quickly, I've not had time to build up the elastic stresses. So, compared with the steady state viscosity, it's going to be easier for me to push the stuff through, not the elastic stresses. Second thing you have to understand, um, the, uh, Helen nicely mentioned it, other people, Eric mentioned it, are the normal stresses. So this is all about understanding this uh, complex formula here of um, how the material deforms due to the velocity gradients in the material. Just think about the uniform steady simple shear. Velocity increases with uh, and the height, horizontal velocity increases with height. What happens if you start with a fiber in this direction, like a polymer molecule? It would just shear over, which means, as well as this initial condition, initial amount of fiber, we've developed a component in the direction of the flow. Now, the deformation is described by a second order tensor, so I really want to think about two fibers. So if I think about two fibers and I shear it, I will either shear one fiber or the other and develop this, these components in the direction of the flow. If I don't shear it again, I develop fibers in the direction of the flow. 
So in other words, the uh, stress tensor, uh, there's a component originally in the perpendicular to the flow direction. This has got forces in a uh, stress tensor in the, the shear stress tensor, and it has a steady state viscosity. And then out here, we've got stress in the flow direction. Uh, so the difference between stress xx and stress xy, x and y, 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 and this is there should be a square with a screw jack there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and this uh, this is called technically in biology a normal stress. Um, in common language, it's called a tension in the streamline. That's the important thing about this. And if you think about going through a uh, from a contraction from a wide channel down to a narrow channel, uh, the tension in the streamline is proportional to the shear rate squared. There's a higher shear rate in the small channel. So you've got the tension in the streamline pulling the stuff through more in narrow channel than the thick channel. This means you don't have to push it so much with the pressure gradient. It doesn't spontaneously jump through. Okay, so this is my stress tensor. Uh, there's a uh, few stresses, and there are these tension in the streamline. And I want this to play a role. And in normal lubrication theory, normal lubrication theory is dominated by shear stresses. I want to promote the tension in the streamlines into the analysis. And the good thing is I can. I need this term to be enormous compared with this term. And I can if I have this uh, gamma tau large. Uh, someone mentioned the Weisenberg number as being the shear rate time to relaxation time. Uh, I have been oh, side one. I want it to be enormous. I want it to be as big as the geometry ratio, the long length of the apparatus divided by the little uh, gap thickness. And if I have that, uh, this as this uh, shear rate and tau as big as this um, uh, geometry ratio, then I have got um, another magic number called the Debra number. In most flows, the Weisenberg number and the Debra number are the same, but in these uh, Slowly varying flows of the difference, and I need this Debra number to be all the one. What is that saying? It's saying that I need the relaxation time of the fluid to be the same, roughly speaking, as the residence time. How long does it take going at what to you to go that the whole length of the channel? And that's it, under such circumstances, it is dynamically important. Right. So if I, I have these uh, enormous Heisenberg number, so the Debra number is what I can contemplate. It's some pretty obvious scaling. Uh, I, do the, I do the property of that. That's the same. I can do that. Um, there's one trick for my computing. I'm going to transform from x and y to x and eta, where eta is y divided by the local height. That means I have non orthogonal coordinates, which are impossible. So I then have to fix some orthogonal curvilinear coordinates system as, and then handle the divergence of a stress tensor in curvilinear coordinates, which is horrible, but it's work that you can be done. You have to trust me. And I get these governing equations. So the key one is this one here the momentum equation is the normal momentum equation to y remember. Uh, this is the normal momentum equation for, uh, for the flow uh, with the, I've got my elastic stresses coming in because of my scale. And they're governed by these complicated equations, getting worse with the curve. Rate. Right, the numerical approach is, if you tell me the elastic stresses, I can solve that, uh, Momentum equation to find the flow um, uh, and to uh, find the pressure gradient. Um, once I know the flow, I can time step the elastic stresses from some initial condition until they go to a steady state. Hopefully, they go to a steady state. It's both actually under some sense, but I'm ignoring it. Okay, and what a very important thing for good computing, I use a smooth contraction. So, there's a beautifully smooth. Uh, contraction so that 
uh, all the experiments have abrupt contraction. Okay, first results. This is the pressure drop through the contraction. Um, uh, uh, and I'm dividing the pressure drop by the pressure drop that I would have if I had a viscous fluid with this steady state viscosity. And you can see, and this is for various uh, uh, contraction regions. There's a uh, one to two, one to four, and I've swapped it in some square root of two, so that is a square of contraction ratio of matter. And you can see for the difference of um, uh, as a function of the Becker number, I'm getting typically 30% less pressure gradient. Now, how's uh, the effect of? Um, did a little asymptotic analysis of this problem at small Debra number. And they did better than that. They found the Debra number squared and Debra number cubed answer. Just looking at the first and the first Debra number. <laughs> it turns out that in that nine divided by two, 40% of it is all about you're rushing through. You don't have time to get to steady state elastic stresses, and so you need less pressure rate. And 60% comes from the larger <laughs> tension in the streamlines in the narrow bit, pulling the fluid through stronger. Uh, so what I'm going to do is to go back to those pressure gradients, those results, the results for the pressure drop needed to drive the flow, and I'm going to divide it by that factor uh, that varies with contraction ratio. I had results from four different contraction ratios, and you can see that it nicely collapses the data at the small Debra number n. Small Debra number you can see here is at 2.1, and at 0.2 it's significantly off. But it's right at the small Debra number. There, Debra number squared, Debra number cubed does a bit better. But the fact that these curves don't stick together, so they're not going to So we need to got the result of the pressure. What's going on there? So these are the pressure, these are the velocity profiles. Um, and it's uh, for a two to one contraction. Um, and it's absolutely boring. They're all parabolic parabolas. Well, it is. And there's a small deviation here, and I can explain the deviation if I have time. Um, uh, the good news is that as the respectively parabola, I can treat my variable eta being constant as a streamline. It's not a streamline, it's a tube streamline, but it's within 10% of being the streamline. And I do want to plot how things go on the streamline, and I don't want to waste time computing what the streamline is. Ah, so we can look along the streamlines, the pseudo streamlines, to see how things um, evolve. So the purple curve is the velocity, the green, the, the blue curve are the shear stresses. And the green curves are the tension in the three lines. The contraction goes from one to one, from here to here. And I need an enormous exit channel to allow things to relax. So, in a two to one contraction, what happens? Oh, I, what I've done is I've taken along the various three lines, I've taken the velocity um, divided by the velocity at the beginning of the streamline. Equally, in the normal the tension in the streamline, I start the tension in the streamline in an entry channel, um, and then I work taken the value of the tension in the streamlines further down, divided by the value that it started with on that streamline. So you can see very nicely that all the streamlines were roughly doubles. You see, it's good. It's the contract rate, the channel is half as weak. Eventually, the shear stresses have increased by a factor of four as the velocity doubled and the gradient distance was half. As the shear rate has 
not increased by a factor of four, the normal stress, the tension in the stream line has to increase by a factor of six. So they're doing all that right. The problem is you have to go a long way downstream equal an expense. Um, uh, you need to go about eight uh, times even the different number modified for the eight. It means that uh, hey, the thing to learn is as it takes a long distance here to relax, there hasn't been much relaxation in this little distance. So if it doesn't relax there, I can throw away some of the terms in the governing equation. So, so what we need to do is have a look here. So here it's very curious. The velocity has doubled because the channel width is very, very definitely. The shear stresses um, haven't really changed. Those right next to the wall have changed. I agree, but all the streamlines in the middle are hard to change. And the tension in the streamline has increased by a factor of four. It hasn't increased by sixteen. Why have we gone for four? We need to have a look at what is happening at x equals one for all the strength. For the look the tension in the stream line. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is a function of height is the uh, tension in the streamlines divided by the value as if they were at full equilibrium. In other words, and divided by the value that they would have on that streamline if they had increased by a factor of 16. You know they've only increased by a factor of four. So you see that their values are here um, at a quarter. And this is a, as a function of different Debra numbers. And Debra number 0.1 is low Debra number. Debra number 0.2 is nearly at high Debra number. And Debra number of uh, um, point, uh, four. 0.5, we're in a high Debra number region where along most of the uh, streamlines, the tension in the streamline has increased by this factor of four rather than six feet. So that's what in the two one contraction, in the other contraction ratio, if I get the same thing, that's um, uh, the, uh, there's a plateau and the plateau value is at the contraction ratio squared rather than the contraction ratio. Okay, so we know that uh, the uh, normal stress is the tension in the stream line has only increased by the factor of four rather than the factor of 16. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the pressure uh, change by this factor before I, in the test for the low Debra number, I divide it with a power four there. And um, what you can see here is the pressure drop divided by that. Uh, this is low Debra number. Out here, high Debra number, these curves I suggest to you are parallel, which means we're getting somewhere. We're beginning to understand the high Debra number limit there. Just a, a hint into what I can help them. Right, so another way of looking at what's happening is to look along these streamlines, look along these pseudo streamlines, and I'm only looking at those right in the middle, the first for the first half of them. And here we have got the, the velocity in purple, and you can see through the contraction the north one, the as a, a two to one contraction is that the velocity is doubled. The uh, tension in the streamline has increased by this factor of four. Now, my memory from 30 years ago is might be interesting to look at the tension in the streamline divided by the velocity squared. And that's the blue curve. So you see the increase in the tension in the streamlines is effectively proportional to the velocity squared, local velocity squared along each streamline. That's for one contraction ratio. This is for two other contraction ratios. I'm getting the same thing. This is about one. So why is it different? You might like to criticize that. Well, it may be I'm not on the right streamline. Uh, I can blame it on that. Maybe I'm wrong. 
Okay, uh, so this is forming with the flow, a second uh, slide on this, uh, accelerating flow. Before we had a, a uniform flow that was constant forever. Now we're thinking about accelerating flows uh, and remembering we don't have any time to relax. What happens to a, a fiber, a, mater a material line element that's in aligned with the flow is on the streamline. If you accelerate the flow, a little stream, a little bit of material line element here will accelerate and get wider, longer, in proportion to the velocity change. So uh, fibers increasing length proportional velocity. The tension in the streamline is the fibers length uh, material line element squared because it's a second order tensor, and so you expect the tension in the streamline to increase by the velocity squared. There's a good reason. But I think, and the equation to this point. Um, and uh, right, a fiber perpendicular to the flow, if the ones parallel to the flow gets stretched, the one fiber perpendicular gets squashed to serve volume by the same amount. And therefore, shear stresses, which are our contribution from a fiber perpendicular to a fiber parallel, will not change. So the shear stresses uh, will not change as the flow accelerates. And this is the basis of a high Debra number. At the top of the high, you notice, is bigger than 0.5 or 0.4. Sometimes you win. Right. So what it, this is the uh, deformation in the shear direction. It should have, uh, if it were in a steady case, it should be increase as the gap width decreases by the square power, but we're not finding that, we're finding it's constant, it doesn't change as the flow accelerates. The tension in the streamline should in the steady state increase with the fourth power, that was 16, it only increased by the factor of four, it's this uh, factor here which we just explained on the previous dagger. So if you tell me these, I can go and look up what the pressure gradient is, I can see what the pressure drop is across the contraction, and uh, this is the elastic uh, combination of the shear stresses. Um, if it had been steady state, it would have been two, and the risk of lowering or some of that theory. Really. But it's actually a single power, so you get less of it. That's the gap, it gets smaller in a contraction. And this is the normal tension in the streamline, and it gets that nice factor of, of one upon h squared. Which we sort of empirically don't believe. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the pressure drops that we found numerically with this bit subtracted because I need to evaluate and then scaled by that factor. So, I should see nine upon five. My computer's going to die soon. Yeah. And uh, there we are. You see, my paper number, I can plot four different aspect ratios on the single curve. And this is my predicted uh, number of nine upon five. It's not quite right, is it? I don't know why. This is work in progress. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's just told me how long I've got the short thing in time. Now it's explained to how long I've got it. I don't know. Right. Um, it's more than 10 minutes. More than 10 minutes, not over there. We're keeping off. Uh, why can't I find it? Right, so I've been talking about the contraction itself from x equals 0 to 1. There was from x equals 1 to about 10, where all that rex relaxation was happening, and I've not told you about that. Then the pressure drop is wrong, is not normal. Is, is modified out there. So I have to look at all, I have to go and calculate what's happening to the pressure gradient and in the exit channel. This is work in progress, so I can just summarize the results as but there's a difference between a contraction and a constriction. Constriction is when you go back to the original parameter and it's computing, it's numerically it's much cheaper because you don't have to go so far downstream. And it's a wise thing to do when 
virtually all endimerics are not equal to nothing. They do contract them. And you can see that these are the raw results of the uh, pressure drop divided by the steady state K. And if I have a good idea about scaling, I can collapse them quite well. This is the uh, contraction ratio of one to the square root of two, which is not much. But these are the other contraction ratios of one to two, one to the uh, two pounds of square root of one to four. So they're nearly under control, but I don't have to do that. I mean, I probably don't understand it if I try to do that. Right. So the mechanism, what are we this what conclusion? We found that old Roy B predicts that there is less pressure gradient, less pressure drop needed to drive the fluid through a contractor. The reason is one part, typically about a half, is because the elastic stresses have not had time to get to their silly state value. So there's less you have got the resistance to push. The other part is the high tension in the streamlines in the contracting part are pulling the fluid along, and so you don't have to push pressure. What about experiments? Well, this is the embarrassment, isn't it? <laughs> Essentially, these are the pressure drops as a bunch of depression. <laughs> Give you the carrot and you can see. Right, you, you beat me. Yeah. So the theory, there's no doubt about the theory is right. <laughs> Most of the other <laughs> with the take the assumption, yeah, axiom that there is an old boy B, then then you're done. You get the wrong, you get the wrong side. I could point out that the experiments are typically, but not all, and I think Garrity is not all, um, are abrupt contraction. And with an abrupt contraction, there's an upstream vortex that's dissipating quite a bit. That's probably a case. It's totally unavoidable that there will be a reduction in the pressure due to the time you need time to build up to a steady elastic state. It's, unavoidable that there's a higher tension in the stream lines pulling the stuff through the contract. So what can we do? Well, some people immediately jump up and say, put feeding in. What that does is this is a, this is a modified uh, ordinary B. So you, you've got to go and modify your constituent equation. And if you do a feeding modification, what is, one of the many things it does is it stops the normal stresses being so big. So you've not got quite so much pulling of uh, the high tension in the stream of pulling you through, but you still got a positive amount. It doesn't change the size. So what you're going to have to do is introduce more dissipation. I just have to have a paper ready for this that no one has ever used. Not quite. And it's all about this. Feeny going into uh, operation on the internal mode rather than the growth and lowest mode. Have I got wrong? No, it's that. No longer. Is my computer gone? Yeah. Oh, it's your computer. No, no, your computer's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can you put the last transparency up? Yeah, I think I think I think you think I've gone dead? Yeah, you definitely Yeah, you died. You died. <laughs> I do have to have. There is a, there, it's coming. It's coming. There's a, there's a blank one. Can you go to the blank? Yeah, I saw. I'm trying to. It should be there in a bit. I've got to. You somehow. We've got to. Moment. We've got to lose. Jot. I don't understand why we. Yeah, I don't understand that either. So it's on there. It's on PC here. It's on PC here. It is. No, but I don't understand why I haven't got the screen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I have to stop. Um, if you get it, look rather nice if you can. No, 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 it will come, it will come. Don't no, 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 but I'll talk it through because it's easy. Because it says that I would like to thank, I'd like to thank lots of people. So I start with the organizers who um, pushed me to this embarrassing situation of displaying repeatedly my great age. Um, 
but I was very reticent of having it, but I'm very pleased that they did it because I'm meeting so many good old friends that I would have never have met before. And it's been a fantastically enjoyable time. So my second thanks is the participants who uh, not only the contributors, not the contributors, uh, it's been enormously after I have <laughs> After two years of seeing her, we know what I said by Zoom is freedom. Try to see together in person and to be able to argue. With you. I'd like to um, clearly thank you for coming. Change changes my life to see the reality again. Um, and then, oh, where are you going today? And then, of course, I have to thank the collaborators. I've highlighted a few people who are the leaders of the group. There's over 100 people I've been paid many students, but they are all equally valuable of uh, educating me and making me understand better the world. And then finally, and by far the most thankful, <laughs> long suffering family. Um, I, I do admit that often. I have been not an absent-minded professor, but my mind has been away in different places and not where they, it should be with my family. So, um, many thanks to them tolerating me most of the time. Thank you all. Thank you, John. So do we have questions? Herbert? There's no doubt that the theory of practice, but making left wing or right wing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to make a physical statement here, but I don't need to. I think you understand. <laughs> All right. We, we have one on Oliver. Oliver? Yeah. yeah. So, so Bali Mamami did some uh, calculation with a Essentially, a beanie ch a chain of beanie particles, so that it, so that it had multiple modes, and I think he did get quite that. a reasonable increase in pressure drop. It could be my, and I think, but I think what he said is it's not. You can't think about. I mean, it's that was in the sudden contraction, and I think it was. My understanding was it was very much the ones that go round the sharp corner. <laughs> if you try and do the analysis just along the centre line, then you don't get the right answer because it is dominated by the shear around the corner. Um, so I've got plenty of shear in there. Yeah, you've so got, you're going to say you've got plenty of shear, but it only comes into the pocket centre of the brain of some. Yeah, um, but, but obviously there you've got multiple you've got multiple modes. But at some point you must run. I mean, it's still odd because at some point you run in that rapid contraction. At some point, you still run out of modes, right? Because everything's it goes so past everything. Okay, so, so the trouble with Billy is if you remember, you I think it was Owen. I think it was Owen who did it, and, yeah. and Peter Zabo, yeah. Was on, uh, and I got involved at some yeah. stage. Of we did we did a constriction, which is cheaper, yeah, a smooth one, yeah, you know, with Feeney, and while the pressure drop went down. Eventually, it turned up. Yeah, uh, it never got bigger than one. Yeah, um, and it would never. We had to have a very short L in the finite limit for the extensibility yeah. because the um, uh, you've got to stretch it in this flow. And if there's a contraction ratio of uh, of uh, two to one, then you've only stretched it by two. Yeah. So you haven't need a feeling about half yeah. it's ridiculous so i think but the internal modes will act yeah. more but i think there is i think from memory it's more than just you can't just think of it as some modes it's actually interaction between the modes it's still bringing it back a bit to i think maybe we... so, so so i had i had my um uh, a zigzag yeah and quite quickly some of the internal segments get fully stretched yeah. Rather than the whole chain, yeah. that's right. And then it's, there's a very interesting dynamic. So this fully stretched bit and this fully stretched bit combine to a bigger fully stretched bit. And how fast you accumulate is actually a heat equation backwards. Very good. I think we have a question online, Gareth. Uh, this is from the right wing of experimentalists. Uh, <laughs> um, um, it, in, indeed, those, those experiments were through a constriction, um, John, that, that you showed. So, so with the expansion afterwards, and 
uh, you do still get this increase in viscosity. And, and Oliver, you do remember right. It, it's, it does seem to be that you need a, a coupled uh, Feeney-like chain where there's coupling between the different modes. And John, I was wondering if you'd comment on maybe whether an internal viscosity model or something like that would uh, be relevant, where you'd put in some dissipation that depended on the rate of stretching of, uh, of the spring. Well, I, I, I did study how these internal modes build up and uh, made a suggestion, uh, again, high speculation, that it was the strain rate times something like uh, the A, A squared, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with, with a small coefficient, so it, it takes a bit of time to build up. Um, it would be very I, but, interesting. I, but, It'd be very interesting to take your um, your new model and and add a term like that. You uh, you've got an explicit calculation for the um, uh, for a now. You could do that, right? Yep. Eventually, the flow won't be those nice parabolas, on, right? On which some things are based. Some of the simplifications in the calculation, so it would be a bit more complex. Yep. Yeah, it's on the shopping list. I do actually have to. So I've only talked, to, as you noticed, from x equals naught to x equals one. What the main contraction bit? I do have. I do have some results in the expansion bit that follows, uh, which is a comment on your experiment that, that, that it was nice that you did a constrictions, so you don't need such a long exit channel. And I'm sure lots of the experiments, but well, in that there are only six experiments, have too short an exit channel to, to be fully developed. Yeah. Anyway, and let me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there this afternoon, but happy birthday. Oh, <laughs> All right. Do we have more questions? No more questions. Okay. So I think we should thank our speaker, uh, Stephen. Can I ask a question? Of course. Well, I, I remember I went to talk by John Rallison when I was very young, where what he'd done was work out the quadratic correction. To something I think Taylor had done. And then when he tried it with a comparison with the experiments, the comparison was worse, yeah? And he couldn't understand why. And when he went, he found out that Taylor, apparently G.I. Taylor had used a par day approximate. So rather than having plotting one plus epsilon, he plotted one over one minus epsilon, which is correct, obviously correct, same order epsilon. So if you took um, the stone et al expansion yet yeah, would it be better if you'd written it as a par day approximate as you taught me in perturbation <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, uh, well, uh, we'll now be teaching how uh, Ginny, uh, it's uh, they're done it um because uh um, there's someone else in the subject has has played paddy approximate tricks and uh, it improves things, but it's not enough to solve the world. It, it, in some cases, I agree that my co those curves of a drop, they, they look a pretty boring drop. So if you've got a couple of terms, you think you can straight down and follow, and no, it blows up. <laughs> All right, so I think we should thank our speaker again. Okay, so I think that takes us to the uh, last moment of this event, where we have a round table uh, for all those who want to say something about John. Uh, that's the moment where they can do that. I just saw that uh, a few minutes ago, Professor Akrivos was connected. Is he still around? No? Yeah. So I, I visited Danny a few weeks ago and he knew about the conference and John said he sent his kindest of regards. Okay, very good. Uh, just a quick update, Andy's been getting her 94. Oh, 94. They live still uh, independently in their home at Stanford. They're very sharp minds from what I can tell. Andy, well, with one exception, that is they still drive a car with them. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're getting along fairly well. Very good, very good. Keith? Uh, yeah, well, uh, Yuri asked me to say a word or two. Because perhaps I've known the um, uh, longer than when I was here, in that I've known since he arrived here in Cambridge as an undergraduate. 
in 1965. And I think uh, I was privileged to teach him. He didn't need any teaching, of course. Mm -hmm. Still through the mathematical trials with great distinction, and then uh, did his research. Uh, it was a wonderful time to be starting research in Cambridge. George Bachelor had just initiated his great program on microhydrodynamics, and uh, John came in at a very early stage in that. Gary Leal was here for a year, I think, as a postdoc, a student of. Uh, of Andy Akrabos. We had a very good relationship already with Andy. He would be a, a regular visitor to uh, Cambridge and DAMPP in the early years. So uh, that started uh, a great partnership between John and Gary Leo that persisted through the 1970s and later. Um, I was interested in the wonderful lecture you gave John just now, and wonderful to see that you're still so active and long may that continue. I did notice on one of the slides it said, no time to relax. And uh, <laughs> I, 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 this describes <laughs> no, obviously no time to relax. He's extremely active in many spheres. I mentioned only um, his great uh, responsibilities in Trinity College. We'll be moving on there later this evening. But um, John has had for several years heavy responsibility coordinating all the fellows in mathematics, pure and applied. And that's an extremely difficult task because they're very, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> he gets them all to agree on a short list for the uh, annual uh, research fellowship competition, which is a very, very important task, as you can imagine, for the college. He's also on the audit committee, so he looks at all the finances, really. <laughs> and that's a, a, an equally important. Uh, he's recently taken on uh, uh, the college council. He was elected earlier this year for a further three year period. So you can imagine just how very responsible he is in college affairs. Wonderful, John. Congratulations on your birthday, on reaching. This uh, great age, <laughs> and as I say, long may it continue. Very good, very good. So I think there is Gareth McKinley who wanted to share a photo. Gareth, can you please share your screen and show us the photo? Do you see that? Stephen, can you put it up, please? Yeah, I'll try and change yeah. the screen. Uh, Hang on, Gareth. We are working on it. Sure, I'm sharing, so hopefully you'll get it up there at some point. Yeah. Ooh, there was another guy. What on earth? The options. The new options. Zoom right fits to window. Should Originals, I don't know what to do. Try 50%. Oh, I can make it small. Is it uh, too big or? We don't know what it zooms. has got a mind of its own. Okay. We can make it out there. Well, well, it, it, it doesn't matter if not, but it, it, since people were sharing photos, I went back and dug through my old photos. And this is a picture from the very first time I met John Hinge, actually. I don't know. Yeah, carry on, carry on, guys. So um, it's uh, it's from a place called Hinsgavel in Denmark in 1988. It was oh. a numerical a numerical methods workshop. And uh, is, is it on the screen yet or no? <laughs> Yes, so uh, so this is uh, so Ola Hasseger is in the nice nineteen uh, eighties pastel blue uh, sweater, um, taking a picture. But you'll see John Rallison, um, John Hinch, Roger Tanner. Uh, I was still a graduate student working on contractions, actually, John. So um, so doing the wrong problem then, but uh, we we got to constrictions eventually. But there's also Anthony Barris, Ken Waters, um, Oliver Harlan, I believe, was at this conference, but I don't see you. Now I think we can move your head. I'm sorry, are you there, Oliver, or? Yeah. Certainly, Rob. 
Rob, oh, Rob <laughs> Owens is Rob, Rob Owens is on the back right. Anyway, I'll send this in for you, John. Um, Ken Yeah, Caswell, um, Mike Webster. Um, <laughs> all right, all right, very good. I hate to. Yes, thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Herbert? Can I possibly say something that's a continuation of what uh, Keith would have said? Uh, this is uh, a story that is well known to John, but I think it's uh, very illustrative. Um, I was working on flow, viscous flow down an inclined plane and the instability that uh, develops. This was in about 1984, 85, as I recall. And for a week, I was totally stuck. I really didn't know how to uh, continue. And uh, there was coffee always at 11 in the morning. And I remember going down and thinking, I don't care who is there. I'm going to talk to them. And I'm going to make sense of this calculation, which I don't know how to do. I was very lucky that it was John who was there, who I had coffee with. And he really told me how to continue. He was extremely useful. Uh, I solved the problem, wrote it up for nature. Uh, and uh, before I submitted it, I gave it to John and said, would you like to make some uh, comments? And he made some very useful comments there and then said to me, look, uh, um, it, it's, it's, you mentioned uh, you've got to, uh, that you got some stimulating comment from me in the acknowledgments. And just the way he said it, I thought, hmm, he's right, maybe I should make him a co author, but oh, man, I didn't do much. Uh, <laughs> well, should I make him a bit? Well, and then he said, stimulating, you just talked and I listened. I didn't do anything. Absolute rubbish. And the only time I've known John to say something totally incorrect. It was extremely uh, stimulating, very uh, useful, allowed me to go on. And I will say there are now at least another five papers, of which John is not a co-author, in which it says in the acknowledgments, I thank uh, John for very simulating input. <laughs> Without that, and the most recent is just about to be published in JGR. So he's still making very, very useful comments. John, would you like to say something? So I'd like to say something in terms of globally. I first became aware of your business, John, the early 1970s, mid 1970s, over at NYU, and um, the speaker, he had recently visited that. I said, What interesting thing is going on there? You've got to watch, well, watch out for that guy. <laughs> and Steve Childress is a very, uh, very high standards, and I obviously. You, I then had to watch out, and sure enough, um, look what he's achieving. Unbelievable. But um, I've had very little to do with segmentation, that sort of role will it be. But I have had many, many interactions with John through uh, the Mass and Industry Program, which is, was held since about 1968. And John. Um, regularly participated in these meetings, and their key feature is the, is the beginning of the meeting where someone comes from industry with a problem, which might be from any area of science. Um, and uh, you could you have to listen to this problem and get your sort of start of discussion going on how we can help the industrialists to understand what is going on. And that means you have to have a very, very broad-minded approach because industry covers about everything. And usually the two people in the room who were not afraid and 
well, even though we may not have, have the mental capacity, but we're certainly brave. We would sit in the front row. <laughs> at a distance. At, well, we started off on the first meeting, and we were quite close. <laughs> 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 but as the years went by, we got further and we sat at each end and we just yelled at each other on and this has been part the happiest part of my <laughs> very productive. Yes, I funny I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it had a great effect on the audience, especially the younger members of the audience could watch these two slightly senior figures yelling and screaming at each other and um, I wish we could still do it actually I was almost trying to say something about your talk just now but maybe I like, should do it later or... <laughs> <laughs> however the, um, although John's career has gone into much more he's done a lot of fluids he does know about almost everything and um, but his his career has gone very differently from mine in one respect, and that concerns computation. Um, although we were both brought up in the uh, time when electronic computers were born, I had a very nasty experience with an electronic computer. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was working in the Bristol Airplane Company. I, I had two Mercury computers, and I. I had pre programmed something on some cards on a Friday evening. And I, and I switched my computer off and left the other one flashing lights on. <laughs> Over the weekend, it was computing with a slow pass the Concord Woody. But um, my switching my computer off sent a current search. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Crystal Airplane, company were never going to give me a job. Anyway, John, on the other hand, I think, I don't know when you first, you've done so much computational work. I don't know really what got you going on it, but you seem to have realized that um, computers, far from sort of putting applied mathematicians out of the job, has actually produced a vast amount more for them to study. And that's shown, I think, in your books and books of your papers. And um, I, I just like to conclude actually by asking you a question. Well, nowadays, um, people are always telling me that uh, deep learning and AI is going to put all of us out of the job. Do you feel that um, that's more likely to happen than was the case with electronics? Mm. And I just hear an answer that before. So. <laughs> um. It doesn't think. It doesn't think, no. So, so, so I think I've been advocating thinking. <laughs> so, so, so. What I think the answer would be that um, they're very good at spotting patterns that they don't get bored looking. And they may well spot something that we've not noticed. Uh, less likely to explain what we yeah. what yeah. spotted. Mm -hmm. And then there is a very nice theorem that's been proved by one of the junior research fellows here within a constrained definition of what you mean by machine learning, etc. Mm -hmm. That you can achieve a certain accuracy in your predictions. And it is totally impossible to improve on that accuracy. You can't find it. So they, have, they have a finite. That's a strong constraint. And it's a real theory. Anyway, from I have uh, uh, for everybody I've spoken to in Oxford about this meeting, so very good wishes. And um, I wish more of them were here. And you just have your friends out there. Everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I think you all wanted to say something. You no, raise your hand. No, I was waiting for somebody. Ah, you were waiting for somebody. <laughs> so now I think we're going to go to Levy then. Levy, are you there? Levy mm -hmm. wanted to say something. I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. Hear me? Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. I see you. Okay. Uh, hello. It's just I uh, have uh, only something I want to share because. I see you all know John much more, much better than I do. I, anyway, 
I remember once we traveled together to Marseille, where we were to have a few days of a midi meeting, and then we traveled down to Gatwick. Uh, then we had to wait for a check-in. Then we had to wait for uh, to board. Then we had to wait for whatever happened in uh, uh, the waiting queue for the the plane to arrive and everything. So every time. We had to wait maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15, maybe seven. John would get out papers and pen from his bag and very quickly start writing down some ideas, some equations, whatever it was. And then I saw really uh, that the first time I saw somebody so focused on the work and working so quickly and so efficiently. And when you are young, you often think that you really need special conditions to work, like special light, special silence, special table, whatever it is. But then I realized though, so maybe if nothing else, maybe I should learn uh, concentration, learn how to focus. So, okay, I'm improved, uh, I'm still struggling, but it's really something that I've learned from uh, John. So. Anyway, I thank you for this and for all the rest. I will. I won't say all the details. So I'm sorry I'm not going to Trinity with you, but I would have enjoyed enormously. Anyway, thanks for the invitation. Very good. Do we have more speakers or is anyone on the first one? Say one on the thing. I'm sorry, keep them up with you. George Bachelor. Great initiator of our department, five as graduate students, effectively tenured lecturers. Two times he did it, and John Lynch. He could already see in John and Keith, when they were little twerps as graduate students, that they were worthwhile employing. He didn't employ anybody who was not good. Just employed these two great successes. It was a terrible gamble. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. I'm sure George would say, keep your wrong. Very good. I think we have Laura from uh, ah, Zoom. No, no, we don't. Is <laughs> that Laura? Are you there? No. Sorry. No, are you there? Uh, hello, uh, John. I, I have followed uh, my best wishes. We, have, we had you several times when you visit us. It was always a pleasure. Uh, we discuss a lot, lot. And uh, I hope we'll have many occasions in the future to discuss more. Uh, I cannot speak a lot because I, I am with my uh, son. Uh, I, I have um, some family problems presently. But well, I, I followed the talk and uh, I, I enjoyed uh, a lot what I have listened on, especially what you have presented in your talk. And I will try to think a bit about that. So. Thank you. My best wishes again. And bye-bye. Uh, so I think anyone here from the audience? Okay, I think we have Mahesh. Mahesh, would you like to say something? Yeah. Uh, can you see me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so happy birthday, John. A bit belated. Uh, it's absolute pleasure. It's a joy uh, to be associated with John. Uh, the first time that I met him was in 1999 when he was visiting Levitch Institute. Um, and uh, at that time, one of his key ideas uh, led to a paper. And of course, as was said before, uh, I think his name is only in the acknowledgement. Uh, it was a very really key idea there. And then later on, uh, after I came back to India, I have continued to interact with him. We worked on a problem. Again, I worked with a graduate student uh, on a viscous flow on a vertical uh, a plate, a circular plate rotating. And again, key ideas coming from John when I had discussed with him. And again, his name uh, happens to be only in the acknowledgments. We would always refuse to have me there. Um, I learned a lot from John. Um, very in insightful, superb clarity, always goes to the heart of the problem immediately. And of course, very, very generous with his ideas, uh, also a fantastic host. Um, I had the pleasure of being there in Trinity for six months for my sabbatical with family. He and Christine were ex excellent hosts. I think I saw Christine walk in at the corner there. Hi, Christine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very, very much, John, um, for, for your mentoring. Thank you again. Yeah. 
Fine. Yeah. I think now we have Jean Pierre. Oh no. <laughs> Jean Pierre, are you are you there? I am here. Go ahead. I materialize. So uh, <laughs> hello John. Hi. So uh, I wanted uh, to to thank you on many aspects of our co cooperation, John. I think you have brought a lot to the French community, not only SPCI are, are fast, but also in Marseille. Um, but uh, Babette would better speak of that than me. In uh, Britannia, in, in Rennes, you have been. And there are, well, uh, at the beginning of my talk, I told people about my, your patience with experimentalists. And that's, uh, no, but for us, that's very important to have a theoretician with whom we can speak, who understands our needs, and uh, in addition, who speaks us in terms that we can understand. And with, uh, in addition, also you are partly a mathematician, also you are a mechanician too, you, you are able to speak to physicists and you are able to speak to physicists with models that physicists can understand and that it's absolutely invaluable. And that yeah, there is another aspect <laughs> we're more humorous that I want to insist is your patience with the French administration. <laughs> they have done you about every dirty trick that can be due to someone. I remember that you were a member of the jury in Ecole Normale for, uh, for um, uh, foreign students coming into Ecole Normale. Huh? I'm not mistaken. And uh, they say, okay, we, we, we will give you housing. And the, 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 what they offered you was to, to put you with the students in lousy homes with uh, showers at the end of the corridor. I, I cannot imagine that a supposedly prestigious institution can do that kind of tricks. And your patience with these people, which unfortunately we have to live with uh, the full year is uh, you also deserve a lot of thanks, not to have said never go back to France. <laughs> so thanks again, John, and you, you, you help personally, you help me a lot to do the, what we, we could perform and, uh, but all our groups and laboratories, you have been given an invaluable Thanks again. And happy anniversary, a little late. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Do we have more people? Mm -hmm. uh, hand raised? Mm -hmm. No? Stephen, would you like to say something? No. 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 <laughs> John, no? Mm. Okay. I do have some questions. Go ahead. <laughs> no. Sorry. This, this is very boring. Yeah. Um, where do we, John Lister? Yeah. Yes. Where do we go for dinner? Oh, I'm going to say that. Oh, right. In a bit. Okay. Sorry. We should go. We should go again. We should go. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So, so there's only one, one last thing that I wanted to say. Um, uh, thank you, John, for allowing us to do that. It was not easy to to get through, but uh, we 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 discussed. I didn't resist. You resisted, but uh, <laughs> I, I knowing you very well, I said we have to get some momentum going so that he cannot stop us. <laughs> and it was actually actually how it worked, right? So uh, when we first talked to John, we said, "Listen, we have this almost ready. Uh, this is what we we uh, we want to do." He said, "No, but okay." <laughs> he reluctantly accepted it, and. Uh, I think we're all very happy that he finally accepted it. And I think, I hope at least you enjoyed some of it uh, as we have enjoyed. So I had organized a sort of a surprise, but uh, because of the chaotic way things are working now in Brazil, it didn't uh, turn out well. But um, uh, the president of the university was meant to be here, University of Brasilia, to say something to you. 
but I will read a few words that I helped draft and I will <laughs> have to read uh, on a, non a live translation as I go through. And I hope everything will be clear. So dear Professor John Hange, my name is Marcia Abraham. I am the president rector, as we call, of the University of Brasilia. First of all, I'd like to congratulate, to, to congratulate you for your birthday. It is a pleasure to know that you're well and uh, you're still celebrating uh, uh, your, uh, uh, I don't know, li academic life in, in full throttle. I would also like to say that uh, Professor Yuri Mi from the Department of Mathematics of University, your former PhD student, has indicated and nominated you for the Professor Honoris Causa Professor title of our university, which has been approved by acclamation by the University Council of our university. You are a world reference in fluid dynamics, and I, you have received many honors uh, throughout your career. So this is an extra honor for your work in, uh, for science and the relevance of the work for the fluid dynamics community in Brasilia, especially for the scientific inspiration that you provide to all of them. So she carry, carries on saying that uh, you've been to Brasilia twice, uh, which was a very good, uh, both uh, very good uh, uh, visit, uh, but one in 1997 when you taught an elastic liquid course and another one in 2007, when you were the opening speaker of the International Congress of Mechanical Engineering that was held in Brasilia. So, and then she carries on to say that you were also very important to uh, the creation of a PhD course in mechanical engineering, which was carried out by Francisco, your former PhD student as well. So she ends saying that she would really be likes to have you in Brasilia in the future to give you the title in person. So I think that's the uh, the final thing that I wanted to, to, to tell you. And I hope you can come at some point. I'll give you a copy of that. <laughs> important. Very important. Very good. Does anyone want to say something? Okay, so. John Lisa said that we have to be at the uh, uh, below Ren Library yes. for pre dinner drinks at 7.30. Something. Oh. Uh, and the best route to get there uh, is not round through the front of the cottage, um, as was in the materials, but to go to the end of Clarkson Road, go straight across and through St. John's playing fields, which mm -hmm. is you know, through a gate, walk down, you'll get to Queen's Road, Turn right, walk along a little bit, and then just walk in through the back entrance to Trinity. And the Red Library is that fairly impressive building on that. <laughs> so I think there'll we'll be, be forward to I think there'll be a huge group the walking there together, right? So and, uh, the library itself is in the old kitchens at eight. Drinks are drinks at seven thirty. Dinner is at eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Okay, so I think we can terminate the Zoom meeting and this meeting. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you. Stephen, so, Stephen no, no, no. say something? So, I'm sorry, so I'm still, can I remind you that if you're in Cambridge tomorrow, you're welcome, yeah? Oh yes, to come and, yeah, sit, step, hang around our garden, yeah? And talk to John and everybody, <laughs> yeah? Um, so it'd be really nice to see you, yeah? And the second is that um, somebody's had to go home, unfortunately. And so we have a spare dinner ticket. So if you know anybody who wants to come to dinner, yeah, and you can, right? Um, I think we can seat one extra person. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey, yeah. I don't know where but we do have a separate dinner ticket. So I'm sorry. Yes, that's very. That's a kind of. Yes, I think that. Can, Thank you for coming. Okay, I think we will terminate the Zoom meeting. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you.
five minutes ago that I was going to speak, but... <laughs> Wing it! Uh, totally. Uh, so, yeah, we really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it too much. Uh, it, it's been particularly nice for me to meet people that I've known over the last 30 years of my own professional career, you know, coming back, and to hear all of the accolades which have been poured on John, which <laughs> are totally deserved. Uh, so, so my own experience, you know, one of the alluding to this is that I came here as an undergraduate three years before him in 1980. John was my director of studies. Yeah. Uh, he was, he formed a very strong impression on me as an impressionable young 18 year old. Uh, <laughs> three things I could, could recount. You know, one is I appreciated the sherry in my supervision. It was at 7 o'clock before he went into high table. I remember him coming into uh, one of my 1A lectures. Um, saying, I've just tasted 50 Spanish red wines <laughs> using those boards that you could throw up to the ceiling, you know, with uh, three, three screens of boards, yeah. and you could hit the backstop at the top, <laughs> and he did that with great enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that you know, John was um, Secretary of the Wine Committee in his 30s. Uh, you know, we currently have a Secretary in their 70s, it has taken decades to develop that appreciation of life. <laughs> you know, John was you know, right in there at the end. And um, I was also very impressed by the tour you know, taken for his directees around the Trinity Wine Cellars. And I looked at it. And I hope you all enjoyed that this evening. Yeah. More, more seriously, John taught me uh, for vector calculus in yeah. Mm, me too. And fluid mechanics in part two and perturbation methods in part three, which are you know, three really key courses that have, you know, I think, shaped the kind of mathematics that I, I myself do and you know, very much the flavour of the approach to that mathematics, which was you know, described. Um, you know, really, really well, you know, going to the core of the idea, and if you can't explain things physically or intuitively, you're probably wrong. That, you know, that came across really strongly. You know, so things such as you know, Laplace's method, and stationary planes, and Stevens descent, it's all basically the same idea, and it doesn't really matter how you do the details of the contour through the, you know, the saddle point. So, you know, that, that was really inspirational. And, and I, you know, the, the whole thing about um, trying to find a good, solid physical explanation for things. You, know, you, you do all the mathematics, you get the mathematics right, which is important, but you need to be able to explain the, the physical mechanisms. So, um, you know, that's something I, I've certainly imbibed you know, right from age 18. And I think it's continued, and uh, John has been a terrific mentor to me in my research career as well as an undergraduate, I'm a great supporter. Yeah, I, I thank you for that. And uh, I think there's really a, a general appreciation in this room, which has been you know, a very consistent message that, that all of us have appreciated John's you know, the, the focus on simple explanations of good solid physics uh, and you know, the, you know, the care for individuals, the mentoring, you know, the not pushing themselves forwards. And uh, yeah, context. Uh, they... Thank you very much. And I'd like to raise a toast to John. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. To John. Yeah. Congratulations. To John for many more years. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> I should say something. So you go on about the wine, and I will try to finish. I still enjoy it. Thank you for selecting some. So I, I must tell a story about against myself. Could you speak on? I shall tell.
a story about against myself and why, teaching my young son, who went to nursery at age three and confronted with a bag of corks, which you're supposed to sort of try and balance on top of another and constructing, took one and sniffed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all.